Chapter 19 The Guardian's Scheme Bombay, February 1921 Praveen took a deep breath, allowing herself time to respond to Razia's shocking announcement. Razia certainly had motivation to want the household agent dead, but it seemed unbelievable that she'd have had the strength and skill to carry out the heinous act. To whom did you tell this? Praveen asked, hoping against hope she hadn't spilled to Amina. Nobody. All right, then. Praveen tried to sound calm as she opened up her briefcase and took out her notebook. She was sitting in her own car with a confessed killer. This was something many lawyers had experienced. Let's make a timeline together. It was about 3.30 when Mukri Saab interrupted my consultation with Muntaz Begum. Where were you? Her words tumbled out. I was with Amina on our veranda. We overheard what he yelled at you through the jali into the garden. He was quite put out, Praveen said, giving her a half-smile. After departing the Zanana, I went to the main entrance and told Zaid I had come to speak with Mukri Saab. Razia's eyes widened. But weren't you afraid? I wasn't thinking about myself. I was quite worried he might take out his anger on the three of you. I tried to remind him it was my duty to your husband to explain your assets to you, and also the way that Maher and the Waqf operate. But my words did not calm him, so I left. She would not tell Razia that Mukri had almost struck her. That would make her seem vulnerable when she needed to appear strong. So... It must have been very soon after you left that Mukri Saab rang the bell on the second floor. At Praveen's puzzled expression, Razia explained, There's a bell on either side of the jali. It's a way to tell someone to come there to speak. How would you know who was being called? Fatima's job is to go and hear whom he is requesting. I heard the bell but I stayed inside my rooms, praying he wasn't calling for me. But Fatima came and told me I'd been chosen. She swallowed hard and then added, I was sick with fear. The jolly screen is really a door with a lock, and I was sure he had the key. Praveen felt a cold finger of dread at this knowledge. Had he ever gone through? She shrugged. Not that I know of. In the old days, the jali stayed closed but was not locked. Our husband walked through and we also went to the other side if there were no other gentlemen visiting the house. I understand. What happened next? Perveen settled deep into the car seat, getting herself in the right position to observe any changes in Razia's expression. When I came to the screen... I could see the shadow of his figure on the other side. He asked why I changed my position about donating my maher to the wakf. I dared not say what I really felt, that I didn't want him using our wakf funds. Razia sucked in air as if she needed it to go on. That man told me that I had proved myself incapable and said I must write a letter resigning from being a mutawali, I was to write that I'd lost my ability to think well following my husband's death. Mukri had landed on insanity, one of the few reasons a mutawali could be taken from their job. Even if Razia didn't sign such a statement, he could solicit accounts from others defaming her. How did you respond? I said I needed to think, and that such a letter would take time to write— that he warned me if the paper wasn't ready within the hour, he would... Razia shook her head. I can't even say it. Tell me. In a wavering voice, the widow continued. He said, if I didn't give him the paper, he would go straight to Falkland Road and find a husband for Amina. The 
prospect was horrifying. But it was within Mr. Mukri's rights as the household agent to arrange marriages for any of the females in the family, the daughters as well as the widows. Shaking her head, Perveen said, What a dreadful threat! And while I was standing there, feeling so dead inside, he told me he was through with talking to me. He wanted me to bring Mumtaz to speak with him. Surely he had some terrible plan in store for her, too. Razia moistened her lips and looked nervously at Perveen. She was lying asleep in her bed. I spoke several times, but she would not get up. I left, thinking that I had enough to worry about. Mukri could have told the illiterate Mumtaz to draw an X on a statement about Razia's mental infirmity. Perveen wouldn't have put anything past him. The only question nagging at her was why someone as intelligent as Mr. Farid would have hired such a loathsome man to care for his family. But she wouldn't interrupt Razia, who was now speaking freely. I went out, and as I turned into the next hallway, I saw my daughter. She'd heard everything Mukri Saab had said to me and was terrified at the prospect of being taken for marriage. She wouldn't let me near her. She rushed out to the garden in tears. Razia wiped her own eyes as she spoke. I went to my desk. All I had to do was write a simple statement giving up my duties as the Mutawala. I didn't want to do it, but I realized that if I angered him, he might seek revenge. That is correct. He could still have married off Amina, and he might have even had you committed to an asylum. It was a shocking, terrifying prospect. Perveen thought back to a recent conversation with Amina and wondered why the child hadn't mentioned this as well. So I had an idea. Razia looked steadily at her. It was an immoral idea, but the only way to save Amina and all of us. I decided to deceive him into believing that I had prepared the statement for him, and when I opened the pass-through slot to give him the document, I would instead shoot something sharp through and catch him in the throat. Perveen sat silently, trying to imagine it. But the pass-through slot is only about three feet from the ground, she said after a moment. We sit facing the slot when we speak, Razia explained. Then the slot is just below the level of each person's face. Perveen nodded, recalling the bench Sakina had shown her. However, Perveen couldn't remember whether she'd seen a chair or bench in the area where the detective had been taking prints. Unless it was the rosewood chair she'd sat on. The thought of this made her grimace. He was waiting when I arrived. From his shadow behind the jolly, I saw that he was standing. That would not work with my plan. Razia took a deep breath. I requested that he please sit down to receive the papers. He did so, and when I opened the slot, I shot my letter opener through it hard. He cried out, just as Amina said she heard. Your letter opener? Now Perveen realized why the object in the man's neck had looked familiar. She'd seen Amina toying with it at Razia's desk. Razia closed her mouth and looked expectantly at Perveen. Perveen thought that parts of Razia's story had seemed very believable, but the method of murder did not. Can you tell me more about the death? Was there a struggle? Razia fell silent and looked as if she was thinking hard. At last, she said, Do you know how, after awakening from a dream, you can't remember the whole thing? It happens. Perveen had awoken in a sweat after a bad dream about Cyrus the previous night. I don't remember more than pushing the letter opener through the slot. I must have dealt a mortal blow. After that, I went back to my room, washed my hands, and prayed. 
the perpetrator had to have been very close to Mukri to make the many stab wounds on his body. Blood was splattered all over the main house's second-floor hallway. Yet there was no blood on Razia's sari. What happened after you prayed in your room? I drank water. She pressed her lips together. Why are you looking at me that way? I don't feel like I'm hearing the whole story. Perveen chose her words carefully, not wanting to accuse Razia of lying. May I ask how you managed to make multiple stab wounds through a small space? Razia's tired eyes blinked. I said before, it was all like a dream. I cannot recall. And how could you carry out such an assault without getting any blood on your sari? Razia looked down, and a single tear fell on the black silk. Of course, one might wear different clothes to commit a crime, and then change back to the other clothes again. Can you show me the clothes you wore to commit the killing? Wiping her eyes, Razia shook her head. You said you came here to confess, Praveen said. Razia was studying the car's metal door handle. Might you be taking the blame because you're trying to protect someone from conviction? When Razia didn't answer, Praveen said, Are you trying to protect Amina? Razia shook her head again, but still didn't look at Praveen. Amina confided her great distrust of Mukrisab to me. Surely her fingerprints will be on the letter opener she played with at your desk, but that is hardly enough to send her to prison. How can you be sure? Razia asked anxiously. For a start, such a small girl is no physical match for a big man like Mukrisab. Also, she told me she was in the garden when she heard him cry out. She never mentioned to me that she discovered the body. Razia looked at her again. Actually, Sakina said Amina was the one who told her about the death. I can't bear to ask Amina. I thought the less we spoke about it, the safer. I doubt the police will suspect her. But others in this house were aggrieved by him, and we don't yet know if he had enemies at work or amongst his acquaintances and relatives. That's right, Rezia said, her voice catching. We don't know. As the senior wife, you naturally take on the responsibility for the family. Perveen put a hand over Razia's, which was strikingly cold despite the car's heat. But you cannot lie. In fact, lying in court is a chargeable crime. Razia looked anxiously at her. You speak as if I shall go to court. I've every intention of keeping you out of court. Perveen kept her hand on Razia's as she continued. If you'd like... I can be your lawyer. This is different than my father representing your late husband. It is a separate, clearly defined agreement. Anything you say, including what you've already told me, would be confidential. I'd like that. But what if someone else needs you more than I do? What happens to her? Razia's voice wavered. Don't worry. If another person needs representation, I will help find suitable counsel. Would this second lawyer be a man? Yes. Sadly, I'm the only woman solicitor in Bombay. I shall ask my father if he thinks he can help another family member without there being a conflict of interest. Perveen saw from Razia's face that this offer hadn't done much to soothe her. Do you wish to stay here tonight? 
I could take you and Amina to stay elsewhere. Her eyes widened. Do you mean go to my family's house in Oud? The police wouldn't like you being so far away, Praveen said. You could stay with my family. My father has brought home clients before. Razia put her hand to her mouth. But you are Parsis. Don't worry about it. We worship differently, but we are not so far apart in our hearts, don't you think? And being with us might be a helpful distraction for Amina. Razia looked as if she was deliberating. At last she shook her head. She's rarely been away from Sakina's children. Now she is needed by them more than ever. Praveen didn't think that any of the family should remain inside the house. If the killer was a stranger who'd come in from the outside, he'd know of the house's riches and perhaps want more of them. And if the murderer came from within, she was likely a woman with her own unspoken agenda. Now that there is no longer a man in the house, would you ever walk through to the other side? Praveen was intent on helping Razia establish an escape plan. I suppose so. As I've said, we observed a limited form of Burda when my husband was alive. We didn't go out in public, but at home we only secluded ourselves when businessmen and my late husband's friends called. Will you ring the police or me if you have any worries? Praveen looked intently at her, trying to communicate how bold she might need to be. Yes, Praveen Bibi. You've been so good to counsel me like this. For the first time in hours, I feel as if I can breathe again. Razia opened the car door. Pulling the sari over her face, she slipped back into her secluded world. Wiping away the sweat that now covered her whole face and arms, Praveen returned to the main house. The constables confirmed that Bombay's coroner, Dr. Horace Cartwright, had arrived. Dr. Cartwright had declared Mr. Mukri dead and had overseen the removal of his body to the police morgue. Where have you been? Jamshedji asked. Her father looked disheveled, as if he'd also absorbed the true meaning of the afternoon. A family they'd promised to protect was in crisis. Helping the Farids now was a great deal more than figuring out the financial payouts from the estate. I was holding a consultation inside our Daimla. At his raised eyebrows, she said, We must talk. Razia Begum has some concerns. Is she safe? Praveen sighed heavily. As safe as any of them can be. I really think... Let's speak of it when we're home tonight, he said in a low voice. I'm on my way to the Farid Fabrics office to inform management about Mr. Mukri's passing. Please try to get his parents' names and an address. Praveen imagined his parents would fall into a deep grief. No matter how unpleasant a person might be, there would always be those who'd raised him and saw a different aspect of him. Sub-Inspector Singh carefully trod down the staircase, his heavy box of fingerprinting equipment in one hand. Miss Mystery, have you finished speaking to the widows? Yes, I'm ready to speak with you and your inspector. She did her best to sound civil. It shall be me alone, he said with a hint of pride. Inspector Vaughan has already left. Praveen was upset with herself for not moving faster to share the information she had gained. I've heard your men took Mosen into custody. It turns out that Sakina Begum confirmed to me that he was sent on an errand. A widow may have given him an order, Singh said in the same superior tone he'd used with her when she'd chatted with him about fingerprinting. But how can she know if he went straight out or lingered inside the main house? 
His own daughter admitted Mohsen went to the house to break up a quarrel between you and Mr. Mukri. She realized that if he knew about the argument, she could join a cast of suspects. I can certainly address the quarrel, but that doesn't take away my concern that with Mohsen gone, nobody is here to guard the widows and children. Jamshedji spoke up. A good point. But my daughter and I have a genuine concern that by taking Mohsen away, you are leaving a family of women and children unprotected. I'm sure they'll have some family members come to stay, Mr. Singh said. Praveen's back went up. I asked them about that, and they could not agree on who they'd like to come. In any case, nobody will be here tonight. Inspector, what do you think about the idea of having some constables remain stationed outside the bungalow and perhaps on the first floor? Jamshedji asked in a collegial tone. To take men off regular duty for personal guarding is outside our purview, Singh said, looking uneasily at Jamshedji. If the Malabar Hill Station can't spare men, perhaps the commissioner would send someone from central headquarters. This is rather an important district, and the residents are anxious about the possibility of burglaries. Jamshedji gave Praveen a serious look, and she nodded back. She wished to God that she could operate as smoothly with the police as he did. I'll speak to my inspector about it, the junior detective answered, sounding slightly more agreeable. But that hall area should be cleaned before any constables come in for duty. Is all your evidence collected then? Perveen asked. Yes, so cleaning can be done by the servants, Singh said. It's rather a mess upstairs, I'm afraid. It seemed to Praveen that he was asking the impossible. Sub-Inspector Singh, despite this house's size, cleaning is done by two child servants. For them, cleaning a murder scene would be upsetting, perhaps even cause nightmares. Isn't there an Aya? Jamshedji interjected. She can do it. Ayas deal with every sort of mess. Praveen hadn't met Teba Aya yet, but she could imagine how any children's Aya would feel about mopping up a dead man's blood and a thick layer of black powder. Warily, Praveen said, I'll ask her, but she might refuse. Speak to her and then let's go, Jamshedji said decisively. I shall drop you home before I go on to the mills. But I can't go home. Alice is expecting me. He raised his eyebrows. That's right. You have a date with the English chatterbox. I shall have Armand drop you at her family bungalow, and he will return for me. What is the address? 22 Mount Pleasant, Praveen said. The very new, big white bungalow. The sub-inspector's eyebrows rose. Isn't that some government bigwig's place? Yes, it's the home of Sir David Hobson Jones, who works for the governor, Praveen said, deciding to needle him a little for the sarcastic comment he'd made upon hearing Alice's voice. But it didn't cow him. Singh merely snorted and said, Just what I need, a counselor living around the corner from my investigation. Everything will have to be done twice as fast. Praveen didn't think a murder investigation could be fast-paced. She felt as if she'd just boarded a long-distance train. Who else would come on, and where the journey would end, was far from certain. Nineteen Seventeen Chapter Twenty Sweetness of Home Bombay, March 1917 Arriving on Bombay Mail, stop. 
Vict Terminus, 10 a.m., Sat March 20. Stop. Your loving Perveen. Perveen had paid to have her tersely worded telegram sent from Nagpur, one of the stops on a journey that was supposed to take 40 hours, but that, due to a locomotive change, had stretched to 44. As she emerged on the platform at Victoria Terminus, she wondered if anyone would come. Looking across the platform, she saw families dressed in white flitting through the crowds and remembered it was the Persian New Year. She had been so distraught that she'd not realized her journey would bring her home on the first day of Nowruz, when Parsis filled the city's fire temples and then one another's homes at celebratory parties. Her family would have plans today— her throat was tight as she looked around the platform and searched the hundreds of figures for anyone she might recognize. Perhaps her father would have thought to send Mustafa. She couldn't imagine Grandfather Mystery would come. He was the one who'd never warmed to the idea of her marrying Cyrus. And now she'd done the unthinkable and become a runaway wife. She was sure her grandfather would say that every bead of the family's reputation was lost— I, Perveen. Spinning around, she peered through the crowds to see her father, dressed in the crisp white suit he always wore to the aggiary. Right behind him were Rustam and Camellia, also bedecked in holiday finery. What a surprise! Jamshedji waved, looking at her with a cautiously hopeful expression. Camellia's smile faded as she came close enough to see the yellowed bruises on Perveen's face. Darling, what happened? Perveen, did you fall off the bunk on the train? Rustam teased. Where's your luggage? I have no suitcase. Just this bag. Perveen realized that her voice sounded dry from two days of not talking to anyone. People had kept a wide berth from her, even after she'd cleaned the blood from her face and back in the lavatory. But why? Rustam demanded. What the hell happened? She will tell us later. Camellia held out her arms, and Perveen collapsed into them. Because it was no ruse, Jamshedji and Rustam had to represent the family at Uncle Gustav's New Year's lunch. Praveen was too tired to go, and Camellia said she'd stay. Once the men left, Camellia drew a bath for Praveen and told John to prepare poached eggs on stir-fried fenugreek greens for a meal afterward. Praveen drank five cups of water boiled with mint, which tasted so much better than the Calcutta water she'd drunk for the last six months. And then she went to bed and fell into a quiet, utterly safe blackness. When she woke, it was very dark. The houses nearby were bursting with sounds of merriment, Roman candles whizzing, Victrolas playing, people chattering and laughing over the New Year's feasting in area homes. Perveen went out to her much-missed balcony, where she was surprised to find Grandfather Mystery's pet parrot Lillian sleeping in her large brass cage. Perveen opened the door, hoping Lillian would favor her with a rush of affection, but the bird pecked her hand, looking for food, and then sallied off. As the bird happily soared toward the garden, Perveen heard the door to the bedroom opening behind her, Camellia had come with a tray containing two cups of tea. Finally, you are ready for tea, Camellia said. I wanted you to get water inside you earlier. Accepting her cup of the milky ginger lemongrass brew, Praveen said, I hope Lillian will return. Why is she on my balcony and not at Mystery House? Settling down on the swing, Camellia gave Perveen a sorrowful glance. I know you've had your own concerns, but did you really forget about your grandfather? 
Herveen was taken aback by the gravity of her mother's words and demeanor. I've never forgotten him, but what exactly do you mean? Grandfather Mystery died in his sleep February 20th. I wrote to you about it. The funeral was a month ago, the 22nd. Perveen's heart skipped a beat. Oh my God, Mama! I did not know! He passed away? It can't be true. Camelia bowed her head. Yes, he is in heaven now. Tears pricked the corners of Perveen's eyes as she remembered the last time she'd seen her grandfather. It had been just before she'd traveled to Calcutta, when he'd spoken in strict tones about the importance of adjusting her behavior to the expectations of the in-laws. It was almost as if he'd known what would happen, just as he'd sensed the rotten core within the soda wallas after hearing a description from Mustafa. He went without pain, Camelia said, but it was a big sorrow for all of us. Why didn't I know? Perveen asked, a sob breaking loose. When did you write? Camelia put a light hand on the shoulder of her weeping daughter. Papa sent a telegram on the 20th, and I sent letters afterward. Perveen went rigid with anger. During that part of February, I was in seclusion. I couldn't be downstairs to hear when the post came. Perhaps they didn't give me the telegram and letters because they didn't want me to go to the funeral. How would they know what was inside the letters? Camelia asked. Because somebody opened the letters and read them, yet didn't say anything. Perveen looked up, wiping tears from her eyes. She felt betrayed, even more so than when she'd realized her in-laws had solicited money from her parents. Could it have been Cyrus? As she said his name, Camellia's mouth made a small expression of distaste. He was gone so much. I can't imagine it was he who kept the letters. It must have been Benoush. Camelia leaned forward in her chair and looked intently at Perveen. Tell me who hit you, and how often did it happen? It was Cyrus, not Benoush, and it happened just once. Perveen explained how she'd rushed off to find Cyrus to ask if his family had been trying to get money from her parents. She spoke about the woman she'd seen in her husband's office— and how he'd gone wild with rage when Perveen had confronted him. Camelia held out her hand to Lillian, who had chosen to fly back. Stroking the bird gently, Camelia said, He might have thought hitting you and having other women made him a strong man, but all his behavior has revealed weakness. But what exactly did you say that made him so angry? Perveen hesitated, not sure whether her mother could handle the final hard truth. It was something that was so sordid that it might make Camelia think Perveen didn't belong at home anymore. Slowly, she said, He left another mark. He gave me a disease... A disease? Camellia sounded taken aback. You caught TB, or... It's what they call a venereal disease. Looking down in shame, she said, I can't bear to say its name. I was treated early, so I will live, but the damage inside may be permanent. Not that it matters, as I won't be having children with Cyrus... She added sadly. Camelia looked at her steadily. I have heard of venereal illness, and I know just the female doctor, Cambridge trained, to make sure everything is cleared. I will get an appointment for you. How do you feel about my telling Papa about all of this? 
Praveen was suddenly wary. Do you think he'll want me to go back? If he knows the full story, he most assuredly will not. Camellia's voice was acid. I wasn't sure how he felt when I saw him at the station. I don't want to be married anymore, Mama. There's no point in trying. Camellia stroked back the hair that had fallen across Praveen's brow. What happens now shall be your choice, just as that marriage was. I love you so much, Mama. Praveen wiped the tears that had come with news of her grandfather's death. I don't deserve this after what I put you through last year. Camellia took her hand away. She looked uneasy for a moment and then said, I have my own confession to make. I did not share all your Calcutta letters with Papa, because I thought he would be too vexed. I thought everything would resolve itself when Cyrus spoke up to his parents. He seemed such a pleasant, strong-minded young man, and I know how much you loved him. Perveen nodded. Once I started going into seclusion, we both changed. I was becoming sad and anxious, and he was spending that time apart from me, drinking and... Now I understand, carrying on with other women. I could have told Papa this myself, but I did not want him to hear anything from Calcutta except good news. I wanted to make amends for the big disappointment I'd turned out to be. We were both trying to protect him, Camellia said, looking pensive. But don't forget that he is one of Bombay's most successful lawyers. Now it's his turn to protect you. The next morning, Jamshedji asked Praveen if she felt well enough to accompany him to the office. Gladly, Praveen said, putting down the knife she'd been using to butter a paratha. But it's still no ruse, and you always take a holiday. No clients are coming today he said, stirring sugar into his tea. This is a convenience that provides time to discuss your predicament. As she watched her father drink his tea, Praveen had no idea what he had in mind. Papa, did Mama tell you how I felt? That I wished to file for divorce? Jamshedji's face was studiedly calm. She told me your intentions. I assure you that we both are against you returning to Calcutta, even though we received a ridiculous telegram from Bahram Sodawala two days ago asking us to help restore the marriage. Praveen almost choked on the paratha. After recovering, she said, When you came to the train station, you didn't say that. I would hardly wish to greet you with such news. And I was still very disappointed about your not coming to Grandfather's funeral. I wanted to hear your explanation for that. Looking soberly at her, he added, Among all of us, too many things have gone unsaid. Yes, she agreed, feeling emotion swell inside her. It can never be that way again. Riding through Bombay with her father, Praveen could not get enough of the dear, familiar sights. She'd forgotten what it felt like to have the warm wind ruffle her hair and to see the water shoot up from Flora Fountain, looking like a stream of diamonds. What a city she came from. It would be hard to ever leave it again. When Mustafa opened the door to Mystery House, his graceful adab felt like an embrace— with a smile, he said, Perveen Memsab, is it really you? I've missed you, Mustafa. How do you do? Now that Grandfather Mystery was gone, Mustafa was the sole keeper of Mystery House. She imagined that it would feel lonely at times. He nodded to her. 
Regarding my health, it is very well, thanks be to Allah. I heard from your father that you are not permitted to come for your beloved grandfather's funeral. That must have been a sorrow. But he is here with us still, just as large as he ever was. Mustafa gestured toward a towering portrait of her grandfather, a new addition to the hallway. That portrait certainly is a very grand likeness of my grandfather, Perveen said. Who painted it? Samuel Faizi Rahamin, who studied under John Singer Sargent, Mustafa said. He accomplished it just in the month before your grandfather's passing. Then it's very special, Perveen said regarding the stern expression on the subject's face. She would happily live with her grandfather's visage for the rest of her life, no longer taking it as a mark of criticism. She hoped he would watch out for her now, as he had when Cyrus had appeared. While she'd been reflecting on the portrait, Jamshedji was already halfway up the stairs. Chalo, Perveen. Mustafa, we shall take our tea in about thirty minutes. In the office, everything was as she remembered it. The desks of her father's employees, the clerk, the solicitor, and the typist, were piled with work, but his own was spotlessly neat. It was a large partner's desk, although he used only one side of it. Ever since Praveen could remember, he'd said that he was keeping the other side open for the city's first woman lawyer. Sit. Jamshedji motioned her toward the desk's vacant side, where there was no chair. She fetched one from the other side of the room and sat down. As if Jamshedji didn't know of her churning emotions, he said, You'll see a row of texts I often use on the center of the desk. On the far left is a compendium of Barsi legal acts. It dates from 1865 but it's still the most recent accounting of Parsi family law. Yes, Papa. Perveen located the slender red book and offered it to her father, but he didn't accept it. I know everything in those pages, he said with a shrug. I want you to read the entire text of the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act of 1865, then you shall explain which, if any, points of the act favor your case. It was almost just like law school, except she wasn't nervous. Perveen settled down and opened the book, keeping paper and pen at her side to jot down notes as they came to her. Section 31, Grounds of Judicial Separation, would be the basis of the argument— here was a discussion of divorces being granted for adultery or adultery with cruelty. But the definition of adultery was troubling. I have a question. Perveen looked up from the book at her father. He raised his eyebrows. Of course. It was embarrassing to discuss sexuality with her father, but she had no choice. Clearing her throat, she said... The law describes adultery as a married man's act with a married lady who's not a prostitute. It's called an act of fornication if the fellow takes up with an unmarried lady who's not a prostitute. What category does a prostitute fall under? Do you think the lady you saw in Cyrus's office was a prostitute? I'm not certain, but possibly... Why is there no mention of prostitutes in the legal codes regarding men's behavior? She pushed the text in front of her father and pointed at the pertinent paragraph. Jamshedji read through it and then looked back at her. According to Parsi law, a husband's engaging in relations with a prostitute is not a cause for divorce or even legal separation. Perveen felt disbelief. But that's unconscionable. He nodded. It has been our law since the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act was passed in 1865. What if a husband hits a woman? Couldn't that be grounds of divorce? 
Parveen felt a surge of hope. There were two witnesses in the room, and the Tonga driver. Only if the violence is extremely severe, Jamshedji said, looking soberly at her. And then the court might allow you a judicial separation. But the fact is, you did not lose an eye. You were not stabbed. You didn't go to hospital. We can't begin to present such an argument. Praveen swallowed hard, not wanting to believe what her father was saying. But he hurt me badly. His friends pulled him off me before he could kill me. Looking grim, Jamshedji closed the book. I don't approve of the regulations built into the Divorce Act. However, one blessing is that it's vague enough to be subject to many interpretations. We will think of something. I'm trapped, Praveen said, feeling hollow. Just as if I was still lying on that metal cot in that stinking room. Come now. You must stop brooding about what cannot be and realize the challenge we have even with a request for separation. Perveen gaped at her father, who continued on in a businesslike manner. If Cyrus complains you deserted him without lawful cause, he could sue for restitution of his conjugal rights. I don't think he'll do that, Perveen began. Why would he wish to be separated? He cannot ever remarry. You are a lost asset. What rot! You speak as if I am a jewelry set! Perveen snapped. Her father held up a cautionary finger. Let me explain the worst possible outcome. If the court rules in favor of Cyrus, you could be ordered to return to him. If you don't go, it would mean a heavy financial fine or prison. But living with his family would be like going back to prison. Perveen leaped up from her chair so fast it fell backward with a crash on the floor. Why would a bossy judge rule in favor of a man who struck me, consorted with a prostitute, and gave me a venereal disease? Jamshedji closed his eyes tightly for a moment. Then looking straight at her, he said, Although a judge presides, the marriage court's cases are decided by juries of Parsi laymen. And remember, this case will be heard in Calcutta, where you married a man whose family is well known in a small, tight-knit community. Her father was practically promising they'd lose. Shakily, she said, I can't go back. I'd rather take my life. Don't speak like that. Shaking her head, she said, you already knew what was in the act. Why did you force me to read it when you could have just told me the bad news straight away? You wouldn't have believed it had I told you the only possibility is judicial separation, Jamshedji told her. Of course I will file for the separation, but I am anticipating they will file a countersuit demanding conjugal rights. We will have to convince them to let you live with us. And this is where I need your thoughts, Paveen. You know that family and what matters to them. All that mattered to them was that I'd bear children, and that I was well off enough to provide money to them. Jamshedji looked over the line of books at her. If the Sodawalas read the doctor's letter, stating that the infection Cyrus gave you had nullified your ability to bear a child, they might not want you back. True, Praveen said, feeling bleak at his casual prognosis. But Cyrus can't remarry either. They are stuck. The whole marriage is a stalemate until he commits adultery. Jamshedji said with a faint smile. We must keep our fingers crossed he will commit adultery with some foolish woman and provide us with grounds for a proper divorce. 
In Britain, if a married couple is unhappy, the husband goes off to a hotel with another woman, and a servant there provides testimony they shared a bed. Then they've got grounds for the divorce. She paused. What about me? Could I do the same with a gentleman? Absolutely not, Jamshedji thundered. Not only because it would ruin our family name, but also because there is no provision in Parsi law granting divorce to misbehaving wives. Never mind. She turned from that to the last possibility she could think of. I've got another idea. Benush told her friends that you would be sharing in the costs of a new bottling plant for them. Was that true? His eyes flared. They asked me to pay for everything, as if I were Lord Ready Money and not a simple city solicitor. What did you say to that request? I never answered that letter. Could we get the divorce on grounds of their blackmailing us? Perveen asked. He broke out laughing. You are certainly one who thinks of every angle. But once again, it's not part of Parsi marital law. I hate the law. It's unfair, and lawyers should advocate to have it changed. Her father snorted. You don't like the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act? It's too bad you left law school. Only a Parsi lawyer who really cares about women's rights will push to change it. She nodded. Tell me, Papa, what happens next? Will another lawyer represent me in the case for separation? I'll prepare the case and hire a barrister in Calcutta to argue it before the court. He gave her a searching look. Are you prepared for what this means? If you get the separation, we're willing to have you live in our home beyond our deaths, but you might never be able to remarry. The last thing I want is another marriage, she said with a dry laugh. What will you do with yourself then? Perveen decided to tell him the idea that had slowly come to her during the long train ride from Calcutta to Bombay. I passed the Oxford entrance examinations years ago. At the time, I said I didn't want to go to England because I was afraid of seasickness and the long trip. You also stated you had no interest in spending time with the English. Jamshedji reminded her with a chuckle. Even though I went myself, and you would have been part two in the mystery's Oxford legacy. I've reconsidered things. Taking a deep breath, she said. Did you know that in the 1890s, a female student from Pune was admitted to Somerville College and read law? Miss Cornelia Sorabji works as a solicitor in Bengal and several of the princely kingdoms. Yes, I've heard something, but you are the one I'm concerned about. Why do you think studying law at Oxford would be easier for you than studying it in Bombay? Jamshedji sounded skeptical. It will be hard... But as Grandfather Mystery would have said, every bead of my reputation is sold, Perveen said wryly. I will be away in England for three years of study. Then I can return to Bombay as a working professional. Jamshedji studied her for a long moment. You've had a terrible time. Mama and I want to hold you close to us and make sure you're all right. Do you really wish to leave? She wasn't excited to leave her beloved home, but if she became Bombay's first woman lawyer, that would string the beads back on the ruined necklace and turn them to diamonds. Nineteen twenty one. Chapter twenty one. Talk between men. 
Bombay, February 1921. Perveen had experienced enough blood and tears for the day. It was time to see Alice. In the evening's darkness, the tall Palladian windows of the Hobson Jones bungalow glowed golden and inviting. Armand pulled up to the gate, and a half a dozen guards ran up to surround the car. This was a far cry from the fawning welcome the governor's car had received the day before. A Scottish lance corporal demanded Perveen explain her business. In a cool voice, she gave her name and said she'd been invited by Alice. The Scot consulted a book provided by another one of the guards. Looking up, he grudgingly said, Your name is here. Perveen didn't answer. She was considering the fact that a day earlier, the property had only had four guards. She wondered whether the greater number of guards was tied to the events around the corner. Armand wasn't allowed to drive through the gates into the courtyard. They had a quick discussion about what to do and resolved that he would go back for her father but return for her at nine o'clock. Perveen's suspicions were raised when she walked through the gates and saw, parked close to the house, a car marked with the insignia of the Bombay police. Was an officer making a social call on Alice's parents? Or was it about the trouble around the corner? The household butler was a professional. The tall, elegant-looking Punjabi recognized Perveen from the previous day and ushered her in with the respect that had been missing from the guards. As she followed the butler down the hall, her nose caught the scent of tobacco, and she overheard the rumbling of men's voices from behind one of the closed doors. In the vast, under-furnished drawing room, Alice sat on the carpet surrounded by several small cartons. Holding a record in her hands, she looked up at Perveen. "'Good, you came! I'm looking through the records I brought.' What do you fancy hearing? Alice sounded casually lighthearted. It was as if she were ignoring all that she'd learned about two hours earlier. Perveen wondered about this shift, until she looked toward the veranda and saw a bit of blonde hair peeping over the back of a planter's chair. Lady Gwendolyn Hobson Jones was within hearing distance. I should pay my respects to your mother. Perveen said, gesturing toward the veranda. Alice winked. At your own risk. She's in fine form tonight. Perveen found Alice's mother nursing a half-finished drink and staring out into the dark garden. Good evening, Lady Hobson Jones, Perveen said, trying to put warmth that she didn't feel into the formal greeting. How was your first day with Alice? Quite well, considering. Sit a moment, won't you? The lady's tone was unusually mellow, perhaps due to the crystal tumbler in her hand. I can't fathom why she stays inside on such a pleasant night. She's excited to unpack her records. What do you think of her collection? As my driver pulled up, I could hear it on the street. I listen to Cole Porter any day. Alice has some other records, though, with the most awful, scratchy, rough voices. Al Jolson. Al Jolson, mother! Honestly! Alice called from the drawing room. And where is Sir David tonight? Perveen asked. Does he ever get a chance to truly relax and be at home in the evenings? I wouldn't say he's the relaxing sort, Lady Hobson Jones said. Right now he's in a study dealing with some surprise visitors. Friends? Perveen was fishing, but trying not to seem like it. No, the police commissioner and his aide. Lady Hobson Jones's tone was dismissive. Perveen wanted to know why. If they confer very often, they may yet become friends. Lady Hobson Jones sighed. We knew the last police commissioner, Mr. Edwards, very well. 
Of course, he was an ICS man. Commissioner Griffith is an Imperial policeman who was promoted. Her careful words made Perveen think that Griffith was not what she considered top drawer. Lady Hobson Jones continued. I can only hope Mr. Griffith's experience will enable him to suppress the city's dreadful crime wave. Today, a violent crime occurred around the corner in this very neighborhood. Perveen realized the conversational turn could put her in a difficult position if Alice said anything to her mother about Mystery Law's representation of the Fareeds. She could not possibly discuss the situation. I'm very glad the police are with your husband, and it was nice to see you this evening, but I'll be... Wait. Lady Hobson Jones took a deep sip from the tumbler and then turned to Perveen. You live in a Parsi-only colony, don't you? Perveen was not only annoyed to be delayed, she also didn't like being singled out for her religion. Yes. In Bombay, religious communities tend to settle close to each other, not just Parsis, but Hindus and Muslims, too. What is the crime count in your neighborhood? I don't think anyone's counting, but I can't think of any problems. Perveen looked at the woman, who was now sitting up straight and looking alert. No murders, I'm sure, she said with a light laugh. I've been telling my husband there is security in monotonous communities. Homogenous, Perveen thought. That was the word Lady Hobson Jones was reaching for. But homogeneity did breed monotony. Was Lady Hobson Jones intimating that she wished Malabar Hill would once again become English only? Too many people die in India. The Englishwoman turned pensive. One worries about disease first and foremost. Then there are the terrorists going into people's homes and shooting them. But our new crime is at a bungalow we can see from our windows. Remember, we showed you. Praveen nodded warily. My husband doubts it was a crime of religious hatred or politics. Nevertheless... I'm watching the back of the property tonight, because there aren't enough guards to properly cover all of it. The police and your husband will come up with a good security plan. Praveen tried to sound reassuring. She suspected that most of the woman's attitude was born from fear. Go to Alice, Lady Hobson Jones said. Tell her that she can't go about without a chaperone. This isn't Belgravia. She should behave with the same caution that you do. Inside the drawing room, Perveen found Alice instructing two servants on carrying her Victrola upstairs. Take the last few records from the sofa, she said over her shoulder to Perveen, and bring your drink. There's a gin lime on the tray freshly made for you. Are we going to your room? Perveen said, picking up the cold tumbler in one hand and three records in the other. No, Alice said, huffing a bit as she climbed the stairs with her small load of records. I found an even better place just one floor up that I've decided to make my study. This was a corner room with windows open on both sides up on the third floor. When Alice pulled the chain to turn on the overhead light and fans, an army of mosquitoes and moths began pounding at the wire cloth screens. There were so many flying insects that it was like Victoria Terminus at rush hour. Come sit, Alice said. I have lots to tell, but let's get the music started. Perveen settled into a rattan lounge chair and looked around the room. Ever since her time in Calcutta, she'd had an instinctive dislike of small places. Alice's hideaway had some of the same elements of the Sotawala's seclusion room, a small cot and table. But this retreat was soft. The bed was made up with a printed cotton quilt and embroidered cushions. 
Instead of a metal table, there was a small rosewood desk holding a typewriter and a stack of mathematics books. A bookcase was being filled with records by one of the servants, while the other set the record player on the floor. That's good, thanks. Alice waved off the two servants who had helped, then selected a record for the Victrola. Soon, Al Jolson's scratchy voice filled the room, but it sounded off. Alice groaned. The record looked warped, but I'd hoped it would be all right. I did so hope. It must have been those weeks on the ship, Praveen said. My law books arrived looking like they'd grown goats of green fur. I'll just have to get another one, Alice said, going to the door to close it. And how do you like the room? It's very pretty, but a lot warmer than your bedroom on the second floor. Do you have to keep the door closed? Praveen asked. Alice perched on the hard chair next to the desk. I've something to tell you. She'd already been through hot news in a hot place once that day, but Praveen sipped her cold drink with pleasure. Such announcements from Alice usually meant a good piece of gossip. Before you arrived, I had the records going because I wanted my parents to think I was listening to them in the drawing room. You weren't? Praveen tried not to laugh. This type of scheme was so typical for her friend. Actually, I was curled up on the veranda just outside my father's study, listening to his conversation with some police bigwig. The man spoke about the Farids of 22 Seaview Road, so I thought of you. Alice had spied on the government, an act for which an Indian might go to jail. However, any tip could be helpful. Nodding at Alice, she said, Your mother told me the commissioner was visiting your father downstairs. So that's who he is, Alice looked thoughtful. I overheard a man with a Geordie accent talking about someone called Vaughan who'd requested permission to search the ladies' section of the bungalow. Praveen felt a rush of anxiety, although she strove to keep her expression neutral. Oh, you do have good ears. Alice took a long sip of her gin lime. They also want to take fingerprints. Recalling Sub-Inspector Singh's fascination with criminology, Praveen imagined he wanted fingerprint slips of all the women and children. He already had the silver letter opener, which was likely to have Amina's and Razia's prints. Praveen, you look as if your drink's too sour. Praveen forced a smile. It isn't. I was trying to understand why a routine murder investigation went beyond the detectives involved and all the way up to your father. I thought he was involved in land deals, not law and order. When the governor's away in Delhi, he designates my father to deal with pressing concerns, Alice said. But my father's always been slow to act. That can be frustrating for people, let alone me. Perveen didn't want the conversation to degenerate into Alice's objections about her father. So what else was said? Father asked some more about who might do the fingerprinting. The commissioner told him that the policeman holds the suspect's hand as the fingers are pressed into ink. I can understand your father's questioning, Perveen said, feeling a grudging respect. A Muslim woman has legal grounds to refuse being touched by a man who is not her husband. She also cannot be ordered to appear in a court of law. But does that mean she lives subject to no laws? Alice sounded incredulous. Of course not. In the case of a burden machine, a judge or another court official could record the testimony in her home, or an advocate who'd taken her sworn testimony at home could represent her in court. Praveen had thought this through earlier, knowing there was a chance Razia or any of the wives might become persons of interest. But the pressing concern, excuse the pun, 
is that if a policeman touches the hands of a Muslim gentlewoman, the community could take serious offence. Do you mean that Muslims might go to the police headquarters and complain? Perveen rested her drink on the chair's armrest while she put her thoughts in order. Yes, and in Bombay, this could mean severe political unrest. We are talking about Muslims defending their women's honor, and perhaps even sympathetic Hindus and Sikhs joining in their defense of the Indian female. Any chance to embarrass the government is a golden opportunity for the freedom movement. That must be the reason Father told the commissioner he should stay out of the Zanana. He suggested instead that the police run extra checks for felons recently released from prison and make sure the press are aware of the effort. Perveen didn't answer. It would be horrifying if some fellow with a checkered past was served up as the sacrificial lamb to make the police appear successful. At the same time, she worried about what might come up if the police searched the Zanana. What is it, Perveen? Perveen smiled briefly and took another sip. Just thinking. I wish you'd tell me whether you've got a suspicion about the crime. It's in everyone's interest for the killer to be put behind bars. I've already explained to you about my confidentiality situation. Perveen paused. And please don't think I know what I'm doing. None of my law courses prepared me in the slightest for this afternoon. Alice stood at the window, where a moth as large as a robin kept hitting itself against the wire cloth. Just look at that big-winged fool trying to get inside. My parrot would enjoy making a meal of him, Perveen said. He makes me think of someone going after those secluded women. They're utterly trapped. Not exactly. It's their preference to keep away from men. Perveen recalled Gwendolyn Hobson Jones's anxiety about mixed neighborhoods. Consider your mother. Even though she's been here for many years, India is too full of people she considers frightening for her. Alice wrinkled her nose. My mother's hopeless, and she's got an army of servants and guards to protect her. The security around our bungalow got even tighter due to what happened around the corner. But I still wonder, are the Fareed widows safe staying alone, given what the detectives think might have happened? Perveen went over to Alice who was no longer fixated on moths and mosquitoes, but gazing in the direction of the Fareed bungalow. My father convinced the detective to organize a police presence in the household tonight. Look, we can see the house has some lights on. Alice squinted. Is that it? I see two windows lit on the first floor, and on the ground floor there's one. Perveen wondered if the women were conferring downstairs and who was awake upstairs. Could it be a constable on patrol? How about another drink? Perveen was tempted, but glanced at her watch out of duty. Damnation! It's a few minutes past nine. I promised Arman I'd be at the gate for the ride home. You don't need to use your driver when we've got our own. Alice offered. I can send the butler out to let him know you'll leave later in our car. I wouldn't dream of it. My father will be in the car, and I don't want to put him out. Perveen felt guilty about leaving Alice so quickly after arrival. What about tomorrow evening? Perhaps we could meet at one of the cinema halls. There's a new film called Shakuntala based on Hindu mythology. Alice brightened. Oh, I've heard about it. But does it really star an American woman playing an Indian Maharani? Due to labor shortage, Perveen rolled her eyes. No Indian family would allow their daughter to be ogled on screen. Really? Your family's allowing you to work in a men's world? Alice pointed out. 
Yes, but I'm still not allowed to present myself before a judge. Praveen stood up to go, smoothing her sorry. Whether in the cinema or real life, we ladies have a very long road ahead. Praveen left her friend's hideout, with the strains of the warped recording accompanying her down the stairs. Tonight, the recording of Swanee seemed a distant, distorted version of the one they'd played at St. Hilda's Hall. Although she could strive to keep her old college friendship going, just like the record, it would play differently in Bombay. The police car was no longer in the driveway when she went to stand by the gate. She didn't see the Daimler, which was initially a relief, because it meant that she couldn't be considered the late one. But when no cars drove by, and her watch read 9.15, she began to worry. She stood at the gate, peering down Mount Pleasant Road. At last, the Scottish Lance Corporal lumbered out from the driveway to address her. You goin' or stayin'? he asked in an accusatory manner. I'm hoping to go home in my family car, she answered sharply. Have you seen that Daimler that brought me? He shrugged. I stay inside the wall supervising. But I can tell you, no cars are allowed to wait on the block. Perveen suppressed her irritation and said, What about the guards standing along the wall? Might they have seen the car? Can't tell you. Ask yourself. The first guard, an English soldier with a West Country accent, was politer than the Scot. He confirmed that a Daimler with an Indian driver and Indian gentleman had arrived fifteen minutes earlier, but had not been permitted to wait at the gate. Was that a message for me? Did you hear whether they intended to continue home or wait nearby? Perveen asked the private. She could imagine her hot-tempered father going home and sending Armand back for her. Dunno. They could be farther along, or around the corner on Seaview Road. That's where I'd wait, because it's closer, the private said, pointing in the blackness to where she imagined the cross street was. I'll walk there to see. Very likely I'll come back. She didn't like the idea of lingering in an isolated neighborhood after dark. Apologies that I cannot escort you, madam, but I am on duty. Perveen sighed and began her walk. Alice's street was darker than she liked, with the only lights coming from the gas lamps at household gates and the many stars above. There were no strolling people at all, but she imagined animals were afoot. Owls hooted ominously, and she wondered if they had their eyes out for mongooses and snakes. She'd been listening carefully for footsteps, lest a stranger come up behind her. The sound that she heard, though, was the purr of a car. She stepped back, drawing herself close to a bungalow wall so she wouldn't get hit by the car. No driver could see her in such darkness— and then she realized how strange it was that a car was coming up the road without lights on. It was as if the car didn't want to be seen. The Bengali stranger and Cyrus collided in her imagination, and she saw Mukri's bloody body, too. Perveen felt panic rise within her. Where could she go? All the bungalows around her had their gates locked. She saw the sheltering bulk of a tree about five feet away and was in the process of running toward it when the car came upon her. Its lights flashed on, illuminating her as she tried to climb the tree. Bervine, what in the hell are you doing? Jamsheji roared through a roll-down window. Getting to safety! Why were you driving like that? No lights, no warning! She shouted back. Her heart thumped from the sudden release from fear, and she slid down the three feet of tree trunk that she'd climbed. Armand had already stopped and jumped out to open the car door. So very sorry, Memsab. We were driving without lights to avoid the harassment of those gelsapas guarding your friend's bungalow. They would not even let us wait. 
There would have been no need to wait if Purveen had been outside looking for us, Jamshedji said tightly. All because these English think themselves better than us. It's not like that with Alice, Purveen said. I don't want to hear another word about her, Jamshedji said curtly. I've got a headache, and it's high time we get home. Chapter 22 Bird on the Veranda Bombay, February 1921 Jamshedji's temper improved once the two of them arrived home. He answered Rustam's call to come into the parlor for a sherry. Soon the two men were laughing. Praveen went to the kitchen and saw Gulnaz at the stove. She was tempering cumin seeds and onion, making the tarka that would top a pot of yellow dal Praveen's mother was stirring. It smells good, but where's John? Praveen asked. Since it's so late, we said to him, go, and we'll make the finishing touches, Camellia told her. I like cooking anyway, Gulnaz said with a shrug. Why are you so late? I was out at the Farid bungalow and then my friend Alice's house, Praveen said, pouring herself a glass of water. Papa came for me at nine, but we had a mix-up getting home. Sorry. You are spending all of your time with the English now, Gulnaz spoke in a teasing tone, but it raised Praveen's hackles. Her relationship with Gulnaz had changed after the surprise of finding out Praveen's old schoolmate had been matched up with Rustam. Praveen was resentful that Gulnaz had such an easy, happy, arranged marriage. Praveen imagined that Gulnaz might sometimes envy her three years in England, followed by a career that took her out of the house daily. In any case, they chatted but never confided in each other, the way they had during their time in the Elphinstone College Ladies' Lounge. She knew it wasn't right, so she pushed herself to say something. Alice and I want to go to the cinema tomorrow evening. Will you come? Gulnaz was silent for a spell. I'm not sure. How can we sit with an English person? They've got their own section of the theater. Alice isn't that type. She will insist on sitting with us. Perveen paused. Besides, weren't you the one who thought she'd be useful to know? Yes, but... Kulnaz didn't finish. Perveen knew her sister-in-law wasn't happy with the plan, but so be it. Hanging up her apron, Camellia said, No matter what you might do tomorrow... Now is the time for washing hands. Supper is ready. The meal was a good one. Lamb curry with fenugreek and potatoes, coconut dal, a chicken and tomato curry, and a savory rice pulao. Praveen ate, keeping an eye on her father. She had a slight worry that he hadn't spoken to her in the car because he'd decided to take her off the case. He might have been counting up all the errors she'd made. The fact that she'd gone off walking Malabar Hill in the night could have tipped him over the edge. But then, after supper was cleared and Praveen was in the kitchen assembling a bowl of fruit and vegetable scraps for Lillian, he said he would join her on her balcony. God save the queen, Lillian squawked when they came out together. Mataram! You're hitting both sides of politics, aren't you? Perveen said, smiling as she opened the cage. A clever bird indeed. Jamshedji settled down in one of the rattan lounge chairs and balanced a snifter of port on the wide armrest. Tell me everything. All right, it's a long story. Perveen explained how, after learning the facts... All three women had become hesitant to sign away their mahar, and then she recounted the terrible interruption of her talk with Mumtaz by Mukri. 
Hoping her father didn't think she'd been too naive, she confided. It was such a shock. I hadn't thought anyone could listen to us, and Mr. Mukri had told me he'd be away at work. Households with two sections might appear to have privacy, but it could be that they have the fewest secrets. Jamshedji sipped his port. Precisely because of their walls and screens, people are curious to know everything. Lillian flew the short distance from her cage to the back of Jamshedji's chair and pecked at his hair. He winced and batted at her until she flew off into the garden. Razia Begum managed to keep her role as the Waqf's Mutawali secret from Sakina Begum, Parveen said. That must have taken some doing. She said that she and her husband had agreed it was best. Her father sighed. Farid Saab was a considerate man. It seems he was seeking balance, so each wife had something with which to occupy herself. I mentioned to you earlier that I talked with Razia Begum in the Daimler. Perveen detailed how the murder confession broke down after the direct questions about her clothing. You could be wrong. Might you be advocating for Razia Begum a bit too strongly? Jamshedji asked, studying her. I think it's a classic case of a mother taking blame because she fears for her child. I must keep her away from the police until we know more. Right now, she's panicked. Jamshedji nodded. The need to defend Razia Begum may turn out to be moot, given the police have seized the Durwan. Perhaps there will be evidence pointing to him. Actually, Commissioner Griffith would like to investigate the women. At her father's raised eyebrows, Praveen said, I learned from Alice that the police commissioner called on her father to discuss Mr. Mukri's death. The commissioner was interested in fingerprinting the women and searching the Zanana. Jamshedji looked at her intently. What did the men decide? Sir David told the commissioner not to do it. Instead, he advised the police to round up men recently released from prison. Seeing her father's dubious expression, Praveen added, I don't want to make life any harder on the widows, but I feel it would be dreadful if the police pin the crime on an innocent. Certainly, if there is a homicidal person living at 22 Sea View Road, everyone is at risk. I'd want that individual to be caught. To be apprehended and to have a fair treatment according to the law, Jamshedji corrected. Yes, Praveen said, taking in her father's serious expression. All right, then. I'll tell you what I learned tonight. Jamshedji said, taking another sip of his drink. I went to Farid Fabric's mills, and was fortunate to find the acting director, Mr. Farid's cousin, Muhammad, was still there. I told him about the demise of Faisal Mukri. What was his reaction? He said all the right things, but it didn't seem as if he was heartbroken. Jamshedji gave her a sardonic look. Just as there wasn't grief at 22 Sea View Road, just shock and fear that a savage act had taken place in the bungalow. Praveen asked, Does he know where Mukri lived before the Farid home? Apparently, he had a rented room near the mill district, which he gave up when he had the chance to become household agent. But the office files had a record of his mother's address in Pune. Muhammad Farid was relieved I planned to go in person to tell them the bad news. I'm also glad you're going, Praveen said. Did you ask him if there were any problems for Mukri within the company? Muhammad said there was tremendous jealousy within the company about Farid Saab giving such a perk to a minor accountant. Of course, I asked him why Farid Saab hadn't asked him, a relative living in town, to do it. 
He answered that Farid Saab was worried about the company's future and believed that for his cousin to do both jobs would be too much. I wouldn't be surprised if Mukri poisoned the relationship, Parveen cut in. Jamshedji pointed a finger at her. That is an ungrounded supposition. However, when I asked more questions about Mukri, Muhammad brought in the accounting supervisor, Mr. Sharma. Sharma was surprised to hear of the death and offered condolences. When I pressed him, he said he regretted to speak ill of the dead, but in truth, Mukri was only a fair worker. Much of his work was done by underlings. Yet he managed to keep his job? Mr. Sharma had heard a rumor that Mukri was a distant relative of Mr. Farid's. That's what Mukri told people all the time, that he was so close to Farid Saab, he'd surely become the mill director one day. It turned out he did get selected to be the household agent. Then he played his card to the greatest extent. When Mr. Farid fell ill, Mukri began going to work only two to three days a week, living in the bungalow and using the telephone and the occasional visit to connect with the company. Recently, he'd been coming to work just once a week. Were you able to obtain information on the mill's financial state? I hear most of Bombay's mills aren't doing so well these days. True. In this case, Muhammad Farid blames the company's decline on a string of poor decisions pushed by Mukri during Omar Farid's illness. Apparently, Mr. Mukri told management that Mr. Farid wished to produce new kinds of cloth now that khaki was in decline. The company began experimenting and invested in creating fabrics that haven't sold well. If Mr. Mukri was such a drain on the company and wasn't being fired, isn't there a chance one of his co-workers might have done him in? She paused. Perhaps cousin Muhammad wished him ill. Jamshedji shook his head. Muhammad Farid confirmed he was at work all day. I did not cross-examine him because his behavior isn't for us to investigate. I went to him to get an address, and now I'm able to visit Mrs. Mukri to communicate my regrets and to let her begin preparations for the funeral. I shall travel to Pune tomorrow. One of Mr. Farid's wives is from Pune. Praveen said. Sakina Chivni, do you have time to call on them? Sakina Begum might have concerned relatives who would hurry in to help her despite what she thinks. Who would have thought when I brought on my daughter, she'd be the one to direct my daily program? Jamshedji said with a chuckle. If you can take care of two issues in one trip, isn't it better? She answered with a smile. Tomorrow I'll return to the Farids and see what other help they need. Now that she and her father had talked and a plan was in place, it should have been easy to sleep. But Praveen was haunted by the thought that she had overstepped with Razia. And it was unjust that the family's Durwan was in prison and could very likely be convicted through no fault of his own. When she finally drifted off... She saw the Farid's house in her mind, not the cream-colored miniature palace of daylight, but at night with a light burning in just one window. Whose room was it? As Praveen hastened toward the bungalow, the light went out, and she had an overpowering fear that someone else was in mortal danger. Chapter 23 a Missing Child Bombay, February 1921 Death returns to a Malabar Hill family. This seems somehow familiar. Rustam put down the copy of the Times of India and turned his attention on Praveen. Well, Praveen, isn't this Farid family known to us? If Rustam had been an employee of Mystery Law, she could have told him plenty, but he was merely an annoying brother, so she would reveal the minimum. 
Yawning, she said, Father represented Mr. Farid, who passed away in December. Of course, Rustam said, spearing a piece of bacon. Father asked me to come to Mr. Farid's funeral with him, but we were breaking ground on the flat building that morning. It says here in the paper that a household agent died on the premises. Will you go to this other man's funeral? Gunaz asked, taking the paper out of her husband's hands. She'd just come fresh from her bath, her damp hair hanging in a braid, although she was already dressed to go out in a yellow silk sari over a chantilly lace blouse. She was the picture of youthful beauty. Praveen envied her. There can't be a funeral until the police are finished with their examination of his body, Praveen snapped. She was exhausted from bad dreams and long periods of being awake and worrying over the night. When she'd awoken, it had been late, and she learned her father had already gone off to the train station in Pune. I've always been interested in the spot where the Farid bungalow stands. I came across the plan some time ago in one of the office storage cabinets. We built that house in 1880. Rustam spoke in a manner that seemed both wistful and knowledgeable. You weren't born yet. It was your grandfather's doing, Camellia corrected with a gentle smile. All right, then. Mystery Construction built it, he acknowledged with an eye roll. Father introduced me to Mr. Farid once when he'd come to sign papers at Mystery House. I advised the gentleman to consider taking down the old house and putting up a modern mansion block. If he had five floors, he could have lived on one with his family and taken revenue from the other four. The house is still standing, so he must have declined, Praveen said. Rustam chuckled. He declared, I have two wives and four children at present. There's a chance more will join. There would be no peace in one flat, for all of us to live in one flat would surely bring about suicide, if not murder. He must have been joking, Gulnar said. Of course, everybody laughed. I said that Grandfather built the house very well, so I could understand his continuing enjoyment. Good answer, Camellia said. But now times have changed. Will three secluded women do well staying on without a husband? Do they have friends and relatives nearby visiting them daily? She looked across the snowy lace tablecloth toward Praveen. And why are you so quiet about this? Mama, one of the widows is my client, so I'm maintaining confidentiality. But I will find a way for them all to have support. She would back them unequivocally, just as her mother had supported her. A glint came into Rustam's eyes. Now that the husband is gone, the wives are the ones who can decide about the bungalow. Ask the widows if they wish to profit in a booming market. Are you saying this because you know of someone who is looking for land in Malabar Hill? Purveen challenged him. I could find an offer for them before close of business today. Whenever they're ready, he added with an air of generosity. Please don't say anything to anyone about property coming available on Seaview Road, Praveen said. It's putting the cart before the horse and would also place me in conflict of interest. Agreed, Camellia said smoothly. Praveen... I wanted to mention that Papa asked me to find out whether any new madrasas are being built in the city. Are you interested in the answer? Naturally. What have you heard? I spoke with two of the Muslim ladies in my secondary education group. They said the only boy's madrasa being started is a school operated by Daudi Bora Muslims, Camellia said. The Farids are Sunni Muslims. They probably wouldn't be involved. 
Praveen felt certain that Mr. Mukri's madrasa had been a fiction, and he'd wanted the wakf money to do something else. A familiar tooting sound meant that Armand was back from taking her father to the train. It was time to go. Half an hour later, the Daimler stopped at the locked iron gate of the Farid bungalow. Armand opened the car door for Praveen, who stepped out and went to the gate, looking through it for someone to help her. Feeling the attention of two Durwans at a bungalow across the way, she decided to find out if they knew anything. Good morning. Are the police staying inside the bungalow? What police? The taller of the two guards snorted at her question. Nobody's been there since the Sikh detective left yesterday. Little Zaid locked up the gate. So the widows hadn't been secure. Immediately she felt a surge of anxiety. But I must see the Begums. If you call, maybe the boy will come to the gate. He was crying earlier, the second guard said soberly. Musen is still away then? she asked. That liar, the tall guard said with a grimace. He told the police he was spending time with us on the street when he wasn't. We saw him go down the hill and come back. Perhaps this lie is the reason they took him away. Sakina had sent Mosen on an errand. Why hadn't he just said that? Feeling somewhat confused, she decided to ask the men more about the Durwan. What is your opinion of Mosen as a god and as a man? The tall guard with the surly attitude shrugged. He does his job the same as anyone, but he is not the happy sort, doesn't talk much. He has a right to misery, the other guard opined. To lose a wife and have to raise two children on so little money is hard. Everyone is paid too little, the taller guard said. There was an edge to his voice that was unnerving. What would the men say if they knew that she was a well-paid working woman? Praveen thanked them and returned to the gate. Zaid, are you there? After she'd called for a few minutes, the boy emerged down the driveway. Thank you for coming, she said, softening her voice. I'm so sorry about your father still being gone. Why did they take him? The boy whimpered. I told your sister that I'd try to find out. Will you please unbolt the gate? Zaid's face screwed up with effort as his tiny hands pulled back the iron bolt. Praveen walked on ahead with Zaid, Armand following in the car. The chauffeur parked outside the main entrance, while Zaid opened the Zanana entrance for her. What happened with the police yesterday? She asked Zaid. She couldn't remember the details of her bad dream from the night before, but it had flickered back into her mind when she'd spoken with the two Durwans. They stayed for a little bit. Some constables and the white officer took my father. And then the Sikh officer left. He looked up at her with wide eyes. I'm glad they didn't take any more people. But why did they have to take Abba? He is the only one protecting the place. I agree that everyone needs protection. Zaid, perhaps you should stay at the gate to help if anyone comes? Leaning closer to him, she said, Don't let in newspaper men or curiosity seekers. Just the police or people related to the Begums and others you know are trustworthy. Zaid straightened up in the classic Durwan at attention position he must have learned from his father. Yes, I will be careful. Abba may come back today, inshallah. Purveen heard footsteps and looked to see an elderly lady in a white sari coming downstairs carrying a baby. The nursemaid must not have expected to see Purveen because she clutched the baby tightly and her eyes widened in alarm. 
Are you Deba Aya? I'm the family's lawyer, Paveen Mistry. Eh? The woman said, as if she couldn't hear well. When she'd reached the foot of the stairs, Paveen stepped forward and repeated the introduction and her question. Taiba rolled her head sideways in agreement. Yes, I care for the children. Are you the one who said I had to clean up the black dust and blood? Praveen wanted to say it hadn't been her idea, but shoving the blame on her father would be unprofessional. I'm sorry. We could not think of anyone else, and I know it must have been awful. Your proper job is taking care of the little one. May I see him? Look quickly. She adjusted the bundle so Praveen saw a fair-skinned baby wearing a crocheted cap and white muslin dress. His eyes were closed, but she could see that his nose and jaw had the same delicate lines as Sakina's. So this is Jum Jum. Praveen studied the boy, who was gently snoring. She noticed that behind his ear, someone had marked a black dot of coal. The Protect Against Evil Eye mark was similar to the dots that Parsis drew on their children's head and feet, and the thick coal eyeliner that adorned young Hindu children. She thought of Zaid, the little boy who had a true black mark. Zaid was healthy, but he had suffered misfortune. As the Farid's only son, Jum Jum was extremely precious. He would carry on the family name and would be the chief heir, inheriting 35% of everything. Each of the three daughters would get half his take, 17.5%. Unfortunately, the wives would be granted far less. If Mr. Farid had had just one wife, she would have been allotted one-eighth, but because he'd had three... That share had to be divided, and each lady would receive just 4.17%. Knowing this was another reason she'd taken her time making sure the estate was in order. The widows should get every paisa due to them. Taba carried the child into the garden, where Nasreen and Shireen were playing a desultory game of ball rolling. Praveen realized to get anything more from the ayah, she'd have to follow. How often are you outside of the zanana? she asked. Now and again. She looked cautiously at Praveen. When I was in the main house yesterday, I thought it seemed Mukri Saab used the former master bedroom. Is that right? Taba Aya spat out of the side of her mouth. Yes, he moved in like he was the new Buddha Saab. Yesterday, I saw two glasses near the bed. She paused. Do you know if anyone else slept there? Eh? The woman's face was a vision of confusion. Slowly and clearly, she repeated... I saw two drinking glasses in the bedchamber. Who stayed with him? Was it a lady from the outside or inside the house? Taba Aya shook her white head vigorously. Don't ask me. I sleep with children. You sleep in the nursery with Jum Jum Shirin and Nasreen. Not the older girls, Amina and Fatima. She paused, knowing her last question would be shocking. Do you think he might have made them sleep with him? Both are good girls. Who are you to say such things? The ayah screeched and let loose some Marathi curses Perveen would not have expected her to know. Perveen spoke hastily. I was not blaming them, and I certainly hope for their own sake nothing happened. What about the widows? Taba's roomy eyes narrowed. You are asking me that question in the house where they live? They are respectable ladies. You are rude. 
Perveen raised her hands in surrender. I'm sorry. Can you at least tell me whether you heard any shouting or screaming yesterday afternoon? Of course. Jum Jum was crying all afternoon. Bad tooth. Not even our Amina could calm him. Perveen seized on the revelation. Did Amina stay with you in the nursery most of the afternoon? She sang to Jum Jum for a while, but he was still cross, so I let her go. Perhaps this was when Amina had heard the cry. Watching Teba Aya squint into the distance, observing Nasreen and Shireen tussling over the ball, Perveen asked, Do you believe the killer came from outside of the house? From where else? It could not be Mosen or our cook, Iqbal. Both were too afraid of Mukri to go near him. Why were they afraid? Did you know he stopped all servants' payments, telling us that food and shelter was enough? We lost the six other staff we had when he did this. Only Iqbal and Mosen and his children remained. I also stayed because it was a roof over my head, and I am too old to go anywhere. Did you speak to the police about this? Teba Aya broke into a hacking cough. At the end of it, she said, They never asked. They only wished to know if I helped someone to get inside. The Sikh detective thought I was lying about not hearing sounds. When that baby was crying to the heavens, giving everyone headache. And in the short conversation, Teba Aya had proven that she was hard of hearing. Praveen wanted to ask more, but Jum Jum started bawling. A fly had landed on his face. Teba Aya swatted at it making Jum Jum cry more. It was very good of you to clean yesterday, Praveen said, giving the elderly lady a rupee that was accepted with a wide smile. It is good that you've come. The Begums could use help because of Amina. Of course, there's much to get in order, Perveen interrupted herself because Teba's sentence had ended strangely. What about Amina? Shaking her head again, Teba said, She hid yesterday evening and hasn't come out. Are you sure she's hiding? Perveen had an odd feeling, a tightness in her chest that she recognized as fear. Who knows? She thinks she's too old for me to supervise her. But then this happens. Praveen interrupted her. Where are the Begums right now? Razia's room. Praveen hurried upstairs, thinking that it was strange Teba Aya hadn't told her about Amina's disappearance immediately. Didn't the Aya fear Amina's disappearance following a violent crime might mean that whoever had killed Mukri had done away with the young girl? Or what if Amina had decided to leave the house and go to Praveen's office for help? But surely Mustafa would have admitted her and telephoned to say what had happened. Rounding the corner into the hall where Razia's room lay, Praveen felt nothing but worry. Even if Amina turned out to be playing a hiding game, as the Aya thought, Perveen would be so relieved to see her that she wouldn't scold. If the girl was hiding, there had to be a solid reason for it. Razia's door was open a crack, but Perveen knocked on it to alert the widows of her presence. Razia and Sakina, who'd been sitting silently at the partner's desk, turned quickly. Adab, May I come in? Perveen asked. Please, Razia said, standing. She spoke shakily. We're trying to manage a new trouble. My daughter is gone.
Coming forward to put a hand on Razia's shoulder, Praveen said, Deba Aya just told me. We will find her. I telephoned last night at nine, Sakina said, to the number on the card, but nobody answered. Praveen felt sick. This was when she was at Alice's and her father was away from the office. If only Sakina had called the number to the house. At first we weren't very worried, because she has so many little hiding places where she reads and draws, Sakina said. But then she never came out, not even for dinner. Why didn't you call the police? Praveen demanded. They went away earlier, Razia said, her face a mask of misery. We know they would not care. And then we found some objects were missing. Praveen couldn't hide her apprehension. How is this connected? The objects could have been stolen by whoever came for Mr. Mukri. No, Razia whispered. Amina's clothing, her sketchbook, and satchel were gone. And tell her what you found later, Sakina interjected. Razia sank down into her chair. Also missing are my address book, a city guidebook, and twenty rupees from this desk. Praveen's mind leaped to the obvious. Do you think she left Malabar Hill? Maybe. Razia sounded uncertain. She is very fond of our relatives in Oud. Two years ago we went by train, and she took a great interest in the route. She might think she can make the journey herself. It is hard to think she would leave us at a time like this, but girls are emotional, Sakina said softly, and the gate was unguarded. Perhaps she saw a chance. Praveen thought it unlikely that Amina had taken advantage of lapsed security to explore the world. The only reason she would have fled would be to save her own life, or possibly tell someone outside of the house that they needed help. I don't understand why Amina wouldn't have left a note explaining what she'd done. How can a girl with no experience in the city make her way down from Malabar Hill and out to Victoria Terminus? And then she'd have to buy a long-distance train ticket at the window— if she tried that, it would have been noticed. We can tell the police to put out a watch for her. They can send a message out to constables and to the railways. No, no, Razia said with a moan. No policeman. Not after yesterday. But when people are looking out for a missing child, it improves the chance of her being found. Praveen had to struggle not to shake the woman who knew so little about the world. We can even offer a reward for her safe return. No. Razia shook her head decisively. Praveen looked from her to Sakina. I think I can explain her feeling, Sakina said, patting Razia's hand. If it is publicly known that Amina has wandered the city... Her reputation will be ruined. We will never find a groom for her. We are praying for Allah's blessing on her travels to Oud. After that, we would humbly request your assistance in returning her to Bombay. Praveen knew all about ruined reputations. But wouldn't a mother wish to try everything to find a missing child? She looked imploringly to Razia to contradict Sakina but the senior wife stayed silent. And then Praveen recalled Razia's secret fear that Amina had killed Mr. Mukri. What if Razia had sent off her daughter to avoid prosecution, not necessarily alone, but guided by someone whom she trusted? If that were the case, and Praveen called the police herself— she would potentially violate her attorney-client relationship with Razia and put Amina in jeopardy. She couldn't do it. Sighing, she said, 
I've told you what I consider the wisest course of action. I don't know what I can do to help you. There is something. Razia's anguished eyes fixed on Praveen. Conditions are more old-fashioned in Oud. My family house has no telephone. I will write a telegram. Perhaps you can send it. I'd like my family to have my younger brother. He's Amina's favorite uncle. Wait at the railway station. I'll do that. Parveen shifted her gaze to Sakina. Please, I need to know more about Mosen, because the police are still holding him. Why? I told you yesterday that I sent him to get me Rose Atta, Sakina said. Did you not tell the police? I told the sub-inspector about the errand, but it didn't make an impact. One of the problems was that Mohsen first gave the police a false story, that he was socializing with the neighboring Durwans. I don't know why he'd say that, Razia said with a sigh. But then, we don't know him at all. Praveen wasn't sure that was true. He runs errands often. How do you communicate with him when you're in Perda? Sakina shrugged, and her black chiffon sari slipped at the shoulder. We speak to Fatima, and she brings him any of our requests. This time I asked him to fetch Rose Atta from Mr. Attawalla's shop in Zaveri Bazaar. I did it right after Mukrisab threw you out. Why would you send him on an errand when so much was going on in the household? Smelling roses calms my nerves, Sakina answered. I have used it so much since our husband's passing. I realized that my bottle was empty. The sub-inspector suggested that Mohsen could have been in the bungalow and killed Mukrisa before he went off on your errand. What do you think of that? I don't know, Razia said in a low voice. I must not speak ill of someone who has only helped us in the past. Hardly a vote of confidence. Praveen studied Sakina, who was fiddling with the edge of her sari, giving credence to her description of nervousness. Mohsen came back yesterday evening and was stopped straight away by the police. Sakina Begum, did you receive the Atta? No. Sakina put her hand to her mouth. If the perfume isn't here, it might mean he didn't go to Zaveri Bazaar, that he did that terrible thing. On the other hand, he might have given the Atta to Fatima to pass on to you just before he was taken away. I shall ask her. Parveen paused. Where is Mumtaz, Begum? We haven't seen her yet. She is always a late sleeper, Razia said with a hint of disapproval. Perveen certainly hoped the widow was in her room sleeping, but she no longer thought that anyone could be safe at the Farid bungalow. Chapter 24 a Wife's Secret Joy Bombay, February 1921 Fatima was washing the carved marble baseboard running along the hallway when Praveen came out to visit Muntaz's room. Bending down, Praveen said, I'm on my way to see Muntaz, Begum, but I've got a question. Did your father leave anything with you before the police took him away? No. Fatima put down the rag she'd been using. What should he have given me? I thought you might have the atta he bought for Sakina Begum, but never mind. Fatima lowered her voice. Did you hear? Amina's missing. Parveen nodded. Do you think she went to Oud? 
Fatima picked up the rag again and squeezed it hard. But how could she go? She's just a girl. And she was my friend. She wouldn't leave without saying goodbye. Is there a chance she's hiding? Fatima scrubbed away at the baseboard. She hides because she listens to people, not because she's playing. Maybe she cannot be found because... She took several deep breaths. The killer came back. I pray that's not the case. It's so frightening now with Abba away. Zaid and I were alone in our hut last night. We put a rice bag against the door so we would hear if someone was coming for us. And Iqbal gave us a knife from the kitchen for our protection. Zaid said he'd use it to save the two of us, but he's so small. A voice moaned from the other side of Mumtaz's door. Praveen's first instinct was panic, but she controlled the reaction. Is that Mumtaz? Yes, she must have heard us, Fatima said, putting down the rag and standing up. I'll go in with you. She's not well in the morning. Fatima tiptoed ahead of Praveen into the dark room to touch Mumtaz on the shoulder. Sorry, Mumtaz murmured as she pulled herself up from the bed. No, I apologize for disturbing you again, Praveen said while the maidservant pulled open the long curtains covering the jollies. Mumtaz Begum, shall I bring your special tea? Fatima asked. There was a note of tenderness in the girl's voice that showed her obvious affection for the outsider wife. Not yet. Mumtaz groped at the bedside table, knocking over a brass tumbler of water. Praveen rushed to pick up the tumbler as Mumtaz hurriedly used the previous day's sari to wipe at the spilled water. As Mumtaz moved, dressed in a blouse and petticoat, her rounded figure was revealed. Praveen looked away, trying to give the disheveled woman a bit of privacy as she covered up again with the sheet. Mumtaz sleepily rubbed her eyes. Is there any news of Amina? The Begums believe she went off to go to Razia's family home in Oud. Does that strike you as likely? Praveen added. Whatever you tell me can remain private. Amina is so interested in going places. She's not fearful like the Begums. Mumtaz commented. Many times she has told me about her trips to Oud. But this is not good. How could a child like that get out of our gate and know what to do? I can't imagine it. Perveen agreed. But if she had gone out, the neighboring Durwans would probably have seen her, or someone else in the neighborhood would have told them. How would they know to recognize her? She's always stayed behind the property wall. You're right, Perveen said, feeling stupid. Bombay is a hard city for girls. Everywhere there is a villain. Oh, Mumtaz put a hand over her mouth. Do you feel sick again? The bucket. Mumtaz gestured to the floor, and Praveen saw a small bucket that she quickly grabbed and brought to Mumtaz. Mumtaz bent her head and vomited a watery stream into the bucket. The sickly sweet odor curled inside Praveen's nose, and she adjusted the fan's speed. Putting the bucket aside, Mumtaz said, Get Fatima again. This is too dirty for you. No, it is not. Things were coming together in Praveen's mind. Mumtaz's weakness, her rounded figure. She had spent many months living with Omar Farid. Praveen would have thought him too weak for sexual activity, but she could be wrong. Have you seen a doctor recently? Praveen asked. No, because it is still that... She paused. 
If I tell you something, will you tell the others? I promised your privacy, Praveen said, her suspicion growing. Mumtaz gave a half-smile. I'm going to have a baby. That is a most blessed event. Praveen was shocked, trying to do the calculations in her head. You must see a doctor. He can tell you when your baby will be born. I know that myself, based on when my husband and I came together, she said. Praveen nodded, thinking again about the two glasses in Mr. Mukri's room. Perhaps Mr. Farid wasn't the father. How many months until the birth? Six months? Inshallah, my baby will be born during the rainy season. So it was likely that Mr. Farid was the baby's father. She would not automatically doubt Mumtaz. On the other hand, Praveen remembered how Sakina had spoken dismissively of Mumtaz's knowing Mr. Mukri from Falkland Road. He could believe Mumtaz owed him something for introducing her to Omar Farid. What are you thinking? Are you displeased there will be another baby? Mumtaz sounded aggrieved. I'm happy for you, Praveen said, trying to hide all the worries she felt. I was only thinking you probably should tell Sakina Begum and Razia Begum, who may have guessed already. They were pregnant before. They know the signs, and they'll make you feel better. Gingerly, she lay back down in bed. I would fear that kind of assistance. Why? Lowering her voice to a whisper, Mumtaz put a hand on her stomach. Imagine if I'm carrying the household's next son. Another heir. They will be jealous. Sakina Begum because she has a son, and Razia Begum because she doesn't. They might say it's Mukri Saab's child and throw me out. She'd addressed what Praveen had been thinking about. Given Mukri's power, his abuse of any of the wives was a possibility, and Mumtaz was lowest in the hierarchy. For now, Praveen would not jump to that assumption. Mumtaz had shared a bedroom with Omar Farid for the five months leading to his death. Your husband was still alive ten weeks ago. If the baby comes in August, there should not be any doubt. It is many months until then. They could make my life very hard. I could lose the child, or even my own life. How can I not feel endangered after the evil deed that occurred? Feeling a chill, Praveen pressed her arms around herself for comfort, if Faisal Mukri was the only one who could contradict Mumtaz's claim of impregnation by her husband, she'd had reason to kill him. You are looking so angry, Mumtaz said. What are you thinking? Praveen loosened her grip on herself and forced a smile. Sorry, I'm not angry. I'm thinking about many things. You have the worry for your growing baby— Razia has the sorrow of a missing child, and Sakina... She trailed off, thinking. Sakina is worried for everyone in the house, and her children are at risk, too. Things will change for everyone after Idat finishes, Mumtaz said. Once the morning time has passed, a widow can remarry. Probably both of them will do that. I shan't, because my son will keep me too busy. As long as I can stay in this house, I don't need a man's support. And that could make those two very angry. Praveen tried to caution her. You are just guessing that... How will it be for Sakina, watching me all these months and wondering if I have a boy to compete with hers... And Razia Begum counts every paisa. 
There are four children now. A fifth would cause great expense. Better to get rid of me. Mumtaz pressed a hand to her brow, as if she were a film actress showing great agony. They cannot throw you out, Praveen said. Legally, you have the same rights as they do. In a trembling voice, Mumtaz said, I could fall down the stairs in a terrible accident. I might die from eating bad food. This is the reason I keep to myself. They know that Fatima tastes everything for me before I eat it. I offered to help you find a place to live when we spoke yesterday, Praveen said, feeling wary of Mumtaz's sudden show of desperation. You fear for your life, but you want to remain here. If I leave, my child's claim on the estate becomes harder to prove, so I must endure. Mumtaz's voice was shaky. I want him to grow up here, a Farid with wealth, just like the others. It seemed clear Mumtaz had a plan for the rest of her life and wouldn't be swayed. Praveen sighed. Take care of yourself, Mumtaz Begum. I wasn't able to give you my card yesterday, but here it is now. Telephone if you need me. The young wife nodded glumly. I will do that, and I will make a prayer today for dear little Amina. May Allah protect her, just as I hope he protects me. Chapter 25 The Scent of Rose Bombay, February 1921 before leaving, Praveen stopped in at the cooking hut to meet Iqbal, the elderly household cook. He had been at the market when the terrible event had occurred. He also had no idea about Amina's disappearance. He was anxious to know how he could buy food for the house now that Mukri wasn't providing any money. Praveen gave him ten rupees to cover the next few weeks' expenses, asking him to write down what was bought. He smiled at the money, but did not offer any more information. At her direction, Armand drove her down Malabar Hill and back into the heart of Bombay. Their first stop in town was the telegraph building, where she dictated the telegram for Razia and requested that it be delivered to her family estate in Oud. Next, Armand drove to the Zaveri Bazaar. A. H. Atterwala's shop was one in a line selling atters, the alcohol-free essences of the most fragrant and healthful flowers, shrubs, and trees. Even though the vials and bottles were closed, the shop was heavy in scent. Praveen stopped breathing for a moment as she thought that these myriad fragrances, just like the secrets at the Farid house, couldn't be completely suppressed. Mr. Atterwala, the shop owner, was a small man in his eighties who wore a tall, stiff tarbouche that made him eight inches taller. He had a genial air and listened carefully to what she said. Praveen introduced herself as the Farid family's lawyer and asked about Mohsen. I know the fellow you speak of. His full name is Mohsen Dawai. He serves a gentleman who recently passed to paradise, said Mr. Atterwala, stroking his long, flowing white beard. Farid Saab was a righteous man with good wives. Over the years, Mohsen has come to buy Atta for the household members. Did Mohsen shop here yesterday? Yes, he arrived just after our late afternoon prayers. He purchased a vial of sandalwood atta. Parveen recalled Sakina talking about needing a rose atter to calm her nerves. Are you sure it wasn't rose oil? Rose is the atter that brings sleep and relieves anxiety, isn't it? 
I am an old man with an imperfect memory. Let me check that. Mr. Atterwala invited her to follow him to a long counter crowded with bottles. From underneath, he brought up a large ledger book. Here, here, read it yourself. He pointed to a line. He had sold sandalwood at her, one bottle for two annas. She could see listed next to it, Omar Farid, 22 Seaview Road. Sighing, he said, I will add this to the tally. Every month I send a bill to the Farid house. Mohsen said that once a lawyer fixes the estate, the account will be paid. Perveen went on alert. Do you mean to say that Mohsen didn't pay you yesterday? He has not paid in six months. He tells me to add the charge to the running household bill. He asked me if I could recommend a good jeweler, too, but I cannot imagine a jeweler would accept his promise of credit, the merchant added with a frown. Mohsen's interest in jewelry was significant. What if he'd robbed Sakina? In any case, if he was taking Attar without paying, it might mean that he'd pocketed the money Sakina had given him for the errand. If this type of behavior had gone on for months and bills were coming to the house, surely Mr. Mukri had known. Perhaps he'd confronted Mohsen about it, and this had led to the killing. What is the exact amount you're waiting for the Farid household to pay for all the past perfume expenses? Let me go to the back of the book for that. He turned pages of the book until he reached the right place, stabbing a finger at a line. Yes, last payment to us was made in October. The household owes four rupees sixty paise. And not just for Atta, for skin oils and incense too. If you are able to pay today, I will be pleased to give a receipt. Perveen looked down the line of expenses. There had been several bottles of rosewater attar purchased in the past, but it looked as if in the past six months the choice had been sandalwood, an oil more often used for erotic purposes. Perveen opened her purse, examined what was left, and asked if he could please write a receipt for her in Hindi or English. Given the alacrity of his response, she suspected he might have been able to present a bill in German. She also requested him to write a statement detailing the time of Mohsen's visit the day before, which he signed with a flourish. I am grateful to you, madam. This is a small gift for your kindness. Mr. Atterwala put a tiny vial of pinkish liquid into her hand. What is it? The rose scent. Once you smell it, I'm sure you will come back to buy more. Perveen hadn't worn scent since she'd left her marriage, and that had been sandalwood. However, she thanked him for the attar and tucked it into her bag. From the Zaveri Bazaar, it was only twenty minutes around the bay to the Malabar Hill police station on Ridge Road, the tile-roofed yellow stucco station looked very modern next to its elderly neighbor, a stone Jain temple dating from the early 1820s. A steady throng of barefoot Jains was coursing around the temple, not giving way for the constables. It was as if the fellows didn't even exist. Perveen couldn't help smiling at the sight. Perveen stopped at the temple's bakery window and bought a box of caraway butter biscuits. Namkeen biscuits would be a practical item to give Mohsen, because they wouldn't quickly spoil. Perveen had visited different police stations around Bombay with her father, so she knew to go straight to the duty sergeant and present her business card. She opened her purse for it to be searched, as well as the small paper box of biscuits— Taking one biscuit, the constable munched and swallowed before speaking. He's in the cell block. 
Perveen longed to tell the man to take his fat, ink-stained fingers out of the box, but she couldn't. The message was clear. She had to give him something in exchange for service. All the prisoner cells were in the basement. Mosen was in a hot, smelly chamber with four men of varying ages. He was the only one in a uniform. The others were in rags. The fact that the Durwan still wore the long-sleeved green uniform, the symbol of respectability in the Farid household, struck her as poignant. Perveen couldn't possibly speak to Mosen in such an environment and in the presence of others. She made the point to the constable and a prison guard, who eventually agreed to allow Mosen to accompany her to a nearby office room, which was better ventilated but had no amenities other than a table and two hard chairs. As they sat down together, Mosen looked uneasily at her. It was almost as if she'd come to the gate and he was once again hesitant to admit her. Do you remember me? she asked. I'm the Farid's lawyer. I know, he said gruffly. Why have you come? Your children are very worried. I wanted to tell them what happened to you. She handed him the box, which still had some biscuits in it. You must be hungry. Mosen finished all that was within before he spoke again. Thank you. They have only given me bread and water. What happened yesterday? Praveen folded her arms on the table and settled in. There was no need to take notes yet. It might put Mosen on edge. Sakina Begum needed Atta from A. H. Attawalla's shop, he said in a monotone. I did not wish to go because the Buddha Saab had come home. But then I thought that he was inside for the evening. How would he know if I went off for such a short time? And the Begums expect my services. And he needed money badly because he was no longer paid. How did you travel to the bazaar? I walked downhill and then got a tram. At Atawalla's... You purchased sandalwood oil costing two annas. Didn't Sakina Begum ask for rose atta? He shook his head vigorously. She did not say the type, but I know what she wants. It is always sandalwood. At times, Praveen could still smell the sandalwood oil from her wedding night. Shaking herself, she asked, What amount of money did Sakina Begum give you? His face became guarded. One rupee, but some was gone for the tram cost. She suspected this was a partial truth. Tell me, did you avoid telling the police about the errand at first because you wanted this trip to remain unknown? Yes, he said, nodding with seeming relief. When they met me at the gate... I thought that Mukri Saab had complained to them about me. That is why I said I was just away down the street rather than farther away. He would not like me performing duties for the widows. Little did I know the other Durwans would be asked and then contradict me. And what reason did the police give for arresting you? They said because I lied about being with the Durwans down the street... I must go with them to have my fingerprints checked. I said it was needless. The police made prints five years ago. In what situation were they taken? She asked, wondering if he had been charged with a crime. Looking warily at her, he said, I'd been working at the docks, and Farid Saab told me I could work at the house. When I started, the police came around and took the prints. Most Durwans in Bombay have their prints recorded with the police. Taking Mosen here to be fingerprinted allowed the police to tell the press they had a suspect in custody. Furthermore, keeping him in the cell gave them the opportunity to force a confession if they never found anyone more suitable. Did you ever tell the police you went to Zaveri Bazaar for Sakina Begum? Yes, when I was questioned here. 
They looked at the atta I was carrying and said, This means nothing. What happened to it? He hesitated a moment. They took everything from my pocket and say they're keeping it for now. Probably it's gone, he added glumly. Recalling the many inconsistencies, Purveen knew it was time to press on. I visited Atawala Saab this morning. He remembers everything about your visit yesterday and wrote an affidavit. That is a sworn statement of the timing and so on. He said I was there. A hopeful smile appeared on Mosan's long face. He also shared this long list of purchases you made on behalf of the Begums that weren't paid for with the petty cash they gave you, she said crisply. At his request, I settled that bill. I wish I could pay, he mumbled, but I cannot. It was hard to maintain composure when she wanted to shout at him, demanding that he acknowledge his thieving. You took money from Sakina Begum yesterday, and I know you have done the same with the others. What are you buying with the Begum's money? There is a lotion for skin. Very expensive. Made by a doctor. I've been putting it on Zaid for a year now. The mark is lightning, so perhaps he will find a paying position somewhere. We will have a better life, inshallah. Purveen opened her notebook now and made the notes on Mosen's testimony that she had held back from making earlier while he was talking. Then she read it all back to Mosen, who nodded along with it. That is the truth, he pronounced gloomily. I know you asked Mr. Atawala about a jeweler. Did you take any jewelry from the house? Now he looked incensed. Certainly not. I am not a thief. I am a house guard. Purveen nodded, resolving to ask the women to look through their jewelry collections when she saw them. Do you know anything about Mukri Saab that might have led to his death? She stared at Mosen, looking for evidence of hesitation. I know he tried to steal funds from the Begums. What kinds of things did you notice? His eyes glittered with emotion. He was a bad man. He only got his place at the factory because of being in the family. He did nothing to earn it. This sounded similar to what her father had heard. Do you know if he was into any type of business outside of work? Did strange men come around or even ladies? He shook his head sharply. Nobody came. He liked keeping that house for himself. Thank you, Mosen. Purveen stood and slid her notebook back into her briefcase. Will you go back to the bungalow? She shook her head. I've got other things to do first. I shall visit them tomorrow. Will the police allow me to place a call to the bungalow? I would like to speak with Sakina Begum. She imagined that he'd make a plea for Sakina to tell the police about the errand. I'll ask them. I will also show Mr. Atawala's statement about your purchase to the police. Mosen had a spring in his step when the guard led him back to his cell. The same guard escorted Purveen upstairs. Taking a breath of good air, she tried to collect her thoughts. She had read Mosen correctly as a disagreeable man from the minute she'd first pulled up in the car. Taking the money the Begums gave him to buy items for them was an example of bad character. However... If it was true that he'd spent the Begum's money on his son's skin cream, he had some kind of heart. Upstairs in the Malabar Hill station, Praveen approached the man she dubbed Sergeant Biscuit, who was now enjoying a cup of chai. Sergeant, I need to speak with an officer, she said. I have information regarding the prisoner I visited. 
He smiled as if she were a child asking to see a busy elder. It is not our investigation. That is the business of CID downtown. But the prisoner is being housed here. Which officer is responsible for him? Sergeant Biscuit looked at the closed door behind him. Chief Fisher is holding a meeting. I don't know how long it will take. She could hear a rumble of voices behind the door. I shall wait. Perveen seated herself on the edge of a wooden bench in the waiting area. She was among an assortment of depressed and anxious-looking people. She imagined many of them had relatives stuck in the cells below. The door opened, and two Englishmen came out. One was middle-aged and plump, wearing a tight white uniform with some swags of braid across the chest. She guessed he was Chief Fisher. The red-faced younger man was Inspector Vaughn from the day before. With them was Sub-Inspector Singh, who gaped at the sight of her. Good afternoon, she said, nodding at the group. Inspector Vaughn's face was blank, as if he didn't recognize her. Well, she'd been sweaty and bedraggled the day before. Now she felt fresh. In a starched green cotton sari, with delicate chicken curry stitching and a necklace, bangles, and earrings of Hyderabad pearls. Chief Fisher gave her a dismissive glance. If this is related to a family member, please speak with the public defender. No, thank you. I am a solicitor in private practice, she said crisply. I have some information relating to the death yesterday at 22 Seaview Road. At the word Seaview, both white men looked at her sharply. Madam, who did you say you are? Chief Fisher demanded. She is a lawyeress named Miss Paveen Mistry, Sub-Inspector Singh said quickly. Her father represents the late Mr. Farid. The two mysteries assisted us yesterday. Come into the office. The Malabar police chief's voice was curt. After the door closed the four of them in, Fisher settled into a large chair upholstered in leather behind a wide mahogany desk. There were just two other chairs in the room, slant-backed campaign-style chairs, Vaughn took the one closest to Fisher. That left one chair for either Perveen or Singh. The Sikh glanced at Perveen and gestured for her to take the chair. While Perveen hadn't liked him calling her a lawyeress, she felt guilty taking the chair. His mannerism made her think he was used to being the one left standing. May I explain? Perveen asked, giving her attention to Chief Fisher. After he nodded, she said, I've spoken with two people regarding the activities of Mohsen Dawai, the Farid's Durwan, who is in custody downstairs. What I've learned is important for you to know. We've reported the facts already, Vaughn said with a sneer. First, Mohsen said he was chatting with the boys down the street, and then he claimed he went shopping. What's the latest lie? Perveen would not respond to his slur. In a steady voice, she said, I spoke to Mrs. Sakina Farid, who'd asked Mohsen to buy a vial of Atta around 3.30 yesterday, which was the reason he was missing from his post. Just like you gentlemen, I had no reason to believe this was the truth. Therefore, I traveled to the shop in the Zaveri Bazaar, where Sakina Begum had sent him. Mr. Atawala confirmed Mohsen's arrival shortly after 4.30 and submitted an affidavit about the purchase and the time Mohsen was in the shop. A nice excuse for a trip to a perfume shop, Inspector Vaughn said with a laugh. Did you get something for yourself? He was dismissing her, just like the men had at the government law school. Perveen felt anger rising, but remembered how her father's smooth approach tended to serve him well. My point is, Atawala gave Mohsen the product he purchased, 
Mosen said that the police who checked him in at the station removed his possessions for safekeeping. Do you still have the atta he bought, or did it somehow disappear? Chief Fisher spoke up. I was the officer present when he was taken into custody. There was only the vial and bag containing his other purchase. Instead of saying what she really wanted to say, why didn't you let him go? She asked, what is it? The three men exchanged glances. Might it be a skin cream? Praveen asked. Yes, Inspector Vaughn said. A medical treatment for his son. Mohsen had to go to the apothecary, also in the bazaar, for it. I'm sure you could check up on that, if you think it's necessary. Inspector Vaughn cleared his throat. Roughly, he said, Is there a reason you wish the fellow downstairs to be freed? I met your father, and he didn't mention anyone was representing the Durwan. As the family's solicitors, we are invested in making sure that the household is protected by someone. My father and I left 22 Seaview Road yesterday with an assurance of round-the-clock police protection for the three secluded widows and their small children. But the police left the place before night fell and still haven't returned. They didn't stay because I didn't put in a request, Inspector Vaughn said icily. A suspect was taken into custody. There was no continuing threat. In any case, police are assigned duty at my discretion. The sub-inspector should never have told you there would be coverage without his superior's request to me. Chief Fisher glowered at Singh. The fact that they'd left the women unprotected with a murderer on the loose caused Praveen's temper to spark. Perhaps you think this is trivial because it wasn't a European household that was attacked, she said. The problem is, this is an Indian city. If you want law and order in the town, you need to protect all people. If only she could tell them that their negligence had caused a young girl from the household to vanish. Sub-Inspector Singh had such a look of tension on his face that Praveen almost wished she hadn't made the comment. She imagined he might agree with her, but in the hierarchy he was powerless. Why would you want that watchman back? He's not much of a watchman if he wandered off and allowed a murderer to enter, Inspector Vaughn said defensively. Just like your policeman, he had to respect a direct order. Praveen gathered up the receipt and affidavit she'd placed on the desk. Thank you for the chance to directly provide this information on the watchman's whereabouts. I shall not waste any more of my time. Chief Fisher coughed. Actually, before you go, let the sergeant make a copy of that affidavit. Perveen paused, keeping the paper in hand. I will certainly oblige, but in exchange... I was wondering if you might allow Mohsen Dawai to make a telephone call. He wishes to speak with Mrs. Sakina Farid. Sub-Inspector Singh looked at his superior. Sir, if the Begum is on the telephone, we can speak to her as well. Perhaps we'll learn more than we did yesterday. All right, then. Vaughn shot Praveen a poisonous look. She had embarrassed him in front of his colleague. I have the number, Praveen said, writing it down. She was careful to keep her face expressionless, though she hardly felt that way. She was outraged the police would have kept Mohsen Dawai locked up without real evidence. And for the first time, she'd realized what her power as a lawyer really meant. Chapter 26 a word in the right ear. Bombay, February 1921. The police were efficient. Within minutes, Sergeant Biscuit had typed two copies of the statement and stamped them with the official seal. 
Inspector Vaughn took one, and Chief Fisher the other, while Praveen slid the original into her legal briefcase. Her meeting had seemed like a success, but she didn't know whether they'd release Mosen. In the meantime, she needed to find a reliable temporary guard. Armand was leaning against the Daimler, which was parked in the shade of a jacaranda tree. The chauffeur looked bored, but brightened at the sight of her. To the office, please. Praveen sank into the back seat. You know everything about the city, Armand. Do you have an idea how to find a Durwan to guard a house for a short time? Everyone is wanting permanent work, Memsab, and Durwans cannot simply leave one house to work at another place for a few days. The owners would not like it. He paused. What about men with training as soldiers? The soldiers have come back from war, and not everyone has work. Perhaps. Hiring a veteran was a practical idea, and perhaps Razia would know of someone the Wakf had helped who was nearby. But that would take time. Then she had it. The docks! Jayanth knows many men there. I think Mosen was a stevedore. But they are mainly Hindus at the dock, Armand said. The Begums may not like that. Perhaps the women won't mind. It's not as if they have to live together, she said, feeling irritated. The boundaries communities drew around themselves seemed to narrow their lives, whether it was women and men, Hindus and Muslims, or Parsis and everyone else. Bavin Memsab, we are here. Armand had driven all the way to Mystery House. However, she wasn't ready to go inside. Her mind was too unsettled. I'm going to take a short walk. Will you please bring the document case inside to Mustafa and have him take it upstairs? Certainly. But where are you walking? I'll just stroll over to the pier and back. I have a headache. This will make me feel better. The wind buffeted Pervine as she walked toward Ballard Pier. After she was allowed through the gate, she gazed ahead at the sea filled with small cargo ships, the kind of vessels that Jayanth worked at loading or unloading every day. A tall cargo ship was slowly steaming out of the harbor. Pervine stared at it, imagining the heat and rough conditions on board— so very different from the first-class quarters she'd occupied as she headed toward the unknown in England. In 1917, she'd not spent long thinking about the great expense her family had gone to to send her, or their belief that a failed law student in Bombay could succeed abroad. Would that investment prove sound? As she walked along, she thought she recognized a small, wiry young man with a confident gait. She called out, and when he turned, she was pleased to see she'd been right. Jayanth ran up, his sandals flapping hard on the stones. Memsab, why have you come? I'm searching for someone who might like working as a household god. Do tell me, though, how are things at your job? I'm being careful, he said grimly. My boss, Ravi, is always watching me with an angry face. He did not like giving the back pay. I am hoping he isn't planning to get rid of me. Praveen tried to comfort him. He must know that if he sacks you again, you would come straight to us. I do not mean sacking. I mean killing me off. From the way he looks at me and from how I hear him swearing about your father by name... I am concerned for the firm as well. Praveen pondered his words and realized there might be some cases where the rule of law wasn't worth the consequences. People say all kinds of things when they're upset. As lawyers, we don't worry for ourselves, but I worry for you. Although you have the right to work at the loading company, if you truly feel endangered, you should leave. In fact... I may have something for you in town, working as a house guard. He looked dubious. 
This family would hire someone who hasn't done such work before? I would do the hiring. It could start. She broke off, seeing a heavy-set man approaching from the water. Jayanth, do you know the man who's coming our way? The stevedore turned his head quickly. It's Ravi. Please go. He may think I'm telling you tales. All right, I'm on my way, Praveen said hastily. Jayanth called after her. Walk back through Ballad Estate. It's Sifa. Jayanth was translating his own worry into over-concern for her. But as she walked through the elegant new office district, she recalled the Bengali stranger and the man who resembled Cyrus. So much had happened that she'd almost forgotten about them. She'd be glad if she never saw either man again. Finally, Praveen turned into Bruce Street. The Silver Ghost was parked in front of Mystery House. This was unexpected. Praveen nodded at Sergeet, the Hobson Jones's Sikh chauffeur who'd taken her home a few days ago. No passenger was in the car. Alice must have been admitted inside. Mustafa opened the door to her and spoke in an undertone. He's waiting for you in the parlor. Did Alice have any tea yet? Praveen said, glancing at herself in the mirror in the entryway as she smoothed her windblown hair. No, he refused. Mustafa's voice faded behind her as she stepped into the parlor and saw that her visitor wasn't Alice, but Sir David. Good afternoon, he said, standing and extending his hand. He wore a crisp gray worsted suit with lapels that made his shoulders seem even larger than they were. You had given me your card, so I decided to visit. What a pleasant base of operations. Perveen had given Alice her card, but she decided she'd better not correct him. She doubted this was an ordinary visit. Either Alice had inadvertently spilled something to him about Praveen's representing the Farids, or he'd heard from the police. Realizing he was looking expectantly at her, she belatedly put her hand in his. How lovely to see you, Sir David. I hope you weren't waiting long. I've just been here about ten minutes, he said. The manservant said your father is away, but you would be coming in some time. If you don't mind, I'll order tea for us, she said, raising her eyebrows at Mustafa, who was standing silently in the doorway. That will be fine, Sir David said. I hope I'm not keeping you from a client or another appointment. Not at all. Since you've come for a visit, I am happy to show you around. I don't need a tour. I came because your name was mentioned by the CID. I left the Malabar Hill police station only about an hour ago. News travels quickly. Apparently you represent a family who owns a house in my neighborhood. That's true, Perveen said, nodding. I shared with the police information that the freed widows wish to communicate to them. Secluded communities of women are a concern. Some unfair and possibly illegal things happen that the government never knows about because the women don't come out to tell what's going on. She agreed with him, but she sensed there was more to come. She needed to maintain her guard. Some traditions are slowly changing while others will hold. We cannot force the women to come out into the wider world until they're ready. How long have you worked with the Farid widows? Sir David asked as Mustafa returned with the sterling silver tea service and Minton cups. She hoped this question wasn't a trap. Just since yesterday, although the family has been my father's client for more than a decade, Praveen added, pouring Sir David the first cup. I went yesterday for an appointment to hear their wishes regarding the estate, some hours later, the death of their household agent occurred. He gave her a quizzical gaze. Their wishes? 
Surely the estate settlement is determined by the deceased husband's will. Praveen didn't think it wise to reveal that Mr. Farid had died without a will, nor did she wish to share that Mr. Mukri had demanded that the women abandon their assets. That could bring suspicion upon all three of them. You're correct about set amounts going to each family member. However, it was necessary for the widows to understand what their existing assets are and what choices they'd like to make for the future. Sir David eyed the tea but did not drink it. Either he didn't trust the water or he was waiting for it to strengthen. And their answer? Answers, Praveen said with a smile. They all have differences, and I'm afraid I cannot tell you what they said without violating attorney-client privilege. The counsellor smiled back just as pleasantly. Of course, as the only female lawyer in Bombay, you hold a power that nobody else has. I don't think so, she said with a dismissive sigh. After all, I cannot argue cases in court. I have to rely on my father for that side of the work. Sir David leaned slightly forward across the tiny tea table, almost eclipsing it. In light of your prior assistance to the widows, you seem ideally suited for a matter in which I could use some aid. Perveen had the feeling it would be something she didn't want to do. She was on the verge of refusing when a soft chanting began outside the windows. It was a familiar incantation that she knew was a muezzin's call to prayer. The call reminded her of the Farid widows, who were likely on their knees, praying that God would assist them through the disruption they'd never expected. Praveen used the reassuring cadence to steady herself, and then nodded at Sir David. Tell me, Commissioner Griffith would be most obliged if you would assist the CID by taking the lady's fingerprints. You see, it involves holding a person's hand, something that we both know goes against the traditional ways of Muslim women. Sub-Inspector Singh would be pleased to teach you. The idea might have seemed sensible to them, but if she did such a thing, she could very well lead one of the widows into prison— Mr. Farid would not have wished it. But how could a young Indian woman refuse the request of an important government official? Her whole future, and perhaps that of mystery law, rested on her answer. She reminded herself that Sir David Hobson Jones was intelligent enough to grasp the reason she couldn't comply. Biting her lip, Perveen said, Sir David, I wish I could as criminology and fingerprinting are things I'd like to learn more about. However, to fingerprint these women would create a significant conflict of interest. Should the police charge one of the family, I could be in the dreadful position of giving evidence against someone I was trying to defend. He gazed into his teacup, and having judged the tea was properly brown, finally picked it up and sipped. He smiled as if he'd gotten it just right. You are getting ahead of yourself. The prints are needed for the process of elimination. If we know the familiar family member prints, we're better able to recognize the hand of an alien. I very much understand the CID's wish to be able to collect women's fingerprints. The police commissioner must begin hiring female constables, not ask lawyers to do it. As she spoke, she felt her anxiety being replaced by the strength of knowing she had the law behind her. I wish the police all the best in this investigation, but for me to fingerprint the widows would be such a violation of lawyers' conduct that I could be disbarred. Disbarred? He paused significantly. You're not yet a member of the Bombay Bar. Realizing how neatly he'd used her own words against her, she struggled to keep her composure. Once the Bombay Bar admits women lawyers, I shall be vetted not only on my knowledge of the law, 
but also on my past behavior as a solicitor. The counselor took another sip of tea. Very likely he was coming up with another objection. She had to turn the tables quickly. May I suggest one thing, Sir David? If you'd like to prevent another crime from happening while the investigation continues, it would be wise for the police to guard the bungalow. Without Mosen, the widows and children are absolutely unprotected. What if the killer returns, or any other ruffian who hears about this unguarded house decides to try his luck? Sir David Hobson Jones carefully put down his half full teacup on the saucer. I'll see what I can do about stationing a police detail at the house. That would be very helpful, Praveen said, knowing that this conversation was probably worth more than her heartfelt arguments to the police in their quarters. I've another request. If you could serve as a go-between in conversation with the widows, that would be within a lawyer's purview, wouldn't it? Certainly, if each lady agrees to speak, Perveen added. Five minutes later, the governor's counselor was gone. Perveen stood at the parlor window, watching the silver ghost pull away. She wondered if Sir David might say anything about Perveen's representing the Fareeds to Alice. What a sticky wicket. Returning to the hall, she dialed the city operator and asked to be put through to the Hobson Jones's house. A manservant answered and told her to wait while he fetched the memsob. Two minutes of silence were finally broken by Alice's breathy, excited greeting. Hello, Perveen. I wish I could have warned you that my father was going to visit, but I rang and your butler said you weren't in. Perveen felt taken aback. Your father told you he was coming here? Yes, he asked about your schedule. And I said you'd be working today. Alice's voice had a nervous edge. Are you still speaking to me, or am I now persona non grata? Don't worry about your father. He asked me to do some things to help the police, which I sadly cannot, due to the conflict of interest. I doubt you're sad about it, Alice chuckled. By the way, are we still on for going to the pictures tonight? Perveen had forgotten about the invitation she'd made. Damnation! I wish I could go, but I've still got hours of work ahead. I don't see how I can go. That's a shame. Alice's voice sounded flat. Feeling guilty, Perveen said, I do want to spend time with you, Alice. I'm sure you'd like that if you had the time. You've got a career. You're always going to be busy. I've got to find something to do. Praveen sighed, unable to keep from feeling irritated that a woman who'd been in India less than three days thought its people should have immediately come forward with a job for her. Alice, I promise I'll help you find a teaching position, but I've got to keep going with my work tonight. And please know it will also take time for university administrators to respond. I see. Alice gave a dismissive laugh that was an echo of her mother's. By the time that happens, my parents will have my engagement announcement in the Times. Alice's comment was reminiscent of what Razia had said about Mr. Mukri's arranging a marriage for Amina. But the Farid women had faced a real threat while Alice was engaging in hyperbole. And that was just another irritant. Shut up, Alice. British common law protects you from that. Are you quite sure? Maybe I should retain your services, Alice said in a sneering tone. On the payment clock seems to be the only way people can spend time with Perveen Mystery Esquire. I'm not trying to avoid you, Perveen began, but there was a sharp click. She had offended Alice. Alice, who hadn't listened to a word of her excuses. It wasn't fair. 
Perveen felt the stern eyes of Grandfather Mystery upon her as she passed his portrait on her way upstairs. Did he disapprove of her attitude toward Alice? Or was he trying to remind her that she was distracting herself from the case? Pushing aside her superstitions, Perveen went to her desk, switching on the green-shaded lamp that was supposed to give the most concentrated form of light. A pool of yellow light bathed a small mound of letters— Two days' worth, since she'd been busy on Malabar Hill. On top was a letter from a client disputing the hours she'd billed and some documents that had been mailed from the high court in regard of other cases. All of it seemed so petty and distracting with all she had going on. There was even a letter from the Petit Parsi General Hospital. Thankfully, it was not from the administration with some complaint but was signed by a prospective new client. The name was Parsi. Siamak Azman Patel. The man, who gave no particulars of his background, wished her to call on him in the hospital to assist in writing his will. Praveen could only hope she'd have sorted the Farid case before the poor fellow died, but nothing was certain any more. She resolved to pass the request to another law firm that could handle it immediately. Once she dealt with the rest of the post, Perveen opened her briefcase and put all the Farid papers on the center of her blotter. Slowly, she leafed through them, looking for something that would show a familial relationship between Omar Farid and Faisal Mukri. She had not dismissed her thought that someone within the family might have wished him dead for reasons of personal or professional gain. But there was nothing. Annoyed, she continued leafing through the papers, seeing that they were out of order. Somehow, the first pages of the widow's marriage contracts were all missing. This was unfortunate, as she knew those pages contained their father's names and home addresses— this would make it all the harder for her to follow up on finding relatives to help them. Perveen gnawed on a fingernail, trying to remember the last time she'd looked at all these pages. It had been when she'd had the conferences with the women, before Mr. Mukri's death. And then her briefcase had gone missing for a while. Had these first pages been removed? What was within them that could be damaging— the situation was not irreparable. Copies of the marriage contracts probably were with their families, as well as the Bombay High Court. But she wanted those papers now. The sharp ring of the telephone interrupted her thoughts. Was Alice calling back to finish giving Perveen a piece of her mind? Perveen sat, letting it ring till it stopped. In the silence... She turned back to the now dog-eared stack of Farid papers. Was there something there that might be a clue about Faisal Mukri's death? The phone rang again, and this time Praveen strode down the hall to pick it up. Hello, she said. There was a crackling pause, and then she heard three words spoken in a low, soft voice. Meri madad karo. The caller had said, Please help me. Who is calling? Perveen asked sharply in Hindi. Help! The woman's voice repeated in accented English. Are you calling Mystery Law? Who is on the line? What has happened? Perveen implored the caller, but within a moment she heard the dull tone that meant the call was finished. Praveen had no question about what to do next. She dialed the operator and asked to be put through to 22 Seaview Road. But the line was engaged. Either one of the widows was having a chat with someone, or the phone had been taken off the hook. Can't you interrupt the call? Praveen asked. This kind of thing was common, given the impatience of the population. At this hour, it's not polite, the operator said. You must do it. This is urgent. There were some clicks, and then the operator said in her ear, Nobody is there, madam. Then give me the Malabar Hill police station. 
The phone was picked up by someone who sounded a lot like Sergeant Biscuit. Perveen identified herself and described the call she suspected had come from 22 Seaview Road. But that is impossible. The house is secured, the sergeant told her. I have heard that time and time again, but this is an emergency. I tell you, two of our men are on the gates, and there are two more inside. I am certain because three of us are taking extra shifts to make up for it. She should have been reassured, but she could not forget the sound of the woman's voice. I'm glad that your men are there, but there might still be trouble within the house. Could someone please request that the nursemaid check on the family members? If anyone is calling out, the constables are surely hearing it, he said patronizingly. Maybe not, if they've called me. Praveen banged down the phone. It was a waste of time to continue. She'd have to go there herself. Praveen hurried downstairs, calling for Mustafa, but he was out. Looking at her watch, she realized it was eight o'clock. He was off duty. Perhaps he had gone to see one of his many friends. Praveen gathered up the small purse she'd carried earlier in the day and stepped outside, looking for the Daimler. But the space where Armand always parked was filled with a slumbering brown buffalo. Armand? She called out loudly as she scanned all of Bruce Street. Perhaps he hadn't been able to wake the animal and had stopped the car elsewhere. But she could not see him anywhere. Remembering her father's trip to Puna, she knew there was a possibility Armand had gone to fetch him at Victoria Terminus. This would mean he'd be dropped home before Armand came back for her. She had to find another way. Ram Chandra, the rickshawwala, was chatting with a few men at the only tea stall still open. As she approached him, he broke away and came forward. Praveen spoke hesitantly because she anticipated a refusal. It's a bit far, but could you bring me to Malabar Hill? Malabar Hill? he repeated incredulously. I'm not often taking my rickshaw outside fort. That is far and steep. The Farids did live very high up. Praveen understood the impossibility of the mission. She could go to a busier street and find a horse-drawn tonga, but it was dark, and traveling with an unknown driver was a huge risk. The Malabar Hill Police Station near the Jain Temple. From there, I can insist the police bring me to the destination. She reached into her purse, looking at what money she had left. Recklessly, she said, I'll pay a rupee if you can make it in forty minutes, and another rupee to cover your travel back. I'm sorry to ask you to pedal so far. Don't worry, madam, he said, turning toward the rickshaw stand. It's been a slow day. I have spent more time talking than cycling, and that sum is almost a week's stake. Truly? Perveen asked as she walked along, feeling bad that Ramchandra lived on so little. Yes, my friends will be envious when they hear. As she climbed up into the familiar seat, Ramchandra poured oil into the small covered lanterns that hung on the rear of the carriage and the largest lantern, which was on his handlebars. After all the lanterns were lit, the street seemed brighter, and Ramchandra set off cycling. Praveen leaned forward, wishing she could make the weight of the carriage and her own body disappear. The journey felt slow, and they'd barely started. Turning off Bruce Street into a small lane, the rickshaw dragged even harder and then ground to a halt. Ramchandra's voice floated back to her. Sorry, Memsab, I must check the rickshaw. Something may be caught in a wheel. What bad luck! How could there be a breakdown of his prized rickshaw on a night like this one? Ramchandra had taken one of his lanterns to use while looking at the tires. She saw him bathed in the pool of yellow light, looking up at her with a grim expression. What is it? she asked. Both my tires have punctures. Praveen stepped down from the rickshaw and walked over to the tire he was studying. 
two flat tires? But how? Ramchandra's voice was mournful. As I was just coming along Bruce Street, I felt something rough catch underneath. It's hard to see in the darkness, but I think something was there. I'm very sorry, Mem Saab. It will not be possible to fix these tires tonight. Please help me. The urgency in the unknown woman's voice rang in her head. But I've got to reach Malabar Hill. There is the Tonga stand, but a lady should not ride alone. I agree. Praveen had another idea. She would call the Hobson Jones house and ask for Sir David. She hated to ask him for a favor so soon after refusing to do something he wanted, but she couldn't think of another option, and she knew he wouldn't want the widows to come to harm. I'll go back to the office and make a call to see if someone else can go to the police, she said. Surely in the next half hour or so, Arman will return with the car. I'm so sorry about your tires. Take this rupee from me. No, you must accept it. You wouldn't have ruined your tires if I hadn't called you into service. Perveen ran off around the corner, realizing that she hadn't moved this fast since her days on the tennis court at Oxford. But this was no game. Someone could be dying just a few miles away. It was dark, so she could not run at top speed. She also didn't want to stumble over whatever had damaged Ramchandra's tires. Slowing slightly gave her a chance to hear more than the pounding of blood in her ears. She heard footsteps, fast ones, coming from behind her. Instinctively, she moved to the side, but the fact that she stopped became her undoing. A rough cloth bag whisked over her head, and a thick, strong arm pushed her backward and hauled her upward. Perveen screamed, but her voice was lost in cloth, as she felt herself lifted up as casually as a stevedore might carry a ten-pound box. She heard a male grunt as she kicked backward, trying to cause him to drop her. Suddenly, the telephone call for help and Ramchandra's ruined rickshaw came together. The call had been a ploy to get her outside so she'd be vulnerable. All of it was planned. Someone didn't like her meddling. She kicked again and again, hoping to put the man off balance. But all that happened was he paused, shifting the bag with her body in it up against a wall and punching her in the back. Then all she knew was a slow, dripping sound. Nineteen seventeen. Chapter twenty seven. The jury decides. Calcutta, August nineteen seventeen. Water beat Calcutta, turning the city into a lake. As Praveen stood in the portico of the Grand Hotel, she could hardly see across the drive. She'd already heard Chowring Gi was three feet deep and rising. The summer monsoon rains fell loud and hard, refusing to break for anyone. Could the court close because of the rains? She worried aloud to Jamshed Ji, who had been arguing with the doorman about why he couldn't get them a tonga. The weather is awful, her father agreed. But since Parsi Matrimonial Court has a very limited number of hearings, the pressure is for the jury to decide. Human-pulled rickshaws were the only vehicles capable of negotiating the flooded roads. Jamshedji spotted one making a passenger drop-off and agreed without question to the driver's fare. After a five-month wait, the mysteries could not risk missing the scheduled trial. Perveen's freedom was dependent on it. It was a bumpy, sloshy, and slow ride to the courthouse in Dalhousie Square. Perveen felt as if she couldn't wait for the journey to end, and then she was hit by the realization that what could happen in court might make her want to drown herself. The court could rule for her to return to the Sodawalla house, and if she stood in contempt of that, she might be thrown in prison. 
Praveen, Camellia, and Jamshedji left their sodden umbrellas in an overfilled stand and walked through the slippery marble halls to the designated court chamber. Praveen ignored the portraits of sober English gentlemen and scanned the benches packed with people. Did all of them have cases waiting? Praveen thought she recognized Mrs. Banaji and her daughter, who were friends of the Sotawala family. She'd probably come to collect a story for gossip. Still, the sight of those two wasn't as bad as the news Jamshedji brought when he came back from the bench. Our barrister, Mr. Bestonji, isn't here, he said, looking soberly at Camellia. Maybe he's caught in the rain, Praveen said. He could arrive any moment. Jamshedji shook his head. His junior associate managed to get through the roads to tell me that Pestenji was double-booked for today and has given priority to another case. Oh, dear. Does that mean we go with the junior? Or that we must postpone? Camellia asked in a low voice. Praveen was too stunned to say anything. It was as if their lawyer had conspired with Cyrus's family to give her the worst possible outcome. Logically, she knew this couldn't be true, but it was a rotten hand to be dealt at the last minute. Jamshedji grimaced. I spent some time talking with the junior barrister and was not impressed. He isn't even a Parsi, so he won't be especially convincing to the Parsi delegates serving as the jury. I told him I'd rather represent you myself. Has your brain snapped? Praveen asked, too shocked to be diplomatic. No, Jamshedji said flatly. We will not delay. I was the one who prepared every detail of the case. The junior brought the file with all the necessary papers. It's a bit damp, but I have what I need. It's good of you to offer, but how can you do that? when you're not recognized by the Calcutta Bar, Camellia objected. Her voice was as soft as usual, but she had a tense expression Perveen wasn't accustomed to seeing. As you both know, I was called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn. Having an English law credential gives me entry to any court in India. The largest challenge would be convincing one of the other lawyers to lend me a wig and gown. Oh, my God! My father representing me in borrowed clothes, Praveen moaned. You will not only humiliate me, but we're bound to lose. Hush, Praveen. Are you sure they'll let you, Jamshedji? Camellia now had a sparkle in her eyes. I'll have to ask. Papa, no! Praveen's voice came out in a screech. Postponement is what I want. And I'm the client. How can you speak to your father like that? He's your hero, Camellia said, favoring her husband with a final smile as he departed to register himself as Praveen's advocate. How many fathers can stand up for their daughters in such a manner? Camellia and Praveen settled together on a bench close to the front. She wanted to see the jury who were filing in to their special section that faced the judicial bench. I recognize a juror, she whispered to Camellia. Mr. Sodawala's friend who works at a bank. How can he possibly sit on a jury and be fair to me? The delegates on any Parsi matrimonial court are pillars of the community, Camellia whispered back. Very likely every plaintiff in this room is connected somehow to at least one juror. The whole body listens to everyone's cases. What if the rain keeps the soda wallas from coming? Perrine asked. She'd kept careful watch on the courtroom and was convinced they hadn't arrived. I don't know, Camellia said, putting an arm around her. Perhaps the jury would rule in your favor, but the judge might just wish to postpone. 
the Sodawalas had not arrived by the time an English magistrate named Moody called the session to order with a bang of his gavel. Sad-looking plaintiffs hung their heads while their advocates detailed their grievances. As Praveen listened from her position between her parents, she realized all the other plaintiffs had filed for divorce after decades of misery, not six months. The only other plaintiff who looked close to Praveen's age was a recent bridegroom, whom she learned during the testimony was seeking a divorce due to his wife's inability to consummate the marriage. Everyone's story was miserable. She listened to a tale about a businessman who'd moved a prostitute into his marital bedroom, forcing the wife to stay in the room's corner. Another woman complained that her husband of twenty years was having an affair with his cousin. The judge asked some questions, and the eleven-man jury sat stone-faced, listening to the responses. In the middle of the third case, the Sodawalas arrived, thoroughly soaked from head to toe. The three of them walked up the aisle past Praveen and seated themselves. A man bustled over to sit down with them. He had to be their barrister, N.J. Wadia. Her father had found out that Mr. Wadia was a vakil, a lawyer with traditional Indian law training rather than a modern law school degree. N.J. Wadia was, in fact, representing clients in two other cases that day. When he left the Sotawalas to step forward and present the case of a woman trying to prove her husband had committed adultery with a neighbor lady, his accusations were pointed and powerful. Wadia knows this court, Jamshedji muttered to Camellia and Praveen. But nobody will be as motivated to present a strong case as a father representing a daughter. Praveen wished her father had been able to secure a Calcutta vakil for her. Surely that would make a better impression on the local jury. But nobody Jamshedji had spoken with would take the case. Sodawala v. Sodawala was on the docket just after two o'clock. Praveen hadn't been able to eat during the lunch recess. Now she realized that her empty stomach and dry throat were causing dizziness. She followed her father to the plaintiff's bench. He appeared eccentric in the black coat that was a bit too short and a wig that looked puffier than his own finely made one that sat on a wig stand in the Bombay office. A few people even snickered. Perveen sat down, feeling the gaze of hundreds of eyes on the back of her head. Was it her imagination, or was Judge Moody looking contemptuously at her? Her father had already warned her not to look into the faces of the jury. Doing so would make her seem overly confident of success. Using his best Oxbridge accent, Jamshedji Mystery introduced himself to the jury as a barrister solicitor with 25 years' experience in Bombay, now serving in place of Mr. Pestenji, who'd been unable to attend. Mr. Wadia promptly pointed out that Jamshedji was father of the plaintiff, a revelation that resulted in a chorus of laughter and whispers. It is true that I bring the vantage point of lifelong knowledge of the plaintiff, of both her honesty and her tendencies to do what she believes is right, no matter the consequences. Jamshedji went on to present a picture of Praveen being tricked into marriage by a stranger. He spoke of his opposition to the marriage, but acquiescence due to his belief in the Sotawala's enthusiasm for the two to unite. He'd trusted them and paid for the children's wedding in Calcutta. The trust was broken, he said, when the parents turned a blind eye as Cyrus indulged in prostitution. It was an unusual strategy to bring the parents into the case. Praveen heard some disapproving mutters come from the gallery. Mr. Wadia called out, Objection! Counselor Mystery is new to Calcutta. Is he also new to the fact that Parsi marital law does not consider a husband's recreational behavior as justifiable cause for the dissolution of a marriage? Your Honor, my point is to lead to Section 31. 
The sad fact is, the defendant's behavior resulted in the transmission of a serious disease to his wife. I should not like to offend any sensitive ears with the name of this illness, but everything is here on paper. Perveen longed for the rain to break through the ceiling and wash her away. She was aghast at what her father had introduced to hundreds of strangers. If it's true, why not speak it aloud? Challenged Mr. Wadia. There is no fit reason to libel my client. This was a clever action. If the disease was stated, it would label Perveen as damaged and unclean for the rest of her life. Perveen could barely watch as her father laid two papers in front of the judge, the medical diagnosis she'd received in Calcutta, and the results of a follow-up with the physician who'd treated her in Bombay. Mr. Wadia leaned in to look as well. Then the papers were shown to the jury, whose expressions grew dour. To add insult to injury, the defendant, Mr. Sodawala, continued his immoral activities. Jamshedji said after the rustling subsided. He closed his argument with a dramatic description of Praveen's visit to the Sodawala's factory, her discovery of the prostitute in Cyrus's office, and Cyrus's ruthless physical attack, something that he called attempted murder. My daughter Praveen fled Calcutta in order to save her own life. Jamshedji declared in his infamous rising tone. Under Section 31, there are multiple reasons for this couple to be given a separation. Praveen watched uneasily as Mr. Wadia asked the magistrate's permission to approach the bench. Immediately, Mr. Wadia began peppering Jamshedji with questions. Where was his evidence of continued visits to prostitutes? Where was the prostitute he'd accused Cyrus of bringing into the factory? Who were the young men Praveen had said were witnesses to the prostitute's presence? What had become of the Tonga driver who'd seen Praveen bleeding and taken her to Howrah Station? The questions were difficult. Mr. Pestenji hadn't been able to find the Tonga driver who'd helped Praveen. Cyrus's friends had refused to make any statements against him— just as no prostitutes in the Chal would say Cyrus Sodawala had ever requested services. The only evidence exhibits were three photographs a detective had snapped of Cyrus in the Sonagachi Red Light District. And that was hardly useful, since prostitution wasn't considered cause for divorce. Mr. Wadia announced he would not cause the young wife embarrassment by bringing her to the stand— but asked for his client, Mr. Cyrus Sodawala, to answer a few questions about her. Praveen stared at the tall, well-built man in a fine gray suit for whom she had left Bombay. How had they come to this? He had loved her, and she him. Cyrus answered a number of prompts that suggested Praveen's lack of interest in marital union— as well as her dislike of cooking and cleaning and typical wifely work. Praveen had constantly left their house without family permission. She'd come to his office and interrupted an important business meeting. He said the accused woman in his office had been only a poor maid who'd brought tea. His health was perfect. He had a letter from his own doctor that showed no evidence of any disease. As his testimony rolled out, she could imagine what the delegates thought. Perveen was a spoiled young bride who had shunned her husband and then been upset when he turned to others for his marital entitlement. She shot a look at her father, silently begging him for the chance to speak for herself, but he shook his head. He had warned her about this ahead of time. A woman who chose to argue back against her husband would appear arrogant and lose the pity she needed. She was angry, embarrassed, humiliated, but she turned her eyes back toward her lap. It seemed like forever until Jamshedji was offered the chance to question Cyrus. The vakil tried to dissuade Cyrus from allowing himself to be questioned by the opposing lawyer, but Cyrus shook his attorney's advice off and smiled benignly at Jamshedji. 
It was as if Cyrus thought Jamshedji was bound to fail. Jamshedji began in a surprisingly casual fashion. What do you think about all of this, my boy? I don't know. Cyrus looked taken aback. Objection, Mr. Wadia called. Objection rejected, said the judge. If you were asked to describe your marriage, what would you say? Jamshedji asked in a friendly manner. Looking startled, Cyrus said, It's been unhappy. Perveen has been nothing but trouble to me and my parents. Perveen should have been happy to hear these words of release, but instead she felt a great sorrow that the one she'd believed was her kindred spirit had turned out to be such an ordinary, closed-minded man. She is the one who is trouble, yes. As Cyrus nodded, Jamshedji gave him a mirthless smile. You were almost twenty-eight when you approached Perveen. Two broken engagements before you came to her. No family in Calcutta would accept you due to your reputation. Isn't that the reason you went fishing for a wife in Bombay? Objection! shrieked Waria. Irrelevant to any case for separation. Objection sustained, Moody said. Strike from the record. So you got the girl you set your cap for. Someone you thought was rich and glad-hearted and not terribly intelligent. That was what you wished for, but you accidentally got someone with a good head on her shoulders. Paveen demanded you account for your behavior. As Parsis know, our marital law doesn't permit every couple that doesn't get along to have a legal separation. Therefore, I'm curious to hear how you will manage your life if Paveen stays with you again. Cyrus said nothing, and Praveen's heart ached. She was remembering the first night in their room together, the joy of a fulfilled dream and the certainty of an enchanted life ahead. Will you face her at breakfast and supper? Share the same bedroom suite and bath? Or will you ask your parents to make sure she's kept in a small prison away from your sight? The audience rustled, and Praveen wondered if their own households observed the custom of menstrual seclusion. Perhaps they'd have no sympathy. Many of you know about these rooms, Jamshedji said, turning to address the room. Binamazi. The Zoroastrian tradition of seclusion for women during menses, likely originated during the Yazdani era, 1,200 years ago. Orthodox Parsis still practice this archaic custom to an extreme, forcing women to avoid cleansing themselves properly for the entire menstrual period, plus two more days. Objection! Vulgarity not suited to the jury's ears! Mr. Wadia called out. Perveen's face was hot with the embarrassment of the unmentionable being mentioned. Go on, Mr. Mystery, said Judge Moody, who was looking intrigued. Some people deny facts of modern medical knowledge and think that confining a bleeding woman prevents her from spreading fatal germs to the rest of the household. Jamshedji continued, but not allowing a woman contact with others can lead to her own death. One female already has died during menstrual confinement at the Sodawala home. Yes, Mr. Sodawala, I can see from your expression you already know who she is. Will you tell us her full name? Praveen felt an odd ringing in her ears. Azara, Cyrus croaked his face white. Perveen had never seen him look so shocked. And were you living in the home at the time of Azara's death? Jamshedji asked. Cyrus nodded. And your age at the time of her death? Cyrus looked confused for a moment, then mumbled, Twenty-five. Thank you. 
Jamshedji gave him a faint smile and turned to address the audience again. We are speaking of Cyrus's younger sister, Azara Bahramji Sodawala, born 1900 and deceased in 1914. The coroner's report lists the cause of death as natural causes. Azara had a fever before her menses began, yet instead of the family seeking medical help as the fever rose, the child was left on a metal cot in an 8 by 12 foot room in a remote area of the house. Praveen had always known Azara had struggled in that room. She thought back to the odd, melancholy presence that had accompanied her throughout her time in the little room, the faded marks of days. That must have been a calendar that Azara made. Objection! called out Mr. Wadia. Opposing counsel is telling stories without any evidence. The Calcutta coroner's report is a public record, Jamshedji said, holding a paper aloft. I have it here. As well as a letter of sworn testimony as to the nature of Azara's illness from Gita, former housemaid to the Sodawalas. If Gita was being described as a former housemaid, it must have meant she'd been fired. Where was she now, and how had her testimony been obtained? Praveen glanced toward the bench where the Sotawala parents sat. Maynouche was slumped and had covered her face with a handkerchief. Despite Praveen's desire to hear the truth about Azara, the Sotawala's naked pain was hard to witness. The maid has testified that water and food were provided at the door of the young girl's cell, Jamshedji said in a somber voice. However, no family member went inside to make sure she took it. After several days, the maid went inside and reported the girl could not respond to her voice. Azara Sodawala was in a state of coma when the ambulance arrived. She died one week later in hospital, an utterly needless death, due to the family's lack of care. Objection! screamed Mr. Wadia. Another family member's death is unrelated to the marriage situation in question. Irrelevant! Your Lordship, I plan to use this example to show that in addition to the physical harm Perveen has already undergone, there are reasonable grounds for anticipating continuing danger to both her life and liberty, chiefly the death of another woman in the household. Bavin's husband, Cyrus Sodawala, was in residence at the time, and despite the fact he was an adult, did nothing to help his sister, nor did his parents. Objection! A female's health is not a concern for a brother, Mr. Waria shouted. It is ladies' business only. What her father had said was exactly what Praveen had been trying to say to the Sodawalas all along. She had gone stiff with anger, hearing her own argument used in reverse. Overruled, said Judge Moody, leaning forward slightly. Please continue, Mr. Mystery. I seek to prove that Cyrus Sodawala was negligent in caring for his sister. As Section 31 states, such conduct that affords reasonable grounds for apprehending danger to life or of serious personal injury is entitlement for judicial separation. Judge Moody frowned. This is an interpretation of the Act I've not heard before. Will you elaborate on your rationale? Your Honor, it is entirely straightforward, Jamshedji said. Already, Bavin's life has been ruined by her rash agreement to Mr. Sodawala's proposal. She can never marry another, nor have children. Is that not enough punishment? Should she be forced back into this household, where she will be made again to lie on another woman's deathbed? Jamshedji turned from the judge to look directly at Cyrus. What do you think, Cyrus? Do you really long for your unhappy wife to return? He did not answer. 
The silence was filled with the rustling sounds of people in the benches, and she imagined they were craning their necks to look at him, to see the young man whose reputation had been ground into the gutter by his father-in-law. No. Cyrus's voice was barely audible. Jamshedji nodded. On behalf of the plaintiff, I rest my case. The magistrate called a one-hour recess after the case. He gave the jurors this time to return verdicts on the nine cases that they had heard. This brief recess caused a flurry of movement in the courtroom. Those whose cases hadn't yet been heard streamed out, complaining about having to come back. The jury has fewer than seven minutes to discuss each case. How can justice be done? Camellia fretted. They will take longer if needed. Nothing to do now but relax. Jamshedji was flushed from the exertion of speaking, and Praveen saw rivulets of sweat running down from the edges of the wig. He'd presented a thoroughly ingenious argument while relatively unprepared in a courtroom he didn't know. And he'd even gathered testimony from Gita. One woman stopped by Praveen, and put a hand on her arm. I know what it is to be kept secluded. I hope you don't have to go back. Perveen felt gratitude for this kindness. Thank you, I... The shamelessness of young women. Perveen recognized the scolding man who'd interrupted as an unpleasant member of the Sotawala's Aguirre. Before she could respond, though... Another woman had patted her arm. Very good to see a lawyer speak up for women's rights. All the better when he's her father. The friendly woman beamed at Jamshedji. Give me your card. I've got plenty of business for you. Jamshedji gave her a gracious half-bow. You are most kind, madam, but my firm is based in Bombay. This will, I hope, be my sole court appearance in Calcutta. When they had a bit of space, Perveen whispered, You made a magnificent argument, but I didn't know what lengths you'd go to. I feel mortified. Jamshedji looked soberly at her. I'm sorry that I made you embarrassed, but I decided to follow my instinct. I needed to prove an existing danger to you in the marriage. How did you learn about Azara's cause of death? I hired someone here to request the medical files for you and Cyrus. The hospital worker accidentally also brought the file for Cyrus's sister, as she was a family member at the same address. When I saw the doctor's report, I knew it would be vital to your defense. But there was the problem that the information was not obtained through proper channels. And that would make it inadmissible in court. Perveen paused, thinking. But you spoke of a coroner's report. Yes. The coroner is a government official, and the Bengal presidency has just as detailed records as the Bombay presidency, he said with a satisfied smile. I recalled you saying that your IR was working in the household when Azara died. Our detective learned from Geeta's mother, Pushpa, that the Sotawalas fired her for not stopping you from leaving. Since Geeta had returned to her home village, she felt safe enough to provide the sworn testimony. Praveen would never be able to thank Geeta for what she'd done. How was it that she could speak the truth, and Cyrus had not? When I first met him, Cyrus lied to me about Azara's death being from cholera. I wonder why he thought he couldn't tell me the truth. Perhaps it was the family's agreed-upon story, Jamshedji said. It was a risk to bring up Azara's death, but I believe it's now impossible for the delegates not to consider the possibility of continuing danger. Only when there is an actual death do people think twice. 
when you spoke so bluntly about it. That hurt the soda wallas. They were in pain, Praveen said, remembering how she'd pitied the weeping Benoush. They hadn't faced up to their role in Azara's death, and now their community knows all about it. Maybe some of the Orthodox will change their traditions, Camellia said, looking serious. Some families will tell women to seclude themselves for one or two days, not eight. Papa described a tragedy to everyone, but knowing about it might make a difference. Do you truly? Praveen's sentence died as she saw Cyrus walking through the crowds toward them. She had no time to warn her parents before he was upon them. How could you do that? Shame my family. Accuse us of killing my sister. Cyrus shouted down into the face of Jamshedji, who was a few inches shorter than his six feet. You are the only one using those words, Jamshedji said tightly. They were becoming entertainment for anyone passing through the corridor. A knot of excited onlookers formed around the men, and Camellia put a protective arm around Praveen, who wished they were invisible. You bastard! You have brought up the sorrow my family has tried so hard to put behind us! Cyrus shouted angrily, ignoring the constables hastening toward him. He didn't mean to insult you, Praveen said, her heart beating fast. It's just an argument. What lawyers must do... Paveen, her father snapped. Don't say anything more. Lawyers are the vilest creatures on earth. Less than human, Cyrus said with a sneer. Of course you wanted to be one, Paveen. Jamshedji tilted his head back to look fully at Cyrus as he spoke. You testified on the stand that you were willing to have a separation, but all your vakil did was present a picture of a wife with bad housekeeping skills. No jury would permit the two of you to separate for such a small reason. You needed a stronger example, and I gave you just that. You called my parents murderers! Cyrus was breathing hard, as if struggling to stay above water. You said I was diseased, and you said I didn't care that Azara died. If you don't care to be accountable for the past, think about your future, Jamshedji said between gritted teeth. How delighted would you be to have my daughter living with you for the next forty or fifty years? Do you think you'll have one happy day within those decades? Cyrus answered him, but kept his eyes on Praveen. If the jury sends her back to stay with us, she will pay for every bit of filth you said in court today. And if she's granted a separation, it won't be a happy one. I'll make your lives hell. A bell rang, signaling that the magistrate was ready to reconvene. The chief juror delivered a series of papers to Judge Moody, who read the decisions aloud and without expression. The wife whose husband had brought a prostitute into their bedroom was granted a separation with alimony. Divorce was granted to the woman whose husband had slept with his cousin. On the other hand, the jury granted an annulment to the man whose wife hadn't yet consummated. And then it was their turn. Sodawalla versus Sodawalla. Judge Moody squinted as if it was difficult to read the paper in his hand. Praveen felt an iciness flow through her, certain that the outcome was bad. In this matter, the jury would like to state for the record its disapproval of the wife's intrusion into the husband's place of business. However, the Sodawala's abuse of female seclusion, a respectable tradition if done with everyone's agreement, raised a reasonable doubt for the wife's safety. Six votes for the granting of judicial separation, no alimony. The judge droned on, but Praveen did not hear the words. She heard, granting of judicial separation. She had won. 
Although still married to Cyrus, she'd never have to see him again. Every day of the month would belong to her. Her life was her own again. Shaking and sobbing, Praveen hugged her mother. She realized Camellia's face was also wet with tears. Yes, Jamshedji said, his own arms strong as tree branches going around the two women. We have not lost her. Thank God. Perveen could not let the delirium of joy overtake her. She remembered Cyrus's words during the break. Papa, can the separation be challenged? It could, but they're not likely to do that, he said reassuringly. Too much money and distress. But Cyrus threatened us. He had looked straight at her and the hatred in his gaze had been clear. Jamshedji took out his handkerchief to wipe Camellia's tears. He can threaten all he wishes, but I suspect his energy for mischief will run dry during the three years you're studying in England. If I can get a place. You earned it long ago, he reassured her, and you've already got the necessary papers. Her father had filed for her right to enter England right after she'd passed the Oxford examinations two years earlier. In fact, the document granting her that right was issued in the name Perveen Jamshedji Mystery, which was the name he told her to use for her university application. Nobody had ever heard of a married female studying at Oxford. To see if she'd be admitted as such was too great a risk— and using her maiden name wasn't quite a lie, given her legal separation. Still, the challenge of presenting herself as a single woman dogged Perveen during the month that she and Camellia spent organizing her trunks. All the while, her father hunted for a booking for her on one of the few passenger steamships still operating between India and Europe. The seats were few, and he wound up having to pay for first class rather than second. Praveen felt guilty, knowing that most Indian students traveling to England had won full scholarships with travel and living stipends and were not imposing financial burdens on their families. She'd sold the jewelry her parents had given her for her wedding, but that would only cover one year's tuition. I can always raise my hourly billing rate. Jamshedji had joked when she'd expressed worry about all her expenses. In any case, I expect to bring in a solicitor to raise the firm's revenue within the next few years. Just four weeks after the separation was granted, Perveen stood on the first-class deck of the ferry that would take her to the Dutch Emerald. The sun was high, and she had to squint to see her parents and Rustam standing on Ballard Pier below. She could not see their expressions, and could only hope they were smiling. Do you want to last look at someone? a female voice said. Perveen turned to see a very tall, blonde English girl proffering a pair of opera glasses. Oh, that's kind of you, but not necessary. It was embarrassing to have been caught on the verge of tears, and by a posh English person at that. Come on. They're really meant for performances, but they're still all right to use outdoors. Don't you want a parting glimpse? The girl seemed so sincere. Praveen didn't want to make her feel bad. All right. Thank you. She took the glasses and adjusted the focus. Did you find your family? Yes, my parents are crying. I can't stand to look any more. She handed the glasses back to the stranger. Why was she leaving Bombay when she'd fought so hard to be with her own family again? Three years apart would feel endless. The girl smiled wryly. That's rather different from my own departure. I boarded in Salon where my father's been working, and he, my mother, and I were arguing all the way up the gangplank. We argue, too. 
They say arguing is in Parsi blood, Praveen said. I hope to hone my arguments to a professional level while in England. The girl hooted. Are you bound for Oxford? I saw a trunk labelled for St. Hilda's College. Was it yours? Probably, she admitted, surprised her luggage had caught this stranger's eye. Well, it's your lucky day, because I'm a second year at St. Hilda's, the girl said, tilting her chin so she looked even taller. In a mock confidential tone, she added, I'll tell you everything you need to know. I'd like that, Praveen said, feeling a surge of relief that she wouldn't walk into the college like a complete know-nothing. I'm Alice Hobson-Jones, the young woman said, holding out her hand. Born in Tamil Nadu, shipped back to London and Oxford, briefly moored in Ceylon, and who knows what's next. Praveen shook the girl's hand. I'm delighted to meet you, Miss Hobson-Jones. I'm Praveen Mystery, Bombay born and bred. Do call me Alice, her companion said with a grin. Fourteen days at sea is an overly long time to be formal, isn't it? The horn blew, signaling the fairy's departure. Praveen kept her eyes on her family until they blurred with the mass of other people around them. The lump in her throat was being replaced by something entirely different. Anticipation. Nineteen twenty one. Chapter twenty eight. Cat out of the bag. Bombay, February nineteen twenty one. When Praveen awoke, her throat felt dry, although her body was soaked. She had sweated, maybe for hours. It was all because she was wrapped up in a thick, rough blanket. Reaching out a few inches, she tried to tug the cloth down, but it just pulled tighter around her curled-up form. And then she remembered. Brew Street and the shock of a cloth sack coming down over her head— she had a memory of fighting against it and then being hit. She recalled a bumpy ride and being hauled out and hearing the sound of lapping water. She'd braced for the feeling of sinking like a stone into cold water. She would end her life in the Arabian Sea, the body of water her ancestors had crossed to build their new lives in India. At the Calcutta High Court, Cyrus had sworn vengeance— the years between had been filled with the excitement of Oxford returning to Bombay and working as a full-fledged solicitor in her father's practice. Until the last few days, she had relinquished her fears. The attack had caught her off guard, despite the warning signs, and the plan would come off without a hitch. Her parents didn't know about anything amiss, and enough time had passed so there would be no suspicion of the soda wallas and her death, once it was discovered, would allow Cyrus to marry a new wife. A loud ship's horn interrupted her thoughts, reminding her of another possibility. She recalled the hulking figure of Jayanth's boss. Ravi had been furious about the changes Jayanth's victory had brought about for all the stevedores. As revenge against her father, Praveen, who'd shown her face at the docks, could have been abducted. She'd be left to die. Ravi would escape prosecution. But there was also the Farid situation. Someone involved might worry she was getting close to the truth. The telephone call from a woman that had brought her out could have been a ploy, and the disabling of Ramchandra's rickshaw had been intentional. This, of course, pointed to the attacker being connected to the caller. She'd been taken around eight in the evening. What time was it now? She slid her stiff right hand over her left forearm until she felt the rectangular face of her French wristwatch. She could not read time in the dark, but it was comforting to still have it. She wondered if she had anything else. 
Groping with both hands, she found her beaded purse trapped in a corner of the sack near her feet. How surprising that the assailant hadn't taken it. Perhaps it was meant to be an identifier after she was nothing more than a pile of bones. The fact that she'd been left alive might mean somebody was nearby keeping guard. She wanted to know. Clearing her scratchy throat, she began shouting in Marathi, What are you doing sticking me in a bag like this? Kidnapping is a crime! She shouted for five minutes, changing her language to Hindi and then English, steadily raising her level of profanity. Hearing nothing but silence, she gathered that she was alone. If she was truly alone, she could try to escape the bag without interference. Feeling more determined than frightened, Praveen began exploring the scratchy sack. The top end was sewn straight across, but the end near her feet was drawn tightly together, as if it had been tied with a rope. She could not possibly untie something knotted on the outside. The only way out of the bag would be to tear the straight edge. Praveen searched through her small beaded purse, which contained a few coins, business cards, the vial of rose attar, and her mother-of-pearl fountain pen. She removed a metal hairpin from her braided coronet and tried to stab it through the cloth. The thin pin broke on her fifth attempt. She needed a sharp bit of metal. She thought of the whale bones inside her brassiere, but she didn't have enough space to move her arms to unhook her blouse. Instead, she took the fountain pen and rubbed its nib against the sharp, broken hairpin. It took only a few minutes of industrious work to give the pen's nib a knife-like sharpness. She felt elated when she pushed the pen into the bag's fabric, and it went through. Diligently, she stabbed the cloth until she'd made an opening of a few inches, and then, with her hands, she tore it open the rest of the way. Squeezing herself out, she slowly released her arms and legs from the tight ball they'd been in. Her right foot throbbed with pain, and so did some spots on her back and one elbow. But she was free. In a short, dark space that smelled of dust... Groping around, she identified many more sacks around her. The crowding gave the impression she was in a storeroom, perhaps one of the many go-downs built in rows near the harbor or at Ballard Pier itself. Goods were held for months and sometimes years in such go-downs. She remembered Rustam's frustration about a shipload of nails that should have been delivered to Mystery Construction, but had been accidentally stored after the unloading and forever lost. That could be her plight. She tried to think logically. If she'd been loaded into this place, there had to be a way to the outside. First, she searched the low ceiling, hoping to find the base of a chute. There was none at least not near her. She shifted her investigation to the cold cement walls around the sacks, but moving made her feel the impact of being in a windowless, doorless box. She was becoming frightened and realized that not knowing where she was in relation to the bag she'd broken out of made her feel lost. Praveen said a silent prayer, and afterward her mind was clear. If she'd been brought to a place already filled with goods, she'd probably been left close to the front of the space and whatever door existed. She crawled back to the spot where the destroyed bag lay. Then she sat down and felt everything around it. A raised edge on the wooden base below her caught her attention. When she touched it, she realized it was one edge of a large wooden square. She was able to pry up the square and push one of her hands through. Her initial confusion was followed by the realization that she'd been loaded up onto a shelf in some kind of storage space. This was the reason for the very low ceiling above her head. The way out was to drop down to the next level, though how steep the fall would be and what she'd land on was unknown. Sometimes people kept guard dogs in their storerooms. 
There even were rumors of certain merchants keeping snakes, which would dissuade both thieves and rats. She whistled to see if a dog might move below. There was no response. Praveen slowly fit herself through the opening, feeling her way down with her feet. But then her tired arms couldn't hold her anymore. She slipped straight down, landing in a sitting position on another group of sacks. She sat there for a while, making sure no bones seemed to be broken. Although when she gathered the strength to stand, she discovered a searing pain in her hip. Resolutely, she bumped her way around the room to the area where she saw some thin streaks of light. A ventilated wooden door, she decided, after exploring it with her fingers. Unfortunately, it was locked from the outside. Pressing her eyes to the narrow bits of light, she realized the door was near an area with people. She heard the rumble of men's voices and, again, the blowing of a ship's horn. She thought she must be at the harbor or very close by, and if she could hear voices, that also meant someone might hear her. Help me, she called in English, and then in Marathi. She shouted again and again, but nobody heard. Perhaps it was still too early, or the storeroom was too distant. Starting around seven, the dock became lively, but then there might be too much noise for a tiny cry to be heard from a go-down. She had to draw attention to the door in the hopes that the earliest workers, the tea makers, the sweepers, and the dock loaders might hear. Praveen put her hand in her purse. She could write a note and push it through one of the ventilation holes. But the laborers reporting to work were mostly illiterate. Then she felt the cool glass of the vial of rose adder. If she spilled it, she'd create an overpowering aroma. An expensive, feminine scent that was unusual for the dock might draw men to the storeroom's door. And if she could push the Anna and Paisa coins through the ventilation holes, they might catch someone's eye. Perveen opened the vial and spilled it along the open edges of the door. Then she pushed an Anna coin through, hearing it clink as it hit cobblestones outside. Take the money, she bellowed, feeling like a huckster at the circus. Money, money, money! The light was brighter through the shafts, and her voice nearly gone when she heard someone yell, Look, there are coins. What a smell! Where are the roses? With her mouth close to the vents, she screamed, Help me out, and you'll get more. Please, I tell you, help me. Did you hear something? One man said to another in Marathi. No, but that smell is making me sick. Sounded like a woman called out, but where? The last male voice sounded familiar. Jayant Baya? Praveen shouted. Jayant Baya! Is that you? There was a long pause, then his shout. Perveen Memsab, where are you? Behind this door. She pounded it so hard her knuckles hurt. The one that smells like roses. Get a lati, Jayanth called out to someone, and bring the harbor constable. Ten minutes later, the man had forced open the door. Perveen emerged, and for the first time in hours was able to straighten her back. She realized her sari had fallen away from her hair and the top of her body, so she wound it up rapidly. Jayanth moved forward protectively as she fixed the rest of her sari so it was presentable. Some men in the cluster eyed the coins lying on the brick walk that ran along the go-downs. As they brought the coins to her, she shook her head. Please, share it. You saved my life. My friend saw the coins, Jayanth told her. Where exactly are we? Perveen looked around, trying to orient herself. Ballad Piers section for go-downs. Our work today is loading up a P&O cargo ship with D. Please sit down, Memsab. You look weak. 
Parveen sat down on a jute sack that he dragged out. She felt elated. She had been meant to die, yet she'd cut her way out of that fate and back to the world she loved. Taking a deep breath of the salty port air, she asked Jayanth whether the storage places were privately owned. They are property of the Bombay port, but leased to various people, he said, bringing out another sack for her to rest her feet on. And your boss, Ravi, would he have a key to many of these places? Jayanth cocked his head to the side, as if he was considering all aspects of the issue. I don't know for certain. I believe he can only obtain such a key the day that work is needed. But if work starts early in the morning, might the company needing assistance from stevedores deliver Ravi the key the night before? Are you really thinking Ravi has done this? Jayant's voice dropped. It cannot be his doing, protested an anxious-looking stevedore standing nearby. We did not come here yesterday, and it's not on the work plan for today. The door's number is wrong. Praveen turned and looked at the door that was hanging askew. It had a number painted on it. 179. Nothing more. Does anyone have a torch? she asked. Jayant shook his head. The police will have such. Look, they are coming just now. Two Indian constables were hastening toward them, followed by an English imperial officer. What is the trouble here? The Englishman frowned at Praveen's dishevelment. I could not understand half of what the boy has told me. And there are complaints from the dock about men missing from work. These observant stevedores may have saved my life. Praveen looked at the ragtag group of workers with gratitude. They are heroes. Who are you? He asked, taking on a commanding air. No civilian visitors allowed away from the area of passenger ships. My name is Praveen Mystery. I'm a solicitor with Mystery Law in Bruce Street. I was thrown in a sack last night and brought here by an assailant who locked me up. But the officer seemed stuck on her opening statement. You work for a salary, then? As a female legal secretary? No, she said crisply. I've been employed as a solicitor by Mystery Law for the last half year. Fetch the harbour, master. The officer directed the smaller constable. This will require a full investigation. Miss Mystery, are there others inside? I didn't hear anyone. If it's white slaving, there could be loads of ladies trapped inside. I'm not white, she protested. I'm a bossy. It might be that this is related to one of my cases. Ignoring her, the officer unclipped a battery torch from his belt and stepped into the storeroom, shining the torch around inside. Praveen stepped in close beside him, watching as the small beam of light ran over the room's sacks. The officer pulled a knife from a sheath at his belt and ran it carefully along the edge of one sack. Inside was a bolt of khaki cloth. The next sack he opened looked the same. On the outset, this looks all right. Just a lot of drill cloth, he said, turning to look at Praveen. Drill cloth, she said. Now she saw that the corner of each sack was stamped with English writing. Fareed Fabrics, Girangaon, Bombay. Chapter 29 An Unexpected Space Bombay, February 1921 Thanks to God and those wonderful stevedores, you are home. But you must take what happened as a warning, Camellia Mystery said, 
as she ushered Perveen onto the veranda and handed her a cup of her very best ginger and lemongrass milk tea. She'd bathed, slipped into a fresh dressing gown, and now was dipping a curry biscuit in the delicious tea. The anxiety she'd felt in the sack was a distant memory. I was taken because I fell for a ruse. I've learned the hard way, just as before. There are ruses, and then there are traps. This was a bad trap, Jumshadji said from his lounge chair across the veranda. Praveen could hear the clattering of John in the kitchen making a large breakfast. The voices and sounds of her familiar household were the most beautiful music she'd ever heard. You can't fathom what it's been like since Mustafa realized you'd gone out at night on your own, Camellia continued. We put our heads together and came up with so many different ideas of which way to turn. Gulnaz slipped into a chair next to Praveen and patted her arm. I remembered you planned to meet your English friend for the pictures. Mama was so anxious, so I rang up those Hobson Joneses. What a chuckle, that mother. By the time she finished scolding me for calling her Mrs. instead of Lady, I was nervous to even ask for Alice. But she came on the line. Your friend is loyal. She wanted to come straight down to join us in the search, and when her parents wouldn't allow it, she said we should probably go to the Farid place. I must go there today. Did all of you go last night? Praveen asked. No. Mama stayed behind to be near the telephone. Papa and Rustam and I went over there. The constables told us nothing was wrong, but I insisted on going to the ladies' section. A servant girl let me in. I spoke to two widows who said you hadn't come by. When I said you were missing, they became worried too. You probably saw Razia and Sakina, Praveen guessed. What about the third wife? I didn't ask to see her. I was only worried about you. Gulnaz looked anxiously at her. We drove back along the Queen's necklace, and then every street and ballad estate and fort. Aman was driving like a madman. He feels so guilty about being at Victoria Terminus when you needed him. If Arman had driven you last night, he'd have had ruined tires, Rustam said, coming up behind Gulnaz to rub her shoulders. Apparently, after business was over yesterday, someone dropped nails and broken glass on both ends of Bruce Street. It took two hours this morning to clean up. The office workers and automobile drivers were quite put out. Did you see a face or have any inkling of your attacker? Gulnaz's voice was urgent. Was he a street type or a gentleman? I didn't see his clothing, his face, not even the color of his skin, Perveen said. As I told the police, the bags in the storeroom point to the involvement of the Farids, but it's not the only possibility. What else are you thinking? Camellia pressed. Perveen swallowed hard and spoke the worry she'd been hesitant to divulge. A few days ago, I saw a man who looked like Cyrus. I've been looking over my shoulder for him most of this week. Are you sure? Gulnaz asked, her eyes widening. The bastard! Rustam snapped. He's no right to be near you. Camellia's face sagged, and she sat down heavily in her chair. I thought all of that was over. When was this incident? Jamshedji asked quietly. Last Tuesday. I was in the Silver Ghost, speeding along the Queen's Necklace. The man was waiting to buy food at a daba on Chaupati Beach. She broke off. Papa, why are you looking like you know this? She'd expected Jamshedji to be shocked or angry. Instead, he had a knowing expression. 
in all likelihood, you did see him. You knew he was here, and you kept it from me? Perveen's calm was disintegrating like the biscuit she'd left dangling in her tea. Let me begin with the so-called Bengali stranger you were worried about. He's not strange to me. His name is Purshottam Ghosh. Is he your client? Praveen was confused. He is the private detective based in Calcutta. I hired to gather the medical records we used in Sodawala v. Sodawala. Remember? I never met him, but of course I remember those files being used. Perveen's curiosity was mixed with irritation. Why hadn't her father said this straight out? I was pleased with Ghosh's initiative, and have employed him since the trial ended to keep tabs on Cyrus. Mama, did you know? Perveen turned to Camellia, who shook her head. I had no idea, she said. But I'm sure your father had his reasons. Perveen's safety comes first, Jamshedji said simply. And if we could ever find proof of infidelity, it would mean a chance for the separation to become a divorce. Perveen put down her cup. She was stunned by the lengths to which her father had gone. And if Cyrus discovered the surveillance, he'd have a valid grudge to pursue against her family. Did Cyrus learn about this? We're not sure, Jamshedji said, after a disturbing pause. But to recap the surveillance history, Ghosh wasn't following him daily. It was part-time observation done in conjunction with his other jobs. He's reported to me that Cyrus continued his activities, averaging twice a week with women of the professional variety, either in Sonagachi Prostitution District or the slum near the bottling plant. Papa, why didn't you tell me Cyrus was here in Bombay? Perveen demanded. Jamshedji raised a cautionary finger. I didn't want to worry you unduly. At first, we thought it was a business trip, or he might have been calling on his relatives, the Vachas. And then we got a surprise. I don't like surprises. Praveen felt sick with anxiety. Ghosh followed him to Petit General Hospital, where he walked in with a valise late on Tuesday and did not come out. Rustam was angrily pacing the veranda. What do you mean he didn't come out? The Velgarde might have slipped out the back. Or he is visiting a sick person, or checked in himself as a patient, Camellia pointed out. The letter! Perveen said, putting her teacup down so hard the saucer rattled. This week, I received a letter asking me to go to the hospital to see someone I didn't know. This man who wrote the letter wanted me to make his will. I can't recall the name, but it certainly wasn't Cyrus. Why would Cyrus come to Bombay for medical treatment? Calcutta's full of doctors, isn't it? Kulnaz asked. But there is no Parsi hospital in Calcutta, Camellia said. I learned that when I was visiting there. Petit is a top-draw hospital offering free and subsidized care to any Parsi. Might he have come for that, rather than to harass Perveen? Perveen took a deep breath. I'd like to know. I'll go to the hospital. Don't you let him speak to you, Chamshedji said sharply. A pitiful situation could be a ploy. I've seen this time and again with separated couples. Gulnaz and I are on the ladies' voluntary committee at the hospital. We'll find out whether he is a patient there before Perveen decides anything, Camellia said, pouring more tea in Perveen's cup. 
Don't act without forethought. Perrine was exasperated. Why won't you let me go? It seems that I've escaped one prison to be kept in another. We are hardly imprisoning you, Camellia soothed. We are only giving you a bit of time to settle and recover from a terrible attack. You haven't even had breakfast, and you're already raring to go both to the hospital and Malabar Hill. Frankly, I don't know which situation is more dangerous. I could tell you if I went. I'll go mad sitting here all day, Perveen said. Why not ring Alice? Gulnaz asked brightly. Perhaps she can drop by for a visit. The thought of Alice was a comfort. Nodding at Gulnaz, Perveen asked Camellia if her friend could come over for lunch. It was high time for a chat, and Perveen knew there was a chance Alice had overheard more gossip about the government's interest in the Farids. We're happy to host Alice. I'll ask John to make it a special ladies' luncheon with a lot of sweets. Unless you will also be staying, Rustam? Rustam yawned, putting a hand over his mouth too late. I'd like to sleep a few more hours, but I'm needed at the construction office. This gave Praveen another idea. If you're going to your office, Rustam, may I ask you to do me a favor there? He gave her a searching look. What? You mention the architectural drawings for 22 Seaview Road are stored in a cabinet. I'd like to borrow them. Rustam drank deeply from his coffee cup before answering. I only saw the outside wrappings, and those plans are from Queen Victoria's time. They probably have deteriorated. Or the plans might be perfectly fine because of the care Grandfather took with wrapping them, Perveen said. Will you please, please have one of the clerks look? Haven't I done enough for you? Rustam grumbled. Why do you need them now? Too much is happening. I'm exhausted. Those plans offer a chance to understand the house's twists and turns, Jamsheji said. It would be especially useful for me, as I can't go inside the Zanana. All right, Papa. I'll see what I can do, Rustam said. Perveen smiled a silent thank you at Jamsheji. It often seemed she was in a contest with her father, but occasionally they came to a draw. Alice was pleased to get a call from Perveen. After hearing a summary of the events of the last day, including the rescue by stevedores, she accepted the invitation to join Perveen, Gulnaz, and Camellia for a Parsi lunch. Alice arrived at one thirty in a dark blue crossley rather than the rolls. Still, the neighborhood's young cricketers stood gawking as the tall, blonde Englishwoman strode up to the mystery's gate. Catching sight of the group, Alice wound up her arm and bowled an imaginary cricket ball straight at them. They broke apart, laughing. Alice, come in, Perveen said, coming outside when her friend didn't approach the door. It really is you, Alice said, beaming at her. I went to the wrong house first. They were too friendly, wanted me to come in for tea, and started talking about wanting an English governess. I suppose it was my first job offer. Perveen, is that you? Gwendolyn Hobson Jones shielded her eyes from the sun with a hand as she peered from the car. Good afternoon, Lady Hobson Jones, Perveen replied, her spirits sinking. She hadn't thought Alice's mother was coming. Lady Hobson Jones marched up the path and into the house, where she swiveled her head to take in the hall, parlor, and dining room. I drove with Alice to ensure she arrived safely, given all that's happened in Bombay this week. Did you have some sort of trouble yesterday evening? Alice shot Praveen a glance that she interpreted to mean she shouldn't say much. 
It was a mix-up about where I was. As you can expect, my parents worry about me being out past dark, even though I'm twenty-three. Herveen kept her tone light. Won't you come in to meet my mother? And would you like to lunch with us? Sorry, I'm off to a luncheon at the Bombay Gymkhana. Sergeet will return for Alice in about three hours. Sorry for the intrusion, Alice murmured to Praveen as the two watched the departing car. She had some fears about what a Parsi home would be like. I think all the silver and mahogany put her to ease. Really? I thought she was the modern type. Praveen could never relax under Alice's mother's scrutiny. It was a good thing she hadn't been free for lunch. I like your neighborhood, Alice said, going into the parlor to look out the window at the street. So many tall houses with pretty ironwork balconies. I'm sure they will stand the test of time. And it's practical to have so many small parks around for people to enjoy. My brother Rustam's head would swell if he heard your review, Praveen said with a chuckle. He's building many of these homes, and while the trees in the parks and on the streets are still small, he thinks this could become Bombay's greenest neighborhood in a few decades. Camellia stepped into the hall to take Alice's hat. How do you do, Miss Hobson Jones? I'm Praveen's mother. She painted such a nice picture of you through all the letters she wrote from Oxford. I'm grateful that you were her first English friend. First and best friend, Praveen added, in England and in India. Alice bent awkwardly from the shoulders to address the petite woman at eye level. Holding out her hand, she said, Miss Mystery, please call me Alice. And thanks very much for asking me to lunch. It's nice of you to have a guest when you are likely still getting over last evening's trouble. I am a bit weary, it's true, Camellia said with a warm smile. And in India, we usually call our friend's mother's auntie. I will be pleased to become your Camellia auntie. Thank you, Camellia auntie, Alice said, beaming back at her. Gulnaz drifted into the hallway toward their cordial cluster. Sounding very reserved, she said, Miss Hobson Jones, I'm Gulnaz. I'm Paveen's sister in law, but we've known each other since primary school. How intriguing that you married her brother, Alice said with a wink. Do call me Alice, Gulnaz. Tell me. Did you know Rustam when he was in short pants? Kulnaz blushed. No, it was an arranged marriage. A blissful one, Praveen said, smiling at Gulnaz, who she suspected might have overheard her description of Alice as her best friend. I can't tell you how much nicer my brother's become since Gulnaz's arrival. It's a terrific deal for all of us. The young women had a few more minutes of pleasant small talk before Camellia called them to the table to eat fish, potato curry, chapatis, dal pulao, and kachumbar. Do you eat like this every day? Alice was already reaching for her fork and knife. Of course. Will you eat palm frit? Camellia asked. Yes, but... Where is the fish? Alice stared in amazement at the steaming banana leaf package that John added to her plate. It's Patrini Machi, a Basi specialty, Kulnaz said. You don't eat the banana leaf. When you open it, you'll find a lovely fillet with a coconut spice paste on top. It's delicious, Alice said after a bite. But... Did you leave off the chilies for me? I thought chilies might hurt your stomach, Camellia said. Am I wrong? I was born in Madras and nursed by a Tamil. Bring the chilies! After lunch, Gulnaz decided she would take a rest. 
Praveen suspected Alice had overwhelmed her. Gulnaz had asked about the latest trends in England, and instead of talking about fashion and films, Alice had soliloquized on the recent triumphs of the suffrage movement, the future of women in mathematics, and Irish freedom. The rich luncheon made Perveen slightly tired, too, but her mind was still reeling with thoughts about all that had happened over the last few days. Praveen took Alice upstairs and threw her airy bedroom out to the large balcony. Lillian was having a midday nap, but woke readily at the sight of the saucer of chopped cucumber and tomato Alice fed her. After eating her lunch, the parrot sat on the Englishwoman's shoulder and stared at her blonde hair for a long time before making the first peck at it. Lillian, you mustn't bite people, Praveen chided, and the parrot whooshed off to the garden. You'd almost think she's ashamed of her behavior. No need to anthropomorphize, Alice said. The bird is attracted to any source of light. She hoped my hair was edible and went off because it wasn't. Oh, Alice, Praveen said with a sigh. It's all so unbelievable, sitting here joking like nothing happened. Alice reached out and closed her big hand over Praveen's small one. When Gulnaz called, and I realized you weren't in the office doing papers, my first thought was you'd done another bunk. I thought you had wanted to go to the pictures without me. I invited you. Why would you think that? I see the way people look at me as I go through the city— Yes, some of them are smiling and offering me namaste gestures, but I know they resent us. You probably had to lobby for me to be admitted to the lunch table. As you know, I've wanted you to come since the day you arrived, and today's spontaneous luncheon was my sister-in-law's idea. Mischievously, she added, I thoroughly enjoyed watching you sprinkle a few too many fresh green chilies on your fish. All the while, your mother was explaining fish is called marchley and chilies are called mirchi. Hindi is far too confusing. Jaya, the housemaid, stepped onto the balcony with a long cedar box. Mimsal, this was just delivered from Mystery Construction. Perfect timing. Praveen took the box into her lap and realized she was almost afraid to open it. Would the box have kept its contents well preserved? Or was she going to find a nest of weevils and a few scraps of architectural plans? You're holding that thing like a baby. What is it? Alice teased. I let you see it when I open it up on my desk in the bedroom. The document is old, and I don't want anything to blow away in the wind. It's not a top-secret legal document I must not see, Alice asked, following her in. Not at all. These are the architectural drawings for 22 Seaview Road. Inside the box, a leather-bound folio held a series of drawings on thick stock that had yellowed and was brittle on the edges. But the plans hadn't been affected by damp or insects, and the ink markings were dark enough to see. Praveen took extreme care as she opened the series of pages that showed exterior views and elevations of the bungalow. What do you think? I suppose I should have my brother here pointing things out. It all looks very geometric. Alice looked over Praveen's shoulder for a good minute before speaking. If one counts up all my classes in public school in Oxford, I've studied geometry for five years. But one doesn't need a mathematics degree to see that the angles in these facades don't match the floor plans. What do you mean? Praveen adjusted herself to see Alice, who was still gazing deeply at the building sketch. I can tell you what I think is strange— but it would be more significant if I knew about who's staying in which room. 
Praveen thought she should wait to ask her father whether he'd approve of what she was about to do. But she wanted to hear from Alice, and she finally knew how she could bring her in. Just a minute. Praveen walked out to the balcony again and slid open the panel underneath the floor of Lillian's cage. She pulled out a tarnished sovereign, one of the few coins she had left from her time in England. Of course, keeping it outdoors for the last half year had resulted in its tarnishing, but it could always be polished. Returning to Alice, Praveen held out the coin. That is quite generous, but I'm more in need of rupees than a Queen Victoria sovereign, Alice said dryly. I gave away all my rupees and paise in the last twenty-four hours. This sovereign is a formal payment, Praveen said. I'll write it up with a receipt. If you accept it, you'll become an employee of mystery law. Alice looked cautiously at her. You can offer me a job without your father's say? A temporary job as a geometry consultant, Praveen said with a grin. Geometry consultant? I've never heard of such a thing. It's the only way I can stay within the letter of the law and tell you some important things about the Farids. I just hope that what you hear doesn't make you want to run back to England. Alice shook her head. The only ones with the power to put me on a boat are my parents, and you must believe I won't divulge a word of what you've got to say. Perveen went to the bedroom door and looked out into the hall. She could hear her mother snoring down the hallway, and Gulnaz was likely doing the same on the other side of the duplex wall. Only after Perveen had locked the door and taken Alice back out to the balcony did she tell the whole story. I suspect the answer is in front of me, but I can't see it, she said at the end. It feels as if I were on the beach, staring at a swimmer out at sea. I can't identify the black speck in the waves. Could be a man or a woman or an animal. From the description of the murderer's style, I'd say animal, Alice said with a snort. And when will it end? I'm not as confident as you seem to be that yesterday's call came from someone trying to get you into the street for kidnapping. It could have come from a woman who's no longer alive. Praveen considered this. Gulnaz said she spoke to two widows. I'm almost certain it was Sakina and Razia, but not Muntaz. What if one or both of them guessed she was pregnant? You haven't yet calculated the estate payments due. There's still time for someone to reduce the number of inheritors and improve her situation. Restlessly, Alice picked up Perveen's mother's pen and tapped it on the table. Remind me again of who's going to inherit? Baby Jum Jum is the largest inheritor, taking 35%. The daughters each get 17.5%, and the widows a touch more than 4% apiece. If Mumtaz's baby survives, the distribution percentages will change. Alice shook her head. I feel sorry for those widows. Except for Razia Begum, who owns the land, which the other wives don't have. Now her daughter's missing. Revenge, perhaps? She might have been taken because she knows too much. Amina is such a smart little girl, and she is more outspoken than any of her elders. I think that we should have heard something from the relatives in Aoud if the theory about her journey was true. Perveen paused, feeling a stab of guilt at letting the widows keep her from sounding the alert about Amina. What are you thinking? Alice looked at her soberly. Alice could give her insight into the architectural plans, not Amina's fate. Sighing, Praveen asked, What do you make of the bungalow's design? Looking at the walls and windows, it appears there's no connection between men's and women's territories inside the house. 
But of course there must be. How else would the husband visit the wives at night? Praveen explained about the brass jolly door between the two sides. Supposedly, Mr. Farid held a key. It must be somewhere. Sounding pensive, Alice asked, Which room did Mukri sleep in? From her time observing Sub-Inspector Singh, Praveen could easily remember the orientation of the hall and the room where Mr. Mukri appeared to have slept. She pointed on the drawing to answer Alice's query. There appeared to be five other bedrooms in that section of the bungalow, but for some reason he chose this room. Because he saw himself as lord and master. Alice studied the plan a while longer. On one side of the master bedroom, it looks like the wall is quite a bit thicker than the other walls. Do you see that? Perveen craned her neck. It might not be a solid wall. It could be a storage area. It's strange to have this construction difference on just one side of the house. Other than this, the house is extremely symmetrical, Alice said. Perveen tried to see the master bedroom again in her mind. She was walking through it, looking around. She'd put her hand on the bathroom doorknob when Singh had stopped her from going further. She studied the architectural drawing and recognized the bathroom and another door to its left. That can't be a closet, Alice said, following her gaze, unless it's the only closet in the bungalow. Indians use almiras to hold their clothing and other possessions, Praveen said. Of course, there are always storerooms within a bungalow. But those are clearly marked as very small rooms. Alice traced the lines on the paper with her finger. If you look at the wives' rooms in the Zanana, each of them has a door going into the same thicker exterior wall. And then there are windows showing on the exterior wall. What if there's a passage? Praveen interrupted. The fact is... The widow's rooms only have windows on the western side. Alice stared at her. I think you're right. Looking from my own bedroom window at the bungalow, I've seen those small windows. Praveen felt gripped by excitement. A passageway gives a husband access to various bedrooms in the Zanana without his going down the main hallway and catching the notice of others. It allows discretion. And what about the converse? Using her finger, Alice mapped a reverse journey. The wives could have easily gone to the other side. They could have walked over, spent the night with their husband, or later on, Mr. Mukri, and nobody else would have known. I don't know that any of them would have willingly gone to Mukri, Perveen said with a shudder. But she could imagine any one of them using the passage to advantage if she intended to commit murder. Chapter 30 The Second Act Bombay, February 1921 Perveen woke at 6.30 the next morning and was too restless to stay in bed. Her hip still ached slightly as she got out of bed and opened the doors to her balcony. The sky was slowly lifting its black veil. Something different was in the air. A feeling of something charged, almost electric. Praveen stared at the changing sky, trying to think of all the small pieces of information she'd read and heard. The answer to Mukri's death was contained within a couple of pieces of this mosaic, and possibly the answer to Amina's disappearance, too. But although she and Alice had dwelled for more than two hours on the plans, they couldn't know anything more without going to the bungalow itself. That had been impossible, because Alice's mother expected her to attend a cards party, and Praveen had promised her father she'd stay home. Lillian squawked from her cage, clearly aware of Praveen's presence. 
Go fly about the garden. There's plenty of food to find. Look how busy the other birds are, Perveen scolded. But Lillian remained, beating her wings to rise up a few inches and then come down hard on her perch bar. Over and over she did it, as if to irritate Perveen even further. The bird wanted her breakfast in a dish because she'd never developed the skills to hunt grubs or pick fruit. Perveen had once believed the Farid widows were similarly helpless, but she didn't anymore. It must have been maddening to have a household agent thrust into their world. Razia had the most powerful motivation against him, keeping her child from being married off. Sakina might have gone against Mukri because she hadn't liked the way he'd threatened Razia, and she might have feared for the future well-being of her own daughters. And Mumtaz would have wished him gone if there was a chance that he could claim parental rights to her child. However, Perveen couldn't see how the women could have been involved in her kidnapping. They knew their home and its secret places, but not the vastness of Bombay. Thinking of this conundrum made her want to speak with her father, who had not arrived home by the time she'd fallen asleep. If she'd woken Lillian, she might as well wake her father. Tying a wrapper over her nightdress, Perveen walked the short length of the hall to her parents' room. The door was ajar, and she saw her father was already dressed and standing in front of the mirrored Almira working on his cravat. Good morning he said, tugging at the edges of his bow tie. You are awake early. And you are too. When did you arrive home yesterday? Well after you were asleep, and Mama and I decided it was better to let you rest. Let us talk together while eating breakfast downstairs. In the dining room, sun was slanting in from the eastern windows, casting a pattern across the mahogany table. As Praveen sat down, John brought coffee and toasted brune masca buns. This was a far cry from the large breakfast that would be served to the rest of the family at 9.30, but it was just right for the hour. What did you do yesterday? Praveen yawned as she picked up her cup of coffee. I went to see if you rode, he said casually. I wish to check on the welfare of Mumtaz Bacon who wasn't observed by Gulnaz the other evening. And what about Amina? Praveen asked. Were you permitted to go to the Jolly Screen to speak through it to Razia Begum? Certainly, her father said, looking slightly affronted. It was surely a surprise to have her questioning his procedure. Sub-Inspector Singh was walking in, and I suggested that the two of us ask the young maid if all the women could come to their side of the jolly screen for a conversation on the second floor. He didn't think they would, but when they heard I was your father, they agreed. Praveen was too anxious to enjoy the pride she'd normally have felt in such a situation. Did you mention Amina's disappearance in front of the sub-inspector? The family doesn't want a police investigation— I did not ask, although I am growing concerned that we should mention it. If the child has come to harm from a household member, I wouldn't wish to be charged with aiding and abetting. Praveen's coffee went down the wrong way. Coughing out the fluid, she thought with horror about being charged for an offense when she thought she was in the right. Who knew? And say she wasn't charged... How could she live with herself if Amina died? After looking at her reprovingly, Jamshedji spread more butter on his bun. By the by, Mumtaz didn't come with the other two women to speak at the jolly screen. Razia Begum said it was due to not feeling well, and remembering what you told me about her pregnancy, I suggested to Singh that we let her rest. Again, Praveen was worried about her father's possible intrusion. Please tell me you didn't mention the pregnancy. Of course not, he said briskly. However, Singh stated concern that she should perhaps consult a doctor 
if she could not come to the window with the others. Razia Begum said she would call the doctor, although she could not promise Mumtaz Begum would be willing to be seen. What was it like speaking to them through a jali? Could you tell their voices apart? Of course. Razia Begum's voice is lower and not as melodious as Sakina Begum's. What else did you learn in the conversation? Singh questioned them about whether they had called you at Mystery House. Razia Begum said she hadn't, and in fact did not have the business card any longer. If she looked for it, she might have thought of calling me. Sakina Begum denied ringing you. She and Razia agreed that Mumtaz was in her rooms all evening and did not call. This led to my asking whether they had any concerns for safety, and both agreed that they wished to have the Durwan Mosen continue guarding the gate. But will the police let him out? Praveen asked. He'd been released and was on duty when I arrived. So the police had acted on what she'd learned about Mosen. He was reunited with his children and the gate was secure. Praveen felt a small bit of pride for her part in this. You may recall that Farid Fabric's office provided me with the home address of Mrs. Mukri, Jamshedji continued, starting in on a bowl of sliced papaya. Before going to catch the train for Pune, I checked your briefcase and found Sakina Begum's family address. I planned to call on both households during my day trip. It wasn't until I was settled on the train and looking through the papers that I realized the addresses for Mrs. Mukri and Sakina Begum's father were the same. I would be making a condolence call and an investigatory call at the same compound. But that's remarkable! A Faisal and Sakina Begum brother and sister? Parveen was astonished. Jamshedji dipped one corner of his brune maska in the coffee and ate at a leisurely pace. No. The parents are siblings, which means Faisal Mukri and Sakina Chivni were first cousins. The house belongs to Sakina's grandparents, but when Mrs. Mukri became a widow in 1910, she and her children, including 12-year-old Faisal, moved into the compound. Perveen noted that her father had dropped the honorific for Sakina. He was scant on formality when they were in private conference. It felt as if the first important piece of the mysterious mosaic had emerged. The blood relationship was why Sakina had trusted Mr. Mukri so absolutely, no matter how unpleasant he might have been to everyone else. What was their relationship like as children? Perveen asked. Mrs. Mukri didn't say anything, and as she is mourning for her son, I couldn't press her. Sakina's father, Mr. Chivney, said they became close as brother and sister, and Sakina missed him very much when he went away to school. When I stopped to speak with Sakina's younger brother, Adnan, whom I met in the garden when I was leaving, I was able to learn a bit more. Perveen had a number of burning questions, but she didn't want another pause, so she kept still. He said that when Faisal joined the household, he became the oldest boy in residence, and he attempted to gain the privileges that had been Adnan's. What kind of privileges? Adnan chuckled about it, but I could tell, since he remembered so well, that it must have bothered him greatly. Jamshedji said in the relaxed tone he used when reading aloud. Adnan Chivni said that after his cousin Faisal arrived, he received less choice pieces of chicken and lamb, and he no longer received many new clothes every season. Now Faisal got these things because he was the oldest. Faisal also charmed Sakina, who favoured him rather than her brother to the point that their closeness became somewhat alarming to the family. Faisal officially left the Zanana a year after he'd come to the household, 
but instead of staying on the other side of the house and going to school in town, he was sent to live at a madrasa. A religious boarding school? Parveen said, thinking about the school Faisal Mukri had said he was going to build. Here was the root of his interest in such places. Sakina was heartbroken when Faisal went away. During school breaks, when Faisal returned to the bungalow, he was allowed to visit the Zanana to see his mother, but wound up mostly with Sakina. Seeing that the affection between them was growing and might cause problems, Sakina's father accepted the proposal of a wealthy man he heard was looking for a second wife. This was Mr. Farid, who married her when he was thirty-nine and she was fifteen. Parveen was trying to put together a timeline in her mind. When was Faisal Mukri hired by Mr. Farid? Three years after he married Sakina. Sakina Begum would have been eighteen, and she'd already delivered Nasreen and Shireen. Faisal Mukri would have been nineteen years old. Parveen thought some more about it. I wonder... If Sakina Begum suggested to her husband that he hire her cousin, it's an ordinary enough request. It's likely. As I've mentioned, the Farid Fabrics accounting supervisor thought Mukri was a relative of Mr. Farid's. Parveen remembered Sakina's steadfast support of the proposition that she turn her personal wealth over to the Waqf. Mukri could have promised her that in exchange they'd live their lives in luxury, and perhaps without the others. Mukri had the power to arrange marriages for the other widows. The household could have been stripped of everyone except for the two of them and Sakina's own children. If Razia knew all of this, she might have realized Mukri was a threat to the household's existence. Would she feel the same way about Sakina? Or would she continue to tolerate the second wife? The only way Praveen could understand the truth of whether Razia had killed Mukri was by going directly to the women. Papa, I know you've been worried about me. I stayed home quietly yesterday and went to bed very early. I feel revived. I'd like to do some interviewing at the Farid bungalow today. Jamshedji drained the last of his coffee and then looked at her. I would be glad to accompany you, but I've got Mr. Reddy's trial today. Therefore, office work would be best for you today. Perveen swallowed hard. After leaving Calcutta, she had pledged to herself not to disrespect her father. He had taken her back without question, paid for her to study in England, and hired her as his employee when no other law firm in Bombay would. Jamshedji had delivered her second act. But in her second act, she was a solicitor duty-bound to do the best thing for her client, Razia Farid. Praveen looked her father in the eye. While your work in Pune has brought out some great information, your experience speaking through a jali has not yielded information we need to ensure the widow's safety. I am the only one who can speak to Sakina privately about her relationship with Mr. Mukri and also to Razia and Mumtaz to determine if they knew about the family tie. That could be another day when I'm able to accompany you. Jamshedji laid his napkin aside, a subtle indication to Praveen that he was readying himself to move on to court. She was losing advantage. Another reason I wish to visit Seaview Road is to establish whether there's a private access between the master bedroom and any of the wives' chambers. That's something that would be improper for you to try. Jamshedji's grey eyebrows drew together in concern. What is this about private access? Perveen decided to speak boldly as if her actions of the day before were entirely natural. Remember my request for the architectural drawings? I asked Alice to look at the plans with me. 
she noticed some inconsistencies and raised the possibility of a hidden passage, although it could also be a very thick wall. I wouldn't have expected you'd show Miss Hobson Jones the drawings. Jamshaji's voice was stiff with disapproval. I contracted her services as a temporary employee. In response to her father's incredulous look, she said, I paid her a sovereign and took a receipt. I knew Alice's mathematical acumen would be helpful with regard to the plans. Her father is the governor's counsellor, Jamshedji sputtered. Didn't you think she might tell him about this and cause all manner of havoc? Alice advised me she would not divulge a bit of it, and since she's our employee now, the court couldn't make her say anything. Jamshedji was silent for a long moment. As long as the police are still at the compound, you may visit. But don't go alone. Praveen was flooded with relief, not just at being allowed to go, but also at his tacit suggestion that Alice be included. Thank you very much for the permission, Papa. And is there anything more I should know? The autopsy was released. Sub-Inspector Singh informed me that Mukri's death was caused by a violent severing of his spinal cord. The back of the neck wound, Praveen said, suppressing a brief rush of nausea as she recalled the scene. I guessed that was the cause because of all the blood and the fact that the letter opener was still there. Ah, but the coroner didn't say the letter opener was the weapon. He suggested a stiletto-type item was used, although none was found on the scene. Praveen thought this through. Was the letter opener placed there after the fact? No comment was made on that, but it surely must be the case. He put down his cup heavily. For all we know, someone other than the killer came along after the deed was done and placed the letter opener there. It would be a way to throw suspicion on Razia Begum or Amina. Praveen was unable to sit any longer and got up to look out the window. I feel we must investigate the past relationship between Sakina Begum and Faisal Mukri. You must be very careful when you speak to her and any other of the wives, Jamshedji said. Get the information and get out. Praveen hugged her father tightly at the door. He had given her his blessing to continue with the case. It was hard to express to him how happy that made her, even at a very difficult time. Gruffly, he said, This is a grand farewell for an ordinary morning in court. I'm only wishing you the best of luck. You are defending Mr. Reddy's sweet shop, which is one of my favorite places. That brought a chuckle. If we prevail, there won't be much of a fee. But I expect a big ban of Burelu. We will celebrate with sweets tonight, Praveen pledged, hoping that it would be a celebration of her work as well as his. Chapter 31 Left Hanging Bombay, February 1921 Hobson Jones residence, Alice answered cheerfully on the second ring. It's Paveen. Are you up for work today? Certainly. I've watched the telephone all morning, hoping you'd call. Praveen wasn't surprised that the energy that had woken her stretched all the way to Malabar Hill. You can't imagine what I've learned from my father in the last half hour. I'm starting to put together the pieces. I'd like to finish that puzzle we began at your house last night, 
One thousand pieces, wasn't it? Alice spoke brightly, and Perveen suddenly realized that the counselor's telephone line was hardly confidential. Actually, I'd like to show you the hanging gardens. If it gets too hot, we can come back here and finish that puzzle. I'll come for you in the Crossley. No, it's not an imposition. Mummy has plans with Lady Lloyd and would much rather ride with her in the Silver Ghost. Alice arrived in the elegant blue car shortly after nine. As Praveen entered the car, several neighborhood boys waved at the tall, fair-haired visitor. Praveen ran past Camellia, explaining that she had to show Alice the hanging gardens before the midday sun rose. Good idea. She must not burn her skin. Take a parasol, Camellia said. Perveen had not wanted to tell her mother about her visit to the Malabar Hill bungalow. While Jamshedji had authorized the trip, her mother would worry far too much. Because the Hobson Jones's chauffeur, Sir Jeet, spoke excellent English, she knew not to talk about anything in the car. She did ask for a stop at the Hanging Gardens. There, the two strolled far away from the Memsobs chatting together while Ayaz trundled their babies. The two went through the little paths lined by roses and topiaries. At the park's far side, a stone wall bordered a steep drop. It was there that Praveen explained about the close relationship of Sakina and Faisal Mukri. Praveen also told Alice of her intent in exploring the passageway. Alice's eyes glittered with excitement. How shall we manage all of this? Do you think they'll just let us look? Praveen shook her head. You shall be my decoy. What if you appeared at the door of the Zanana, hawking yourself as an English governess? Even if they say no, you can keep talking, and they'll not have the nerve to send an Englishwoman away. And where will you be? Alice said, as the two of them turned to walk back to the waiting car. Walking into the other side of the house and taking the exploratory route from Mr. Farid's room, or should I say, Mukri's lair, she added with a grimace. But aren't there going to be police present? Alice said as they passed through the garden's gateway to the street. I'm not sure, because I heard Mosen's back on the job. In any case, if the police are present, we'll tell them you're paying a social call, and they will think your mother sent you. They already know I'm the family lawyer, and have good reason to be at the property. Outside the bungalow wall, a young man carrying a notebook was arguing with a constable guarding the gate. Perveen guessed the young man was a reporter. She tried not to catch his eye as she spoke out the car window to the constable standing on guard. Are you from the Malabar station? Perveen asked politely in Marathi. Thank you for coming. I'm Miss Mystery, the family's lawyer. I've come with the children's governess. You were at the station, the constable said, nodding in recognition. The inspector and sub-inspector are coming later this morning. I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you again, Perveen said. Who are you? What is this? The reporter called out as the constable waved the car through. Good luck to both of us, Alice muttered after they'd both stepped out of the car. Any new thoughts about our plan? Praveen glanced at Sir Jeet, who had been instructed to wait in the port cochere close to the Zanana entrance. He had already opened up a newspaper and settled in for the wait. Let's divide and conquer as planned. You will knock on the Zanana door and offer a free English lesson for the girls. It's really too bad Amina isn't here. She'd jump at the chance to speak with you. I will check if Mohsen's here and then get on with my search for the passageway. Do you have the plans? Alice asked. Yes, they're in my bag. 
but I've got the layout more or less memorized. Then might I keep them in my satchel? Just because I don't know the bungalow at all. Perveen gave them to her. Let's meet at the car when each of us is done. After they parted, Perveen made her first stop at the garden hut. Right in front of it, Mosen was lying on a charpai. He was dressed just in a vest and pajamas and fast asleep. Zaid sat next to the charpai, gazing adoringly at his father. As Perveen approached, Zaid got up and ran to hug her. You brought him back? Mimsab, thank you. Smiling, she said, The police released him, not I, but I am glad for you. The exchange had woken Mosen. He lifted his head from under a blanket, grumbling at the children to quiet themselves. Then he turned and saw Perveen. Instead of giving her the smile she expected, he looked anxious. You! Good morning, Mosen, Perveen said pleasantly. When were you released? A few hours after that telephone call they allowed to Sakina Begum. She convinced them. It was hard to think she might be chatting with the man who'd abducted her. Carefully, she asked, What is the situation with the household? Are the Begums asking you to stay on? Certainly. He looked at her with a hint of defiance. I've done nothing wrong. I'm only resting here because the police are at the gate keeping away reporters. She supposed the police wouldn't like it known that they'd released a suspect before taking a new one into custody. Perveen told him she hoped he would be back on duty soon. Feeling his eyes on her, she walked onward to the entrance to the main house. The front door was locked, and when she knocked, nobody came. This could only mean the police were clustered at the Zanana. Alice would have to deal with them. Perveen crept along the side of the house until she came to a side door that she remembered from the architectural plans. This was the servant's door, she realized, after seeing a small pair of rough sandals next to it. It was unlocked. After a short walk down a hallway, she found the large, elegant reception room that she'd first visited. This time, she was well aware of the risks of being seen and heard through the pierced marble wall. Keeping her eyes on the jolly panel, she slipped out of her shoes, but instead of putting them in the shoe case, she put them under a chair. Tiptoeing upstairs, she began preparing an excuse in case Zaid or Fatima came upon her. She would tell them she was looking for papers connected to the estate in the upstairs study. The children didn't need to know she was looking for evidence connected to Mr. Mukri's death before she was certain of her suspicions. They wouldn't like what she was presently thinking. Although Jamshedji had told her about Mosen's release, she hadn't realized he'd been freed just hours before her abduction. All the widows had the street address for Mystery House on the business cards she'd given out. He could have been dispatched to get rid of her. And Mosen knew the peer. Razia had mentioned that Mosen's job, before he'd come to the house, had involved working for Farid Fabrics on the docks. Sakina might also have known. Mosen had wanted to know about a jewelry shop. Perhaps it wasn't because he intended to steal. Sakina could have promised him a portion of proceeds from selling her jewelry. Perveen caught her breath as she thought about the various things that might have been promised to the guard who performed household errands. But how could such a conversation between a secluded woman and male servant have taken place? Sakina had said she took care of the garden's flowers early in the morning. In Omar Farid's old bedroom, a shaft of midday sun fell across the space, brightening it. She was sure Mr. Farid would have kept the key to the locked door somewhere in the room. First, she checked the desk, but found only papers and money. She opened the double doors of a mahogany Almira. 
Gently, she moved her hands through the stacks of folded men's shirts, pajama trousers, and Sherwani coats. All were of average quality cotton, the kind of clothing worn by an employee, not a boss. There was just one European suit, made from gray cotton and carrying the label of an ordinary Bombay tailor. The suit had a slight odor, as if it had been put away without washing. All of the clothing was free of dust. It had to belong to Mr. Mukri. He probably wore the suits only to work or for special occasions. He had died wearing another suit. There had been so much blood she could not remember its color. But she did remember something else. It was a comment Sakina had made when Praveen had first asked the widows about what they'd done after hearing there was a wounded man lying on the other side of the brass jolly. Just because the man was dressed in an English suit, it didn't mean he was our household agent. Praveen had long since ruled out that Amina was the one who discovered the body because she hadn't mentioned seeing it when Praveen questioned her. Sakina had said she didn't look, but she'd known what he was wearing. A sharp lawyer would have recognized this incongruity the moment that the words had been uttered. But Praveen had been reeling with her own shock at seeing the body and the burden put on her by the police to get information from everyone. She had not registered what had been said until the moment she'd looked at the second suit in the Almira. Praveen reminded herself of the task at hand. She finished checking the inside of the Almira and looked underneath and behind it for a hidden key. Nothing. She realized ten minutes had already passed. She'd need to hurry up the search. A box of matches was tucked in one bedside table drawer. The other one held a lady's hair comb, two hairpins, and a small vial of adder. She didn't need to open it to smell the scent of sandalwood, the adder used by couples. Turning the hairpins over in her hand, she saw a long, lustrous black hair. Sakina had the prettiest hair of the three wives. It was very likely hers. But the hairpin gave Praveen an idea. She went to the locked door and slipped the pin inside the keyhole. She turned it this way and that, until she heard a click. The door opened with a creak of dry hinges, revealing a narrow, dusty marble passage. The hall was stamped with many footprints and couldn't have been more than two feet wide. It would have been horrifically claustrophobic if there hadn't been a row of clear story windows close to the ceiling. The windows were closed, which made the passage stifling. There was also a faint smell that brought Praveen back to the little room in the Sotawala's house. Praveen walked the passage's length, arriving at the door on the left that she knew was Sakina's. But the footsteps in the dust didn't stop here. They continued around a left turn. Was one of the other wives involved in the death? Now she was in the second part of the L-shaped Zanana hallway, where Razia's and Mumtaz's quarters lay. But her attention was no longer focused on the doors along its length. A dark bundle lay at the marble floor's end point. Praveen rushed forward, the smell of old blood filling her nose, making her want to retch. As she reached the bundle, she jerked to a horrified stop. Black chiffon, stained brown with dried blood, had been wrapped all around a small body. Praveen lifted the chiffon away and found a young girl, curled up with her dark hair half covering her face. It was Amina. Praveen felt tears starting. She should not have waited to report the disappearance. She should have carried out a house search with police assistance the moment she'd heard Amina had gone missing. Her hand shaking, Praveen put it on Amina's forehead. It was still warm, although that might have been because of the heat of the passage. But as she moved the hair away from Amina's face, 
It seemed as if she saw the girl's nostrils move very slightly, as if she were taking an air. Her lips were dry and cracked. Swiftly, Praveen reached under the chiffon and found Amina's arm. Sliding her fingers down to the inside of the girl's wrist, she felt a pulse. Amina was alive but unconscious. The result of the heat? Or drugging? Perveen needed to get Amina to safety. Dehydration after three days was a serious matter. Cyrus's sister, Azara, had been neglected and had died after not taking in food and water. Perveen hoped it wasn't too late for Amina also. As Perveen struggled to lift Amina's body, she thought about how only one of the widows wore black chiffon. Perveen heard the sharp sound of a door opening. With a feeling of dread, she turned her head. Sakina had entered the passage. Chapter 32 A Widow's Lament Bombay, February 1921 the veil had dropped. Sakina rapidly advanced toward Praveen, who had nowhere left to go. Why are you here? Sakina asked. I was interested in the passage. Praveen struggled to look composed. She thought of Alice, who was likely out at the car waiting for her. Even if Praveen screamed, Alice wouldn't hear her. The walls were too thick. Desperately, she said, the police also have details about this place and my plan to inspect it. Her second untruth of the day. But while Camellia had believed her, Sakina shook her head. I don't think so. We've only got one constable, and he is gawking at the huge, ugly Englishwoman who would like to become our governess. Perveen couldn't tell from Sakina's snide tone whether she believed Perveen and Alice were together. What she needed was to get Amina to safety. Sorting out Sakina's suspicions could come later. Keeping her hand on Amina, Perveen said, I'm amazed this girl is still alive after three days in such a stifling hot place. Will you help me carry her out? But she is sleeping. Sakina said, sounding almost protective. So tired after all she drank. What do you think she drank? Perveen almost said, was she poisoned, but stopped herself just in time. She would not get far by accusing Sakina when there was so much she needed to learn. When Sakina didn't answer, Perveen said, I must make clear, I am not your lawyer. I've taken on that duty for Razia Begum. Of course you would help her. She gets everything, Sakina said, her resentment surfacing. But her sweet-toothed daughter isn't as lucky. She drank Faluda mixed with morphine. Did Mosen buy the morphine? No, it was left from my husband's illness. I found it in the room some weeks ago. At that time, I was only thinking about using it to take care of Mumtaz. But sleeping powder has a much greater effect on a small child's body. Sakina had dropped two major revelations, but Praveen couldn't react with horror. She needed to calm the woman, and that meant letting Sakina feel understood. Softening her voice, she said, You were worried about Amina. The girl was always watching and listening. I didn't know she had found this passage. Maybe her mother told her it existed. Closing her eyes tightly, Sakina fell into a silence. Then the eyes opened, and she looked coolly at Perveen. We must wait for her to awaken. When she has the ability to drink again, you will give her the medicine again, mixed with water. She trusts you. Perveen felt her stomach turn. We mustn't do that. You've known Amina since you married her father. She's been like a sister to your own daughters. 
It will be a loss for them, just as I lost love. Twice. As she spoke, Sakina's lovely features seemed to sharpen. Praveen knew she had an opening, but how much could she say without pushing Sakina too far? Softly, she said, Faisal lived with your family when you were young. You were so close, the best of friends. Sakina looked at her for a long moment. Who told you that? Your family explained the situation to my father. They didn't want you to marry. They thought they knew better than us. Sakina's voice was wistful. But I loved Faisal, and he loved me. It was hard for Praveen to reconcile the unpleasant man she'd met with this lover that Sakina had pined for. But men could change their ways. Cyrus was proof of that. Was Faisal going to marry you after Idat was over? That was what he said at first. Sakina, who was leaning against the passage's wall just a few feet away, gave Praveen a pained look. But not after you visited, and we learned about what he could and could not do. Because of my questions, he became angry with me. He seemed to forget he would never have had a career in Bombay or a life in a mansion without me. Yes, in those early days when Faisal came to Bombay, you must have impressed your husband with information about him. Praveen strove to sound admiring. After all, he later granted him the most important position as household agent. Yes, I suggested he hire Faisal for the accounting department, Sakina said with a sad smile. I told him about Faisal's degree, his good character, and that there were no opportunities for him in Pune. My husband took pity on him, but thought it better for nobody to know that we were cousins. The other wives would have been jealous. And they'd have been rightfully suspicious when he moved into the bungalow. Softly, Praveen said, I saw the drinking glasses by his bed. You went to stay with him at night, didn't you, using this passage? I gave him the privileges of a husband. Sakina rested her head against the wall. And at first, I felt nothing but amazement at my turn of fortune. But then I began to see how Faisal had changed. Tell me, Praveen said, stroking Amina's hair as she spoke. She wanted to scoop up Amina and rush out, but the passageway wasn't wide enough for her to carry Amina and get past Sakina. She'd also noticed Sakina was keeping her right hand nestled in the folds of her sari, which could mean she was armed. Sakina spoke in a rush, as if she had longed to unload her story on someone. When we were young, he was so daring and funny. Now he was always cross. He could not easily understand the expenses of this household, but he promised me that after Idat was finished, we could marry and live very well. With the addition of everyone's Maher funds, Praveen said, I don't think he planned to use anything for a boy's school. One thing I don't know is whether he would have let the other Begums and Amina stay after your marriage. Praveen wasn't sure, but she thought she felt Amina stirring at her touch. No, he would have chosen their husbands, and one for Amina. But then, in the last few weeks, I realized it might be impossible to get them married. Looking soberly at Praveen, Sakina said, Mumtaz was tired and smelled of sickness. I know what that means. Faisal must have planted the seed in her. Praveen remembered Mumtaz's anxiety about Sakina finding out she was carrying a child. She'd been right about that fear. 
How can you know she carries Faisal's child? If I could not trust his intentions toward me, how could I trust him with anyone else? She raised her eyes heavenward. He had already seen her at that filthy place where she used to play music. We don't know the baby is his child, Praveen said, avoiding commentary on the Falkland Road lounge. If the baby is born in August, it could very well be your husband's. I don't believe it. Sakina was trembling. Her child taking a share of the inheritance? It's not fair! Praveen thought carefully about how to sound like an ally. Seeing the baby once he or she is born will tell us the truth. We cannot guess at it now. Sakina looked back the way Praveen had traveled, as if remembering her own past journeys. In the month just after my husband passed, I believed all that Faisal said. But when you spoke to me and showed me the papers and spoke about Razia, I realized that he could not use the funds as he said. A tight grimace twisted Sakina's beautiful face. We would have lost our security. He deserved to die for taking everyone's money. When Praveen had rushed to see Cyrus at the bottling plant, she had felt as if she were being carried in a dark, furious cloud. Nobody could have stopped her from getting to him. Sakina, I know the pain of betrayal. Is that how you felt? Is that why you killed him? The passion must have come through in her voice, because Sakina looked at her with a hint of surprise in her eyes. Yes. When you drove away that afternoon, I made up my mind that I had to rid us of Faisal. I sent Mohsen off to buy something so he would be away from the gate, and everyone would think a criminal had slipped in. I had this already. It is a family piece that I keep in my safe for protection. Now she brought her right hand out so Praveen could see the long silver dagger. The weapon had an elegantly worked handle and was highly polished. It looked like a relic from the Mughal period, something that should have been in a museum. Thinking of the ugly cuts Sakina's beautiful dagger had made a few days earlier, Praveen swallowed hard. If you wanted to make it look like an outsider had killed Faisal... Why did you leave Razia Begum's letter opener in the back of his neck? Razia shouldn't have had the wakf. Each word was a bitter jab. I did it to teach her that I could speak out and blame her at any moment. She understands that I've become the family's head. Sakina's style of vengeance revealed something about her. She was filled with emotion not just the pain she'd felt at being betrayed by a boy who'd grown into a tyrant, but also resentment of the other two women who'd treated her like their middle sister. Praveen would work with this understanding. Nobody knew how intelligent you were. In fact, it is likely that Mumtaz Begum doesn't know this passage exists because your husband didn't use it to visit her. He stayed in her room all the time, didn't he? Mumtaz doesn't know about the passage. Sakina sounded contemptuous. Of course, Razia knows it exists, but she will not say a word about it, lest she be accused of using it herself. Because Faisal tried to take Razia's precious wakf and then her daughter, anyone would think she'd be the one who killed him. I see. Did you go through the passage to surprise him in his room? Yes, as I had done many times before. Sakina sighed. When I saw him, I began crying about how Razia controlled the wakf. He took me in his arms, never seeing what was in my hand. Did he fight? Praveen asked 
remembering the many wounds. He screamed, and he did try, but he was already too injured to do much. I didn't enjoy it, she said, looking sadly at Perveen. He wept as he died, as if he could not believe what I'd done, and I felt the same. The sight of Mr. Mukri's bloodied body would be in Perveen's memory forever, like a curse. Trying not to let the image rattle her, she said, But you didn't confess? No, of course not. I needed to save our family. I took everything off and cleaned myself in his bath. I was afraid to bring the sari into my own room, so I left it in the passage. Nobody would have known if it hadn't been for Amina. At the sound of her name, Amina shifted. Praveen gave the girl a warning pat, willing her not to move again. Did Amina speak to you about it? No. I found her looking at my ruined sari. I did not know for certain if she'd guessed, but I told her that we would have a glass of faluda together in my room, and she could ask me anything she liked. That I would just tell her, because she was more clever and brave than anyone. After half a glass, she fell unconscious. It was no trouble to pull her right back into the passageway. And then you took her belongings, so it appeared she might have run away. Perveen spoke in a soothing tone. Just as you made it look as if I were kidnapped by a common criminal. You had Mosen grab me, didn't you? He was allowed to use the telephone from the station to speak to me. Sakina sounded defiant. He said you were investigating everything. I told him to get rid of you. He said he had a key hidden at the docks to a place where nobody would ever find you. He did this all for you, because you promised him a share of the sales of your jewellery, Perveen ventured. He told you that? Sakina looked panicked. I'll have to sack him. As Sakina spoke, Perveen thought she heard something. Had it been a turning doorknob? If Mosen was coming into the passageway, both she and Amina were done for. Now there were footsteps. In the moment that Sakina turned to look toward the corner, Praveen shot up from her kneeling position and flung herself at the small window. As she knocked Sakina to the ground, the woman struggled against her. Silk tore as Praveen used her superior weight to hold Sakina down, all the while trying to keep track of where the dagger was. You ruined everything! Sakina screamed. Perveen dug her nails hard into the woman's right hand, and the knife finally clattered out. With Alice leading them, Sub-Inspector Singh and the constable came rapidly around the corner. Everyone stopped short at the sight of Perveen atop Sakina. The knife, Perveen said. Take it! Alice dragged a wrinkled handkerchief out of her pocket and used it to pick up the dagger, while the sub-inspector and constable surrounded Sakina. Praveen could barely get past them in the narrow passage to reach Amina, who was trying to pull herself up, but had flopped back down. Am I dreaming still? Amina asked in a slurred voice. I had such a bad dream. It was about Sakina, Hala. Thank God, she's all right. How long has she been here? Demanded Alice, who was still holding the knife. Sakina Begum gave Amina morphine the evening of Mukri's death. The child has been lying here with no food or water for more than three days. Perveen looked gratefully at her friend. I'm so glad it was you. I knew you were going to explore the passage. When Sakina Begum went off and didn't return, I became nervous. I asked Razia Begum if she knew about the passage. She said she didn't, but when I showed her the architectural drawing, she admitted she had heard of it. She said that if I went inside there, I'd better bring the police. 
I'm glad you came, Praveen said to Sub-Inspector Singh. I'd also like to state that I am representing Razia Begum in this matter, not Sakina Begum. His head swiveled from Sakina to her. So you will answer all my questions? I'd rather speak with you than Inspector Vaughan, Praveen said shortly. But could we have the interview later? Amina must get to her mother, and then a doctor should be called. I don't know what effect the morphine might have. Put your hands behind your back, Sakina Begum, Sub-Inspector Singh said in formal Hindi. He was trying not to look into Sakina's tear-stained face, as if the fact he had to arrest her was profoundly embarrassing. Praveen thought it unlikely he'd ever arrested a woman, let alone a Purdanashin. But I am a respectable woman. You must not touch me, Sakina pleaded as the constable awkwardly fitted handcuffs around her wrists. Gentlemen, just a moment. Praveen gently lifted the end of Sakina's sari and let it fall so it covered her face. It was a small thing to do, but it preserved her dignity. Thank you, Sakina whispered. Tell them I will go to their prison and to please not touch me again. Chapter 33 a Waning Life Bombay, March 1921 I believe I owe you an apology. From the depths of the plush armchair, Praveen regarded the man seated behind a highly polished mahogany desk. It was a week after the incident, and she'd come in expecting the worst especially since Alice had been on the scene when the police apprehended Sakina. But, Sir David, whatever for? You have been nothing but kind. I am speaking of your effort to work with those women within the house. The police would probably never have been able to gather the necessary evidence and confession that you could behind the curtain. Praveen felt herself stiffen. I'm not trying to be the police's helper. My concern has always been for the family's safety. In the end, that meant looking carefully at all three women, as well as others within the house. He nodded. I accept that. How is the little girl doing? The doctor says she must continue treatment at Gama Hospital for a few more days, but she's chattering happily. Her mother is with her every day, and you must know that Alice has been teaching geometry to Amina and accounting principles to Razia Begum. Speaking of my daughter, she has informed me that she has taken on a part-time consultancy at the law firm. I'd like to know more about that. Here was the reason for the conference. My father and I both think the world of Alice— I know that helping us is not the ideal career for an Oxford-trained mathematician. The thing is, Alice is not confident you'd approve of her becoming a lecturer at a local college. After a pause, Sir David said, I'm not against it, as it would keep her in India at least. You should tell her, Perveen advised, thinking how much his support would mean to Alice. And at least until she's found a position, we would be grateful for her assistance. Her mathematical acumen can be put to use in calculating inheritances and other matters. As long as she's not going about Bombay alone. But her mother is understandably anxious about the dangers that are inherent in this city. Is Lady Hobson Jones relieved two suspects were caught and taken away? Sakina had spent one night in the lady's cell. She'd been released on bail into the care of her parents at their home in Pune. Her trials would take place in a few months' time, the first for murder of Faisal Mukri and the second for attempted murder of Amina. 
Mosen faced charges for abduction of Praveen. He would not be allowed out of prison before the trial. She is not just relieved, but has now taken it upon herself to set up a fund for widows with young children. But tell me, what is the situation with the other two widows? I understand the house isn't occupied. Razia is staying in my home, and we are engineering ways for her to spend the last few weeks of Idat without running into my father and brother, Praveen said. Mumtaz has gone to stay at a maternity hospital, where she's being pampered and feels much better. The two widows are thinking of selling the property, but that cannot be done until Sakina's trial is done and Mumtaz's baby is born. I imagine you're waiting to see if it's a boy or girl, he said. Sinking a bit deeper in the overstuffed chair, Praveen said, in either case, the child will inherit something. Studying her, Sir David said, Muslim law is all about mathematical fractions. Alice will be a champion with such numbers. Is it true that Parsi estate law is even more complicated? Praveen chuckled. While I feel there are still a few regrettable aspects of Parsi law, one of the best parts is the long-standing vast distribution of inheritance. A deceased's wealth is shared with so many relatives that it's allowed many in our community to become financially stable. Sir David gave her a wry half-smile. And you Parsis have stabilized Bombay as well, building hospitals and schools, projects that my people overlooked. There were so many things she could say about what the British should do, starting with granting Indians self-rule. But she sensed she would have Sir David's ear again. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds is the Parsi credo. However, there is no monopoly on it. Goodbye, Miss Mystery, he said, putting a hand out to her. Although I'm certain it's not for long. Two days later, Praveen climbed into the Daimler with Gulnaz, reflecting on what Alice's father had said about Parsi philanthropy. She was on her way to one of these laudable places that Parsis had built, the B.D. Petit Parsi General Hospital. Gulnaz had checked with the hotel registrar and confirmed that a 32-year-old man named Siamak Azman Patel was staying in the ward for incurables. She had insisted on going along to help Perveen overcome any red tape. The car rolled along, passing a young girl in a ragged sari picking through a small mountain of rubbish for pieces of glass. The ragged urchin made Perveen think of Fatima, whose fate might have brought her to the same place. But the widows had kept her and Zaid. Praveen had visited Mr. Farid's bank and, using her legal authority, paid out every rupee of the maher due to Razia and Mumtaz. Teba Ayaz and the cook's salaries were once again being paid, with a bonus for the months they'd served without pay. With the widows and children away from the house, Fatima and Zaid's duties had lightened, and the two were even able to attend a community school several half-days per week. I looked up the meaning of the patient's first and middle names in the Persian name book, Gulnar said, interrupting Praveen's warm thoughts about Mosen's children. Praveen turned to her. What is it? Siyamak means alone in the world, and Asman means infinite. Quite mysterious, isn't it? Cyrus had told her at Bandra how lonely he felt in this world. She was sure this was another message. At the hospital, Gulnaz breezed through reception and into the critical care ward. The head nurse, though, was not as accommodating as the receptionist. The nurse said they could not see the patient, who was too weak to see visitors. But he asked for me. 
Verveen held out the letter that she'd had the foresight to bring. The nurse's eyes lit up. Ah, very good. I posted the letter some days ago. We had almost given up hope. Is Mr. Patel close to death? Perveen was suddenly anxious that she'd missed her chance to know the truth. Time will tell. He can speak, although he suffers from confusion. As the two young women looked inquiringly at her, the nurse shook her head. I am not at liberty to give information about his diagnosis, just as I cannot admit anyone to see him except for the solicitor he requested, Miss Perveen Mystery. At least let me stay outside the door, Gulnaz pleaded. He could do something terrible. The nurse looked at Gulnaz as if she were insane. Mr. Patel is a very weak man. He needs your prayers, not your fear. Gulnaz took a seat in the hallway, while Perveen followed the nurse into a patient room that smelled heavily of disinfectant. There were two beds in the room. One contained a teenaged boy, and the other a hideous man speckled with red spots and lesions. This is Mr. Patel the nurse murmured to Praveen. In a louder voice, she said, Mr. Patel, the lawyer you wrote to has come. A stranger bearing no resemblance to the man she'd loved. Praveen chided herself for assuming the letter writer had to be connected to what Mr. Ghosh and her father had learned about Cyrus. But because she'd shown up, he'd expect her to help with the will. The head nurse drew a curtain between the two beds, giving Praveen and the spotted man privacy from the boy. Miss Mystery is here, the nurse said loudly. The man's eyes fluttered and then opened fully. Praveen caught her breath, because now she saw the hazel eyes were just like those of Cyrus. My wife... The man spoke between wheezes. Perveen. Perveen felt blood pounding in her ears. The sick man had Cyrus's voice, but she saw no trace of his former beauty, just a body covered in pockmarks. Perveen shot a look at the nurse, who was gaping. This is a lawyer-client meeting, Perveen said. It requires privacy. The nurse's expression was indignant. But my patient, I shall call if he needs you. After the nurse had stiffly exited, Perveen asked, Why are you calling yourself by another name? So you wouldn't stay away, he rasped. Softly, she said, I should not write a will for you. I am still considered a family member. It would be a conflict of interest. So be it. He sighed. I am glad to see you again. I wanted to see you one more time. Do your parents know you're so ill? Yes. My father told me to stop work. They wished me to have treatment far from Calcutta, so people won't know. Do you have smallpox? she ventured. I've got syphilis. Do you know what that is? I do. It was the most terrible venereal disease. Swallowing hard, she asked, Is there a treatment? First, I was injected with malarial blood, but the fever I had didn't kill the disease. Now they are giving me medicine with arsenic. Cyrus fell into a coughing spell. Noticing a pitcher and glass on the bedside table, Perveen poured a glass of water. After drinking a small amount, he gave her back the glass and spoke in a stronger voice. The doctors say the arsenic may cure me, 
but it could also fail. Imagine yourself becoming well, and the strength will pull you through. She was stunned to hear herself saying words of encouragement. She'd spent so many years thinking of him as a threat, when the only one he'd harmed in the end was himself. Maybe the medicine will work. But what is the point? All my life I've run after false gold. You were the only treasure I ever had. And then I lost you. Perveen was startled to hear him sound as sentimental as in their courting days. How long have you been following me? Last October. My cousin sent me the Bombay Samachar article about you. It wasn't till this year I fell very ill. And then I came here. I only wrote about the will to get you to the hospital. I want you to help me. How so? She asked apprehensively. If he asked her to come back to nurse him, she would refuse. No matter how selfish it would be, she couldn't bear to go back. Or perhaps he thought the mysteries should take him into their home. There was no end to the responsibilities a wife owed a dying husband. Help me, he croaked, interrupting her panicked thoughts. Just a bit more medicine, and I will sleep forever. Herveen felt relieved by the simplicity of his request. I shouldn't give you medicine. I don't know the dosing. I'll call for your nurse. No. I want you to give me all the medicine in the bottle right now. When I die, it will make you free. As the meaning of his request hit, Perveen felt faint. You wish me to poison you with arsenic? Please he said in a wheedling tone. If I could reach from the bed to where the nurse has put the bottle, I would do it myself. Perveen's initial shock was turning into suspicion. He'd asked her to commit an act for which she could go to prison. A young man lay on the other side of the curtain. If he had awoken and heard all of this, he'd be a witness against her. Standing, she looked down at Cyrus. Once he'd been so charming, he had commanded her unquestioning love. And he was trying to tempt her, to give her the idea of forthcoming freedom that could cause her to hang for murder. Won't you do it? He wheezed. I will not, she said, hearing the shakiness in her voice. You must speak to your doctor. He might be able to adjust your medicines so you don't feel as desperate. The journey to recovery could be a long one. But if you hold on to your life, you can change it. And if I die? He asked pitifully. Trying to sound dispassionate, she said, Under Parsi law, if you die intestate, your assets will be dispersed to your family members in set amounts. For this reason, you might wish to write a will with a solicitor and leave me out of it. I want nothing. But, Perveen, I owe you everything. Was this his true thought, or just another lie? She'd never be sure. He was so ruined that it was hard to hold on to the anger that had consumed her for the last four years. I'm sorry that I cannot help you with what you asked for. You will be in my prayers. Hervine left the room, knowing it would be forever. Chapter 34 A Cocktail at the Taj Bombay, September 1921 It was a pleasant day in late rainy season when Perveen went to meet Razia and Mumtaz at the Taj Mahal Palace. 
As she'd walked in from the garden, she'd parked her umbrella in the long rack in the reception area, but kept her briefcase in hand. It was light because all she had inside were a few checks and papers. She had reserved a table in the same dining room where her family had met the soda wallas. But she told herself she wasn't going to think about Cyrus, who wasn't in Bombay. Gulnaz had found out that Cyrus left the hospital against doctor's advice two weeks after seeing Praveen, and accompanied by a servant, taken the train home to Calcutta. She imagined that he might end his life there, or perhaps was faring better than expected and would survive. Purshottam Ghosh was keeping an eye on things and had promised to report to Jamshedji if Cyrus died. Your life will become a new book once you become a widow, Jamshedji had said, sounding hopeful. Marriage is once again a possibility. Who knows? You might bring me grandchildren before Rustam does. She had nobody in her sights for a remarriage, though, and hardly wanted her parents to look. As she'd said to Gulnaz, she was looking forward to being an aunt. Perveen's speculations ended as the maitre d' brought her through the dining room to the corner table where Mumtaz and Razia were already seated. Mumtaz wore a lovely orange and cream paisley printed silk sari, and Razia was elegant in a soft blue sari shot through with silver embroidery. The saris covered their hair, just as Praveen's did, a sign of modesty that crossed both their cultures. Smiling at the two of them, she apologized for making them wait. You both look very well. I am especially thrilled you were able to come, Mumtaz. How is baby Aisha? She cries like a singer, even though she's only six weeks old. Good thing Deva Aya is hard of hearing. But I can't be away too long. She will wake and want my milk in a few hours. Mumtaz gave a happy giggle. You know, I don't mind at all that she isn't a boy. Everything has turned out so well. Rustam had found an apartment from Mumtaz in an immaculate modern building on Nepean Sea Road. Her sister Tanvir often came to visit, but as Mumtaz said, there was no reason for her sister to move in when Teba Aya was living with her and doing such good work. Fatima and Zaid slept in the apartment too, helping out in small ways after they'd finished their school day. After the ladies had ordered the day's lunch special, veal with mushrooms, rice pilaf, and ice cream, Praveen opened her briefcase. She handed each of them the papers outlining their disbursements from the Farid estate. Razia silently read the English document Praveen had given her, but Mumtaz looked anxiously at Praveen. Will you please tell me what it says? Mumtaz asked. First, it says that I paid off all outstanding bills to the household's creditors, so there's nothing more to worry about, Praveen said. As far as your inheritance is, you and Razia each are receiving 7,300 rupees. Both of you are entitled to a small percentage of residual profits from Farid Fabrics, if it begins to do well again. By the way, I don't wish to try to claim the land and factories for myself, Razia said. I wish to build a future for all the children. I understand that, Praveen said. But if you wish for your daughter to be secure, we should put the land in your name and allow the company to pay you something for rent each year. The separation of land value and mill value is important. If the mills ever close, you can sell the land for your and Amina's benefit. Razia pondered Praveen's words and then nodded. We could also use such a profit to help the wakf. It seems sensible. Will you file the papers for me? I'll do it tomorrow. She turned her attention back to Mumtaz. The largest asset isn't yet dispersed. That is the bungalow. 
You and Razia Begum share its ownership along with Jum Jum and the girls. Sakina Begum is due a portion as well. Razia grimaced. To think of sharing anything with her is dreadful, and I feel the judge's punishment of just one year in prison is very mild. I do not mourn the death of Mukri, but I cannot forgive her plan to kill my only daughter. Perveen paused, thinking about how Sakina's world had crumbled, and with it all her common sense. Now she would likely live the rest of her life with her parents, unless they could find a groom who didn't mind a bride with a murder conviction. What do you hear about Nasreen, Shirin, and Jumjum? Mumtaz asked. I cannot forget them. They became my family. They're in good health and being raised by their grandparents, Praveen said. If it's allowed, I will visit with Aisha. I would like her to know her half-sisters, Mumtaz said. They will be delighted to see both of you. Praveen had visited twice already, just to make sure the girls weren't miserable. Returning to the matter of the bungalow, what do you wish to do with it? I think we should sell, Razia said. Mumtaz agrees that there are too many bad memories for us to ever go back. And why would we stay behind all the jolly windows? Mumtaz added with a shudder. I don't ever want to live without a clear window again. As you know, because of the inheritance law, the property is chiefly owned by the children, Praveen said. Your children and Sakinas are collectively entitled to more than 80% of its value. For you to sell the bungalow now, rather than wait years for the children to become old enough to fully participate in the decision, requires an exemption of sorts. What is an exemption? Mumtaz looked anxious. It means that a judge will allow a rule to be broken if there's good cause she explained. To get an exemption to sell the property now requires authorization by a male relative. I've met your late husband's cousin, Muhammad, who is running for Reed Fabrics. Based on several conversations, I think he'd make a trustworthy and kind estate executor. But do you really think he will let us keep the money? Mumtaz looked skeptically at Praveen. He could do the same thing as Mr. Mukri. Razia smiled gently at Mumtaz. We shall meet him and ask that before we permit Bavin Bibi to make him executor. In fact, we could demand he set down his intentions in writing. Goodness, you have the makings of a lawyer, Praveen said, impressed. Mumtaz blinked. I think it's a clever idea. Razia, will you really go with me to meet him? Certainly. It's not been as difficult to leave Bert alive as I thought it would be. Razia said, looking around the busy dining room with a confident air. Amina is enjoying taking me to a school and showing me the sights of the city. Nobody has bothered us. I believe everyone must know that I'm a mother, because I am treated with respect. As it should be, Praveen said. I've enjoyed staying in your home, but I'd like to take a flat in the same building as Mumtaz, Razia said, putting her hand lightly over the other widows. We will have each other as friends, and our daughters can live as sisters, Mumtaz said her face finally relaxing into a warm smile. I'm sure it will be easy to find a number of buyers to make offers on the house, Praveen said, already thinking of Rustam's connections. But would you be sad if it is knocked down? That is the pattern with everything in Malabar Hill now. Razia gave Praveen a serious look. It is best for the house to be removed, 
Only then will the tragedy be erased. I should not like to see that house again, Mumtaz added with a shudder. Razia lowered her voice. By the way, even if I move into Mumtaz's building now, I might be moving on in a year. I received a letter recently containing a proposal. You left such a surprise until now? Perveen said with a laugh. Tell me! Captain Ali, of course, Razia said. After the widow's idat period had ended, Captain Ali had asked Razia's permission to call on her at the mystery's home. The Indian army officer had turned out to be a gentleman with regal bearing and kind eyes. He had been most courteous to everyone and had insisted on Praveen and Jamshedji remaining in the room whilst he chatted with Razia as they sat in chairs placed exactly five feet apart. Praveen noticed that the two of them, who had maintained a long correspondence over the last four years and spoken twice before on opposite sides of a screen, had plenty to say to each other. The next visit included Amina, who had recovered well and was attending the same girls' school that Praveen had. If Ami marries Captain Ali, we will travel all over the place, Amina had confided to Praveen. We could go to New Delhi or Peshawar, Burma or Mandalay. That is how life is for an army family. One is stationed and must adjust. One must learn the languages and see everything. You wouldn't miss Bombay too much? Praveen had asked. We can always come back. Do you realize we could see all of India using the rail passes for Indian army families? I do hope he proposes. Now it turned out that he had. What will you do, Razia Begum? Praveen asked. I would like to see him a few more times before deciding. Razia sighed. I do not need to marry, but it might be very nice. And of course, I would have my own home to stay in whenever I wished. After a convivial meal, Praveen presented each lady with her check from the estate, and Mumtaz and Razia agreed to accept a ride in the mystery's car to the bank. We don't need you to come with us. We have bank accounts now, and I can help Mumtaz if needed. Razia insisted as they stood at the hotel's entrance, waiting for Armand to pull forward in the Daimler. Praveen was going to protest, but then she realized that they truly wanted to be independent. She had to let them try. That's a good idea. Afterward, ask Armand to take Mumtaz Begum straight to a flat. Why don't you come back here, Razia Begum, and we'll go back to Dadar Parsi colony together? I'll tell Armand to wait right outside for you while you're there. After seeing off the widows, Perveen glanced across the hotel's outdoor palm lounge and the sea. The sea-facing veranda was fully occupied by British and Indian ladies enjoying themselves with tea and cocktails. She thought she recognized a head of windswept blonde hair. She went over and saw it was indeed Alice. Glorious to see you, darling. Alice stretched out her arms and enveloped Perveen in an embrace. It's not too early for a whiskey soda, is it? I tried to order one, but the waiter brought me tea. Must be a language problem. Perveen fluttered her hand to a young waiter who came over to take the order. One gin lime and a whiskey soda, please, and nuts. The hotel does not serve single ladies alcohol, he said in an officious tone. But not men, hmm? Perveen commented in Hindi. Tell me why this is. He twisted his hands nervously. The ladies who come here to drink tea wouldn't like it. I think the danger is the tea drinkers might join us, 
and then you'd have a very loud, boisterous group of aunties, Alice said with a smirk. Pervine reached into her bag and handed him a business card. Perhaps you didn't know, but I'm a solicitor in practice. Will you bring the maitre d'hôtel, please? Two minutes later, the officious-looking Anglo-Indian was frowning at her. Miss Mystery, what is this hubbub about? We have our rules. Smiling at him, she said, I've just a few questions. I've heard this magnificent hotel was founded to allow equal hospitality to Indians and foreigners. Is that really true? He nodded. It most certainly is. To allow male guests alcohol, but not the female guests, runs against the idea of equal hospitality, doesn't it? Well, I... You don't say, but... He had no further words. Five minutes later, Praveen had a frosty gin lime in front of her, and Alice had her whiskey soda. To the power of women... Alice toasted. The power of women, Perveen answered as their glasses clinked. The End This is Sunila Nankani. We hope you have enjoyed this production of The Widows of Malabar Hill by Sujata Masi. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more, so look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.